Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to LexCon at Home. With Access Lex Institute and all of you, we are excited to be with you today for our first ever virtual LexCon event. I'm Jennifer Schatt, the Managing Director of the Center for Education and Financial Capability here at Access Lex, and I'm excited to be co-hosting today's event. Hi, Jen. I'm Melissa Faden, Managing Director of the Bar Review Program Engagement Team here at Access Lex, and I'm delighted to be co-hosting today with you. And I love that we have so many people joining us. There are going to be probably 600 people today's event, and that is just amazing. Thank you all for showing up. So before we jump into the day, I want to take just a moment to help you navigate your screen. If you are on a laptop or a tablet, you probably see Jen and I on the right-hand side of your screen, and you probably see presentation slides on the left-hand side. You can size those up or down as you like throughout the day. And you'll also see a row of boxes toward the bottom of your screen. I want to direct your attention to the ones you'll be using the most. First, you'll find the purple Q&A box. You can drop your questions and responses there throughout the day. There is a green resources box where you can access handouts, as we call them out. And you'll also see a link to the event survey that we'll talk about at the end of the day. And for those of you who may be on a mobile device, uh, just a quick note that you will find that Q&A box along with the handout and survey at the bottom of your screen. So just take a look for them there. Thanks, Lisa. And speaking of the day, we are super excited to welcome everyone to today's lineup. Um, sessions will start at the top of the hour. You can find the schedule um, a PDF of the schedule in the resources um, area, or if you've got your goodie box handy and have kind of that uh, one pager right there, that will keep you in line. But we're really excited. We've got six fantastic sessions for you, and we can't wait to get started. We'll also be taking some time during the breaks today to play a few games and give you a chance to win some fun prizes along the way. Jen and I are going to take you through what each of those opportunities will be in just a moment. One quick disclaimer, you can only win once today so that we can spread the love a little bit further, but there is always one exception to the rule, and that is that everyone will be eligible for the end of the day grand prize. So speaking of prizes, uh, we invite you to get in and test out the Q&A panel with us this morning. We'll take note of anyone who drops anything into the Q&A box, and we've got some warm-up activities to get you started. Um, we'll then randomly draw 10 participant names during our first break, and those lucky individuals will win a copy of the best-selling book, Finding Confidence in Conflict, written by our first session speaker, Kwame Christian. So, all right, let's just get started with a little warm-up activity. Um, we hope you're all cozy at home. Maybe you've got your mug with you. You just saw the agenda for the day. And we are curious, what are you looking forward to most today? Um, so go ahead and drop that in the Q&A panel, and we'll share that out with you. Lisa, what are you looking forward to today? Oh, my gosh. Well, I get the best... Uh, job in the house today, and that is hanging out with you and everybody here. I am already drinking some fabulous tea in my cup, and um, we have a number of people who are rolling in some answers here. I'm getting told I have a little echoing here, so I'm going to um, plug in my head and see if that is going to help. So hold on just a moment. Great. I see a couple, uh, number of responses. Everyone seems to be looking forward to that uh, keynote speaker. Yes, and I see, oh my gosh, thank you. These are all just rolling in. Yes. Lots of sessions. I think I see every session. Oh, just taking a break uh, and getting a chance to do something a little bit different. 
hearing with um, hearing from others about how they've been handling things in this pandemic world. Wow, 100%. Well, oh, I think I caught someone who dropped something in the uh, Q&A panel saying they were looking forward to your piano recital. <laughs> oh my I gosh. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't have that on the planned agenda today, but maybe we can do that next time around, or maybe there will be an encore um, at the end of the day. I love it. Thanks so much. <laughs> Oh, well, you know, the good news, Jen, is that everybody seems to have figured out the Q&A panel. Thank you all so much for playing along. That's going to become really important today as you win some prizes. And speaking of prizes, do you want to tell us about prize number two, Jen? Ah, so during our second break, we're going to be testing your listening skills and giving you a chance to win one of 10 super cozy hoodies. Um, I've got one right here. It's fantastic. You're definitely going to want to win one of those. So uh, just continue listening on and you'll have a chance to win one of these. We are going to mix things up a little bit for break number three. I am going to take you on a five minute standing yoga session and um, no yoga mat required, no experience required. Uh, but you will have a chance to win your very own at-home yoga kit if you join me in that breakout room. And for break number four, we are going to give you a little peek of LexCon 21. I'm going to turn my mug around here. We are going to um, be in Nashville. And we're going to give you a chance to win some LexCon 21 location-related swag. So stay tuned for break number four. So fun. Oh, my gosh. So speaking of locations, here's your next Q&A panel um, opportunity to get some activity in and win one of those first prizes. We know we're going to be in Nashville next year. I just said that. Where would you like to be for LexCon 22? Some of you have been to this conference before, um, and you might want to go back to one of those locations. You might have a new location on your horizon. I think all of us are looking forward to some semblance of travel at some point. So where would you like to be for LexCon 22? Wow, Lissa. So it is, uh, we've got a number of responses in the Q&A panel. Uh, the beach seems to be top of mind for many of our audience members. I'm seeing uh, Clearwater, Puerto Rico, California. Um, I've seen a couple for New Orleans. What's a favorite of mine? Scottsdale, Denver. Um, we, are, we are just covering the, the entire map. I love it. You know what? I even see Wyoming on the list, and um, I am a Montana girl, so I am happy to see that there. I also see some votes for Seattle and Portland, and I am coming live to you today from Spokane, Washington, so I am happy to have some West Coast love here, too. Oh, Park City, Utah. Yeah, we've got some skiers in the, in the mix, too, here, Jen. I love it. Skiing in sand, love it, love it. All right. So we're, um, you know, again, Liz and I are so excited that you have joined us here and you are treating yourself with a full day of learning. So in break number five, you'll also have a chance to win this super yummy box of treats from Harry and David. Um, and the good news about this one, you just need to be present in order to have a chance to win. So easy peasy for break number five, prize. Um, and speaking of treats, uh, we try to do that for you with the resources that we provide to you and your students. Um, so for our next Q&A activity, we would love to know what's your favorite Access Lex resource. So feel free to drop that in the Q&A panel and uh, you'll see a number of those resources up on the screen. Um, and in the resources area of um, that, that widget down at the bottom, we do have a PDF of all of our Access Flex resources and tools with the URLs. Um, but we're curious, what's your favorite? 
You know what, Jen? I am going to start with the first one that popped in the box. Thank you so much. Someone just said the people, and Aww. I could not appreciate that more. I work with some of the most amazing people here at Access Flex. So thank you for acknowledging that. Um, and wow, thank you for all the comments. Uh, I There's a lot of Macs going on in here, Access Connect, the calculator, analytics, Explore JD, everything is getting a shout out here. Thank you so much. Oh, and some of you giving some nice love to your, to the folks that come to your campuses. Thank you. We'll make sure to pass those comments along. Really appreciate that. Oh, that's wonderful to see. I love that. And that's going to bring us to the grand prize of the day. We are super excited for you to engage in the great sessions ahead. And we hope that you'll share that excitement on social media. So Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Um, so we encourage you to send out social posts throughout the day using our uh, hashtag for the day, Lexcon Home. Um, and by doing that, you will have a chance at your choice of a brand new Apple Watch. Um, so feel free during the sessions, get tweeting, posting to Facebook. If there are interesting things you're hearing or comments you'd like to share with us, we'd love for you to, to do that and use our hashtag LexConHome. And I want to say a special thank you to all of you for registering and being here at today's event. As many of you know, it's an Access Lex conference tradition for staff and attendees to come together to raise funds for a worthy charitable organization located near the conference site. Well, this year we're virtual, so that wasn't possible, but we did the next best thing. When you registered, Access Lex donated $10 to your choice of our charity partners. And because so many of you are here today, these charities will benefit. No Kid Hungry, $2,940. Feeding America, $1,950. The Humane Society of the United States, $1,150. Doctors Without Borders, $1,020. And Southern Smoke Foundation, $360 for a total of $7,420 going to these organizations. Thank you all so much. All right, we are getting close to the start of our day. And I wanna take just a moment to make sure that we answer any last questions for you before the day gets started. So um, let's go through and um, get the chat panel going. And thank you again for the thank yous in here. I uh, really appreciate you acknowledging um, the generosity and your generosity of time and spirit as well. It's really, really, Fantastic. I want to um, just also give a note here. Um, I see that some people have found the resources tab and you are going to um, be seeing some of those as we go throughout the day. We'll be pointing your attention to that um, as we go and your excitement is definitely seen and heard. And I think with that, I see our next guest is now in our lineup. So I'm gonna go back to the top here and say, we are ready for a great day. And, um, and you now all have the rundown of the day and know where to go. So I'm going to do a quick tech check Chris Chapman, can you turn on your mic and your camera for us? I am. Fantastic. Everyone, please uh, join me in welcoming our president and CEO, Chris Chapman. Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lista, and, and welcome to everybody, and good morning, um, wherever you are. It's uh, 
not Nashville, except for some of you, but happy to be here and welcome to our first annual and hopefully our only annual LexCon at Home. Uh, it's been quite a year for all of us and we look forward to being in Nashville next year and all the things that are Nashville from the Grand Old Opry to the Parthenon replica to everything in between. Um, Look, we never questioned we weren't going to do something, and this is it. And so we keep our 33 years and counting going on this annual event. And it may not be our usual usual event. Um, for one, you don't get to see all of us wearing matching uh, outfits here at Access Flex, you know, numbering 30 or more. And the thing I miss the most of all of these things is that I don't have quite any giant vats of eggs and bacon and the smell of all of that here in my house that I don't that I don't get to get um, here, which I only get at conferences. So we'll have those, I guarantee you, next year. Um, but for now, you'll have to deal with your little bag of snacks that you got in your goodie box, which is pretty good in itself, but not quite the same. So okay, so we have 600 registrants for, registrants for this thing, um, which is amazing. You know, well more than we ever get in person, which is a great thing. Uh, very happy, thrilled to have you here, thrilled that you could make it out uh, and take time out of your day to listen to me and listen to all the great sessions, which will be probably much better than me uh, going forward. Um, anyway, I, it's gonna be a great day. The people who put all of this together, I know very well, and you know many of them, and, and they've done a great job, and I look forward to it. Um, so I'm just gonna speak for a little bit before we have our first speaker, who you're probably really here to listen to. Um, and tell you a little bit about um, kind of what we've done this year and also what we're what we're doing uh, a little look forward uh, you know for the next year um, yesterday our annual report came out which which has a lot of detail in it on some of the things we're going to talk about and some other things I encourage you to look at it um, you know this year you might notice that it is extra glossy uh, and if we actually produced it in in uh, in paper form it would just slip right out of your hand but we are producing it in paper form, so you'll just have to imagine its glossiness when you look at it. But uh, what's really important is the substance in there. Um, you know, you know about some of our things, you don't know about some others, but I encourage you to look at it. We're doing a lot, and we haven't let this thing slow us down. So um, let me let me start by um, let me start by just a few few quick things and, and looking backward. Um, you know, January of last year, you know, we kicked off another round of our regional training workshops for administrators. Um, you know, these things are intended, we started these a few years ago or re restarted them a few years ago to expand the reach of our development and information activities beyond LexCon uh, to help people with who have, uh, you know, strained budgets, to help people have more people participate in our activities, um, you know, so they don't have to travel as much. And they've, you know, well attended and well regarded. They all came to a screeching halt in uh, March with everything else. But you know the interesting thing about this period is we learned that um, doing things this way actually, you know, we really do expand the reach more than we would ever have done in that way, um, and so it's been very positive and a very successful um, recreation of those during this time. I'm not suggesting we're going to do it all virtual all the time, but it certainly has caused us to rethink how we do these things in the future and some other things, and so um and some the possibilities that we can reimagine to, to keep expanding that reach so thank you for your participation in that and thanks for um all of your support through this time um you know you also are well aware of our the law student emergency relief fund we stood up in march and april um to provide emer you know emergency relief dollars to students who who were you know suddenly um in some trouble financially due to the pandemic um, we're very proud to do that. Uh, it was a whole company effort to get that stood up and distributed um, to every member law school uh, that, that we serve um, in, in a very quick time period. Um, it, they've been, all the funds have been used for the most part, ex with some exception, and we've received wonderful um, descriptions and examples of how they've been used, which we'll, you know, we'll, we'll share uh, here and there. Um, our Max Financial Education Program and Max Pre-Law continues to go strong, offered at 170 schools, over 27,000 current student participants. Um, and again, we just recently awarded some of our scholarships uh, for Max participants. Um, we award $270,000 in scholarships a year to your students. 
And, and we look forward to that program continuing to grow and get stronger and stronger, helping people understand um, you know, the finances around not only just their student loans, but their lives and, and what it means in a program designed specifically for law students. Um, in February, we launched an application cycle for a new program, or it's a diversity pipeline program called Lex Scholars by Access Lex. Um, this is very exciting to me. I'm going to take a little bit of time to go through it here, um, just to give you a, a sense of it, because it's it, it's very very in keeping with one our mission. You know, they say you know, access is our not only our name, it's our first name. Um, and so what we what we're doing with with Lex Scholars is it's a Right now, it's set up as an experimental diversity pipeline program, and it's aimed at really learning more about the effective methods of taking students who, who I call admission adjacent uh, for law school, those with, with grades and test scores that are kind of below or right on the cusp of being eligible to be offered admission to law school and turning them into admission eligible students, i.e. those who can get offers to law school, to attend law school if they want it. Um, and again, the application program for this kicked off on, in February. Um, the program went live with its first cohort in, in August. And, and what it does is it, it takes, takes these students and, and applies re different resources to different groups of them. Like there's a control group, and then there's a couple other groups that apply different resources, including um, L LSAT prep, um, admissions counseling, um, writing skills development, and, and you get the idea. And the idea is to, to provide these resources and then see what happens. Um, so what we have, we started off with 250 participants this year. Um, and it's, it's real good cross-section of, of students um, from our targeted, targeted populations. Um, first generation, uh, graduates of undergraduate is 70 percent. Pell recipients are 70 percent of the population. Black students are 63 percent, and Latinx are 30 percent. Um, so it's really in those targeted populations, which are underrepresented racial and socioeconomic um, demographics. Um, and to give you a sense of of of, of um, you know what admission adjacent means, um, the median test score percentile of this group was 22%, 22 percent, 22 percentile. So, so people who are, who, are, who are not highly likely to be offered admission um, at the front end um, as it stands. So we're going to work this through. We have, it, we have it working through for about five years, five-year program. We, we funded it. And uh, we're going to follow these, uh, these participants, these Lex Scholars, through and, and, and hopefully determine better what works and what doesn't. And, and, and let everybody know and, and expand the program as we move forward. But it's a good example of some of the work our Center for Legal Education Excellence is doing combined with our operational capacities as an entity. Um, we're also working, um, you know, continue to work on, on uh, helping students pass the bar um, and understand how students can better prepare for the bar and also looking at how to, how to re reform the bar to make it better for the future and more aligned with the needs of, of, of students, law schools, and societies. Um, you know, you may have heard we we funded a, a really groundbreaking research in California um, through the through the Monterey College of Law in Seaside, California, um, with the Victor Cantania uh, from Indiana University Law School and Sam Amari from the University of Southern California Law School. Um, that really, for the first time, looked at two big data sets in California to look at one, what happened, what happened, if, um, what their highest cut score, the second highest in the nation, what that score does, how it impacts um, racial and ethnic diversity in the bar, and also whether the cut score itself um, has any alignment with with public protection, which is often the you know, often the the rationale for, or often the rationale for uh, a higher cut score that somehow if not, it's not high enough, um, there will be lots of malpractice and people won't be served, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, um, the long and short of the story is, is that 
is that the study found, um, not surprisingly, that um, there's a disparate impact on, on, on racial and ethnic minorities um, being admitted to the bar by a high cut score. And also that uh, the high cut score had no, no, um, no correlation to, to discipline in California. Um, you can find the whole study on our Access Lex research collection, but but I mentioned this study um, and can talk a lot a lot more for it. Is it's just an example of of what Access Lex is doing on the research side, and you know, we're developing empirical data for for things that many in the world, and many in our world, and many stakeholders believe, you know, just is common sense or just is true, or you know. So, for example, you know, for example. Everybody thinks, well, you know, people who don't pass the bar would be would be bad lawyers, and and they would create all these problems for clients. And and you know, in this case, we we work to say, well, is that true or isn't true? Isn't it true? And 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 we 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 added to this discussion. So we look forward to continuing to add to the discussion with this kind of research and all of the other research we're doing to inform uh, stakeholders, inform regulators, inform policymakers to make better decisions. Um, and, and better data informed decisions uh, so we could all advance um, in, a, in a very positive way. Um, the last thing I want to talk about before I run out of time, because I'm, I'm quickly running out of time, is our work in bar success um, uh, more directly. Um, you know, as far as learn, understanding things that help students be better prepared to then study for the bar at the end, i.e., do better in law school. Um, we're working through what are called, we're, we're expanding a program called a Barriers and Interventions Grants, which seek to identify, test, scale, and replicate interventions that take at risk, students at risk for failing the bar during law school and uh, to, to move them forward and better prepare them uh, for the ability to pass the bar. And directly, our Helix Bar, bar Review Program continues under development. Um, we are moving forward full speed ahead with that. We expect to have a uniform bar exam uh, offering, a uniform bar exam offering um, in the marketplace in September, and California and Florida will follow, and then we'll keep moving forward. Um, for those of you who don't um, don't remember or, or don't remember or haven't ever heard me talk about this, uh, the Helix Bar Review is a is a is a program that is designed to offer high quality, full service product to law students. Um, that will offer both an efficient and effective way to study for the bar and prepare for the bar while saving law graduates in aggregate tens of millions of dollars. You know, how will we do this? We're, we're going to do it by applying our nonprofit business model to a market that's been printed excess profits for too many years. Um, we're a well endowed nonprofit focused on legal education with a long history of operating nonprofit businesses. And we can offer this same thing to our bar review product by offering a price materially lower than what's out there in the marketplace. And also by doing so and be doing so effectively, not only helping people who select our product, but driving the old, driving the old, the whole market pricing down. Again, saving tens of millions of dollars in, in the aggregate. And people often ask, um, well, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? You know. What's in it for you? You know, there's always a catch. People always think there's a catch. Well, you know, we got the same question for Max uh, when we offered that, and and the answer is really simple. You know, this is what we're here for. We're we're we are a nonprofit with a mission, and and the reason reason we can do this in the bar space and is you know I think it's three R. You know, we have the resources, we have the we have the reason and the resolve. You know, we sufficiently funded so that we can really develop a high quality piece right out of the box. This isn't, you know, duct tape together. This is going to be as good as anything you've ever seen. We have the reason. Again, we have the mission and we have the result. We're in this for the long haul. We're not going away. Nobody can wait us out. Uh, nobody can think we're going to run out of money on this. We are going to do this. We're here. We've told everybody we're going to do it. And, and I assure you we will. So we'll be here. We're here for your students. Regardless, we're here for this, and we'll be here going forward. Um, again, the other thing, the last thing I'll say about Helix is, is you know, we're not de developing this in a vacuum. Many of you have participated in our feedback sessions and our focus groups. Many of your students have, and with those continue. And we're going to continue to continue with those. And so, I encourage you, if you want to say something about it, you have some interest in it, you know somebody who does, 
make sure you contact us, Lisa, Lisa Faden, who many of you know, and if you don't know, she's easy to find. I encourage you to, um, I encourage you to reach out to her and she will find a way to make sure that you um, get to participate in, in the activities um, going forward. So with that, I have um, run out of time, um, so which is probably good for you, but um, if you need anything from any of us, feel free to uh, reach out. We'll, we always answer, we're here. Um, nobody's going anywhere anytime soon either. So uh, that's that. So again, now to the formal, to the formal uh, LexCon at Home conference. I get the privilege to introduce our opening speaker, Kwame Christian, a subject matter expert on the art and science of negotiation and persuasion. Kwame is the director of the American Negotiation Institute in Columbus, Ohio. He's also the host of the world's most popular negotiation podcast, Negotiate Anything. His book, Nobody Will Play With Me, Finding Confidence in Conflict, is, on, is an Amazon bestseller and has helped countless individuals overcome the fear and anxiety often associated with difficult conversations through a branded framework called Compassionate Curiosity. He's a true authority in the field, and I'm happy you could join us today. So without further ado, please welcome best-selling author and world-renowned speaker, Kwame Christian. Take it away, Kwame. And Kwame, we, I'm gonna stop you just for a moment. We can't hear you. Can I ask you to please unmute your line? And hi all, thanks for standing by while we get Kwame back on the line. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, fantastic, uh, thank you so much. No problem, it was my fancy microphone, you know, I paid so much for it and look at what it's doing for me. <laughs> so I, I apologize for that. I'll scoot a bit closer. So thank you for having me, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm, I've been looking forward to this presentation for a while. Uh, when I was talking to our Chief Operating Officer, Catherine Kanapke about the format, I was saying, hey, so again, did you get me eight hours? And she said, we got you 50 minutes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, I'll try. I'll try my best with what we have. So let's just go ahead and jump into it now. So this is gonna be our structure. First, rethinking negotiations. I want you all to start thinking a little bit differently about negotiations. The next one is understanding psychology. Yes, I'm a practicing attorney, but I'm a psychology nerd. My undergrad degree is in psych, and I think it gives us a really great understanding of what's happening beneath the surface for other people and for ourselves as well. And then we're going to wrap it up with effective conflict management because, um, you know, as humans from time to time, <laughs> we find ourselves in conflict. And so we're going to address how to have these difficult conversations in a way that makes it more likely for you to get the outcomes and results that you want, while at the same time building the relationship. And this, my friends, is undoubtedly the most important slide in the presentation, and it comes really early, all right? I present better the more that I'm interrupted. Okay, so if you have questions, ask those questions. Uh, there's going to, there are going to be people moderating the chat. So when you ask questions, they'll interrupt and ask me those questions, right? Uh, we're going to customize the content as we go along. Also, when I ask questions, my questions are not rhetorical, okay? So when I ask these questions, I actually want you to populate the chat give your responses, tell us what you think, and we'll read a few as they come through. Because it's not just me presenting to you, we're gonna learn through each, other, uh, through each other through the process too. All right, so we're gonna start off with the fundamentals, rethinking negotiation. And this is your first opportunity to participate. What is negotiation, right? We're here to talk about negotiation, conflict resolution, finding confidence in conflict, right? But what, what does this term actually mean? And so go ahead, put your answers into the chat and we'll read off a few. Okay? And as you are writing these, I'll, I'll let you know. I, uh, I presented earlier this year for some realtors and we spent an hour on this slide. <laughs> an hour on what is negotiation. <laughs> so there's a lot more to it than, we, than it meets the eye. 
All right, I'm starting to see some answers roll in here, Kwame. It looks like um, give and take, compromise, finding a middle ground, finding a mutual approach. A dialogue. Um, getting the other person, getting the other person to do what I want. Give and take <laughs> to get a solution. The action of compromising. We have one one uh, one honest person <laughs> in here. Forget everything else. Give me what I want. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There's a couple other nice ones in here around working together. I'm um, trying to understand the other person's perspective. Mm -hmm. The discussion aimed at reaching an agreement um, and then arriving at a reasonable solution that works for both parties. Ah, nice. As, as a lawyer, I love the word reasonable, the reasonable person standard, right? Uh, what un unfortunately, sometimes what's reasonable for some people <laughs> is not reasonable for other people, right? No, this is great. This is great. And I could see the chat going really quickly. So kudos to you two for being able to read fast enough to catch them as they're coming through. But let's let's focus on, on a couple of uh, the commonalities here. I, I heard compromise a number of times. And so that's something that comes up a lot. And um, one of the things we have to keep in mind is that compromise is a potential tactic that we use. Compromise is a potential tactic that we use. And so when we think about compromise, we can't think about the word compromise in isolation. It has to be attached with something else. And that word is strategic. Strategic compromise. Because a lot of times we compromise too soon. I had a uh, one of my friends, Joshua Weiss, he's um, part of the Harvard program on negotiation and wrote a fantastic book, um, stories about negotiation and how we can learn from them. Uh, one of the things that he said in the podcast episode, I think that came out last week, he says compromise could be part of the process, but it's really the last stop on the train, right? We often get there too soon. How many people, let's see in the chat, how many people wake up in the morning and say, man, I'm excited to compromise today. Anybody say that? No, no, nobody's coming through and <laughs> saying they're excited to compromise, right. And so you shouldn't feel pressure to compromise early in the conversation. You only do it when it meets your strategic purposes. And so when is that? So you have to, when you think about strategy creation in negotiation and in life, you can use the same simple framework. You start off with your goal. What is your aspiration? Why are you having the conversation and what do you want to accomplish? Then you backtrack from that and create your plan. What is the overall plan or strategy that you're going to use to accomplish the goal? Then in this specific interaction, in this very moment, what are the tactics that I'm going to utilize to execute my strategy? Compromise is a potential tactic, right? Um, I'm a big time chess nerd. I love playing chess. As you can see, you probably see chess a couple of times in this PowerPoint presentation. Um, I, I've, I've played over 13,000 games of chess on chess.com. So it's an obsession at this point. And one of the things that we that occurs at times in chess is a strategic sacrifice. And so you see here on the screen, you have a, you have a knight, which is a valuable piece, and then a pawn, which has potential but is not worth as much. Occasionally, it's, it's appropriate to give up a knight for a pawn if it meets your strategic purpose. And the thing you should always ask yourself is, does this advance my position? Because negotiation is all about positioning. In this interaction, how can I improve my position and increase my likelihood of success? And we're just making incremental improvements throughout the conversation, right? And so another thing that people said was working together trying to find a common, common goal, right? A process of communication. I really like the word process here. And so let, let's make this really simple, super simple. Here's the definition I like for negotiation. Anytime you're in a conversation and somebody in the conversation wants something. So anytime you're in a conversation and somebody in the conversation wants something, okay? And so one of the biggest barriers that people have in negotiation is that they lack negotiation awareness. These negotiations are happening at all times, but we don't identify them as negotiations. And if we don't identify them as negotiations, then we don't have that signal to use the skills that we're going to talk about later on in this presentation, right? That's really important. So we need to increase our negotiation awareness. So let's, let's use the chat again. 
when was your last negotiation? So remember, anytime you're in a conversation and somebody in the conversation wants something, when was the last time that you negotiated? Well, we have uh, some the first time that were in, uh, parents of toddlers. <laughs> so this morning. <laughs> yes. Good. What else? Uh, when I bought my home and somebody sold their home. So there's home negotiations. Ooh, breakfast choice. My spouse, my 19 year old daughter. Ooh, with my body that wanted to stay in bed this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with my husband about the Christmas tree, um, what to have for dinner last night. Uh, when I accepted a job I offer. A job offer. No. Nice. This is awesome. This is awesome. So we're, we're seeing a clear pattern here. So remember this. The people with whom we negotiate the most are the people who are closest to us. It's, it's a game that I play when I ask this question. How long does it take for somebody to say dinner? I guess since it is in the morning, <laughs> breakfast is fresher in our minds, right? But it's going to be our families, our friends, our colleagues at work. So we have these traditional things that we identify as negotiations pretty readily. A salary negotiation, a home negotiation, those are actually pretty rare. When compared to the negotiations that we're having day to day. And so really, let's demystify this. Negotiation is nothing more than everyday conversations, everyday conversations. And in these everyday conversations, we have three goals. And so here are the three goals of every negotiation. Number one, I want you to think offensively. How can I get more of what I want? Number two, I want you to think defensively. How can I avoid things that I don't want? And number three, how can I, through this interaction, improve the relationship? So number one, getting more of what I want. Number two, avoiding things that I don't want. And number three, strengthening relationships, right? So let's go back to the dinner negotiation. So let's say you like eating dinner. I like eating dinner too, right? Good. Some you probably don't like cooking dinner as much because that takes effort and work and it's late and you had a long day, right? So let's say you have a very narrow perspective on what winning means in negotiation. And so with your spouse, you are constantly using air quotes, very heavily using air quotes here, winning that negotiation, and your spouse is constantly cooking dinner, but you both have equal workloads. Are you really winning? How's the relationship look? Not very good, right? So that's why we have to have a more balanced approach to negotiation too. We need to identify these negotiations when they're happening, while at the same time, we have to have a balanced approach to make sure that we're thinking holistically to improve the relationship and our circumstances through the process. Awesome. Any, any questions coming through? Oh, we already addressed this. We can move forward on that one too. Any questions? Just a comment out here that I think is interesting that, you know, you've been asking for examples and so many people have used personal examples rather than business related examples. I think this cuts close to home for all of us. Yeah, absolutely. Because here's the thing, these interactions that we have at home are more important. They are more important to us, right? For a number of reasons, because we care more about those relationships and frankly, it's harder to get away from the people at home, <laughs> right? <laughs> they, they, they always seem to be around, right? And so that's important. That's why with uh, with my book, Finding Confidence in Conflict, the, the tagline is how to negotiate anything and live your best life. Because if we keep the, the context of negotiation focused only on the business world, we are missing out on the true power of the skill set. Right. So, again, I want you to think expansively about this topic. That's why we call the podcast Negotiate Anything. It's all about awareness. So let's talk about the three characteristics of great negotiators. And we're going to start off with curiosity. And in my opinion, curiosity is the most powerful persuasive tool at our disposal. Right now, how do you think it is? How, how is that? You might think about very high-level negotiation techniques like anchoring, putting your off putting offers in packages, those type of things. Just asking great questions. Why is curiosity so powerful? What do you think? 
let's, let's put that in the chat and see what folks say. All right, we're starting to get responses in here. Um, with those closest to us, I think we typically have shared values or value the interpersonal relationship more than what we're negotiating for. Mm -hmm. um, it encourages active listening. It gives you insight. Oh boy, Being they're open going to so options. Fast. Thinking outside the box, it shows you actually care about the people that you're um, speaking with, helps you dig deeper. Shows that you show a genuine interest. You're not taking things at mm -hmm. face value. You're open to learning. And makes it makes you seem more empathetic. empathetic. Yeah, I love that. Right. I think that's a great one to, to end on too, right? And let me say this too, because especially when we're having conflict, when we're having conflicts, empathy doesn't come naturally. And one of the things I always say is that with effective conflict resolution, what we're doing is we're creating unnatural responses to these common situations, right? Oh, somebody's being mean. Somebody did something I don't like. Let me empathize with them. We don't want to do that. That's not a human thing to do, <laughs> right? We need, but we need to do it. Here's something important to remember about empathy. Empathy isn't a concession. Empathy is a necessary part of persuasion. If we want to be effective as negotiators or just human beings day to day, we have to learn to empathize. And really what that comes down to is the ability to understand how the other person sees thinks and feels about the situation. Understanding how they see, think, and feel about it. That's it, right? And the curiosity is so powerful for all of the reasons that you mentioned. And, and one other thing is this. Remember, negotiation is an information game. The more information I have, the better prepared I am to solve the problem, right? And this is the thing. You know, we can Google a lot of things. There are a lot of ways we can learn different things, but there are some pieces of information that only exist in the confines of their minds. There's some information that the only way I can get it is if you tell me, right? And I want that information so I can make the situation better. So curiosity is going to be a powerful tool for you in doing this. And one of the things we I want you to t uh, think about is the light theory of negotiation. So imagine you're in a dark room and it's pitch black and your goal is to, nego to, to navigate somewhere to the other side of the room, but you've never been in that room before, right? What's the first thing you want to do? You want to turn on the lights. That's it. Don't overthink it. <laughs> Just turn on the lights, right? It seems obvious. Now, when we think about this metaphor and bring it to our difficult conversations, what is the equivalent of light? It's information. It is information. And what ends up happening in a lot of our difficult conversations is that we often make the mistake of trying to persuade too soon. We assume that we're seeing everything. And so we say, this is the way it needs to go. I'm going to say this, I'm going to do that. This is the change they need to make in order to make the situation better. When in reality, we really don't know enough. And so I want you to keep this metaphor in mind when you're having these conversations. There are things that you don't know and you need to demonstrate some curiosity in order to find it. And again, let's bring this back to our negotiations in our everyday life. This is very critical because what I recognize is that professionals often have this interesting dynamic where they handle conflict more effectively at work than they do at home. And the simple reason why is a lack of curiosity. I've been married to you for 10, 20 years. I, I know everything I need to know. And here's the thing. Think about it. Every day, we are discovering new things about ourselves. How arrogant is it <laughs> to believe that we know everything there is to know about somebody else, no matter how long we knew them, right? So again, we still need to bring that curiosity into all of these conversations, especially at home, because it's not as natural to do it at home, because we assume that we already know. And so one of the things that we need to, to understand is the difference between interests and positions. And this is a classic Harvard program on negotiation uh, tactic that's been um, popularized through the book Getting to Yes by Roger Fisher and William Urey. And 
this is it, right? A position is what somebody says they want, and an interest is why they want it. A position is what they say they want, and interest is why they want it. And here's a really simple story to, to demonstrate the importance of this. the importance of this. So imagine you have an orange. It's the last orange in the house. You have a brother and a sister. They're fighting over the orange. And they go to the uh, the mother and they say, hey, we're fighting over this orange. Mom, who should get this orange? And what does the mom say? Cut it in half. Stop wasting my time. <laughs> and so she cuts it in half and gives it to the siblings. And so the brother takes the orange, peels the orange, throws away the fruit, and uses the rinds to make a cake. The sister, on the other hand, takes the orange, peels it in the traditional way, eats the fruit, and throws away the rind. And so if they would have taken the time to ask a seemingly stupid question, right? Why is it that you want the orange? What do you plan to do with this orange? They would have been able to get 100% of what they wanted, right? And so we need to get beyond what people say they want to figure out the real reason why. And the way that we do this is by asking questions, right? We need to be comfortable asking questions and listening to the answers. And so one of the things that I like to use is called the 70-30 rule, where my goal in the conversation is to speak 30% of the time and listen 70% of the time. Why do you think this works? What do you think the power of this is? And I know this, there, there might be some hesitation here because people might be saying, Kwame, I don't like this. <laughs> I don't want to listen that much. <laughs> but why do you think this is so powerful? You can get more information. More understanding. Get more inf information seems to be the highlight. There but you there go. There are also right? a couple of people saying, you know what, you don't want to show your cards. And I might not have all the data that I need. So what do we do? Right, let's address that. Let's address that. So one of these things that we have to consider is um, information sharing. And so I think about information just like any other negotiable item. I want the information, right? They should want some information as well. And so we think about the idea of compromise and reciprocal compromise and strategic compromise. I think about the same, I think about it the same way with information. So let's say I have, just for the sake of making it simple, this much information to share. I am not going to start off the negotiation sharing this much and just give blah everything. <laughs> right? Then what am I going to say the rest of the conversation? Right? We have to recognize that there is reciprocal vulnerability. It's important to be vulnerable. You think about the work that Brene Brown has done, really popularizing vulnerability, it's good. But in these difficult conversations, we need to be strategic with vulnerability because we can trigger reciprocity through that. So if I share a little bit about myself, then it triggers them to reciprocate and share more about themselves. And then I'm gonna hold back, not necessarily to not not for the explicit purpose of getting a strategic advantage, but because I only want to share what I need to share in order to accomplish my goal. That's it. And if I recognize that there's a little bit of hesitation from the other party with sharing information, what I'm going to do is I'm going to then strategically share a little bit more information in order to trigger a little bit more reciprocity to get some in return, right? And the way you do this is by asking great questions, asking great open-ended questions because that gives us more information. Closed-ended questions don't give us much. Yes, no, I, that doesn't help me. And also, when you ask closed-ended questions, it makes it easier for people to lie to you. It's not, you don't even need to be a good liar to, to do that, right? You, you know, and so you just say yes or no, you're, you're putting yourself in a really bad position because when you ask a closed-ended questions, people, are, people already know your preferred response. They understand through context what you want to hear, and it makes it more likely for them to give it to you. Let's give an example. It doesn't even need to be that nefarious, right? Here's an example, though. Imagine you are managing a team, and somebody is finishing a project, and it's really important to you. You could ask, where are we on this project? How much more time do you need to finish this project, right? Or you could ask, will you be able to get this done by the deadline? Yeah, boss. <laughs> 
be able to get it done. Of course, that's what they're going to say. And so you set yourself up for frustration down the, wor- the road, right? So that's why open-ended questions are so powerful. All right. Now, another thing. Great negotiators are creative. Why is creativity so important? Ooh, as they're coming in, I, I just caught the, a glimpse of a question. How do you know which questions to ask? Great question. That's a great question to ask. It seems like you already have a good idea. So wow. here's what I would suggest doing. Um, if you go to our website, AmericanNegotiationInstitute.com slash guide, you can download our free negotiation guides. And one of the things that it helps you do is prepare for your difficult conversations. And it has an explicit section for the questions that you want to ask. Now, In general, here's something you want to keep in mind. It's called the funnel technique. So what you want to do is ask very broad questions at the top of the funnel to get a lot of information, to see where people are going. And then as the conversation gets more specific and you get more information, now you get more narrow and strategic and targeted with your questions. So for example, for me as a mediator, how I would start every mediation. Remember, hey, I saw the case file. They've been in litigation for maybe a year. I know what they want and why they want it. And I know their arguments, right? But I start off every mediation saying, how did we get here? I want to hear your perspective, right? And so then I'm going to focus on where their energy lies. What are the things they're repeating? Does the volume go up? Do they seem more excited about specific issues? Great. Then that's what I'm going to focus on with my subsequent questions, right? So that's how you can kind of determine which questions to ask. So that's a great question. So, so what's coming through um, as it relates to uh, creativity? So we're seeing um, creativity. Oh, creativity allows you to think of other ways to get to your goal. Allows you to think of ideas that someone else may miss. Um, the solution may never have been crafted before. Your audience keeps changing throughout the day. You have to be able to roll with the punches and think create creatively. Um, Keeps your opponent on their toes. <laughs> and new I solutions, new solutions. That, there's a nice one in here that says that you are open to other possibilities and thinking beyond the immediate issue at hand. Mm, that's a great one to end on. I love that, right? Here's the thing. Whenever we're solving these problems, there's going to be an obvious solution. Not obvious in that it's correct. It's obvious in that it is the first thing that comes to mind, right? We have to learn how to think beyond that. And really what it comes down to is this. The more paths to victory you have, the more likely you are to achieve a victory. So we want to consider all potential options. Think outside the box and you can come up with more solutions, right? Very, very simple. But the thing is, you recognize how curiosity and creativity feed into each other. The more information you have about them, the more creative you can be when it comes to the solution. Once you figure out what their interests are, now you can find creative ways to meet their needs, even if it isn't the explicit position that they started with, right? So creativity is an incredibly important part of this process. And the next thing is great negotiators are confident. So why is confidence important? What do y'all think? And while we wait for those answers, I'm going to just put one up that came in a while ago, and maybe you're going to get there. But the question is, doesn't this assume that both parties are reasonable? <laughs> yeah. question. Great. So I am going to shout out a, an episode on the Negotiate Anything podcast, How to Negotiate with Narcissists. Um, I had a, uh, <laughs> a guest on my show, Rebecca Zung. She's an expert in that. And so I had her talk about those strategies. And I had her, um, we did a, uh, an unscripted negotiation where I had to play the role of a narcissist and go back and forth. In, and she, so it shows you how to deal with somebody who's unreasonable. So I, I'd refer to that episode too. But here's the thing. As you ask more questions and have more of a conversation, then you start to get a greater sample size of who the other person is, who they are, and more specifically in this interaction, what their strategy is going to be. Now, for the vast majority of people, let's say about 80%, like the vast majority of times, being reasonable is going to be the way forward. They're going to have emotional barriers, and we're going to talk about how to overcome those later. It's a small subset of people that are completely unreasonable, completely selfish, right? And so we need to change our perspective in that situation. 
Now, if you're dealing with somebody like that, you have to think about it like a dance. If you have a great dance partner, then you can look great when you're dancing. If you have somebody who's a really bad dancer, it doesn't matter how good you are, it's going to be ugly. <laughs> and so when you're negotiating with somebody who is completely unreasonable, you have to recognize this is not going to be pretty. It's going to be a little bit ugly. And now my goal is to protect my interests because I know that they are not interested at all in protecting my needs. Right. And so you need to be a little bit more assertive in your approach to the negotiation. But I, I'll refer you to that specific episode because we address that specifically. That's a fantastic question. So, Kwame, to your earlier question um, about confidence. So some of what we're seeing coming in, it helps people trust your authority to fix the issue or problem and follow through with the solution. Um, you need confidence so that all parties know you should be taken seriously. Uh, confidence inspires trust in the other person or the other side. Um, being confident helps you know that you are going to reach your goal and avoid and it avoids giving up too much or compromising too much too soon. And um, confidence exudes strength. People respect a show of confidence. Absolutely, absolutely. And think about this. Let's let's take it to the like the the far like left, right, like the far side. Okay. So, how many of you saw the uh, the fire festival fiasco, um, like Hulu and Netflix shows, or at least heard of it? How preposterous is this? This young twenty-something guy dupes people out of seventeen million dollars with no facts, <laughs> just completely devoid of facts. So that's an example of how powerful confidence can be as a persuasive tool. You don't even need to be legitimate and people will see your confidence and believe you, right? So I'm listen, when I talked to Julie and the rest of the team before that hand, I said, hey, is everybody in here legit? They said, yes, everybody's legit. I said, thank goodness. So imagine you being legitimate <laughs> and then being confident on top of that. It takes your level of persuasion up higher, right? If you leave this presentation, with no skills, no tools, no practical knowledge, but more confident for some reason, you will be more persuasive, okay? So confidence is incredibly important. You can say the exact same thing with confidence and the exact same thing without confidence, and people are going to believe you more with confidence. So it would be incredibly unhelpful if I just said, so take away this, be more confident, all right, Kwame, I'll be confident now. I didn't think about that. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> so let's talk about how to do it. Um, again, I'll shout out the book because the first half of the book is about addressing issues of confidence and emotional barriers because that's something that I struggled with myself. And so it walks you through how to overcome that. But in the meantime, here are some things that you can do for free. So like I mentioned, the free guide. Competence breeds confidence. Competence breeds confidence. The more you know, the more confident you will be. And you want to know as much as you can about this specific um, situation that you're in. So go to that guide, prepare beforehand, and you'll be more confident in that interaction. And then, of course, we have my podcast, and we also have my uh, my colleagues' podcast, Catherine Kanapke. She's the uh, chief operating officer at American Negotiation Institute. And uh, Ask With Confidence is all about women in negotiation and gender dynamics as well. And so my show comes out three times a week now, and um, Catherine's comes out about once a month. And so there are, there are a lot of free resources that you can use to improve your confidence through learning more. Because even though I've, ha I've had about over 230 episodes of the podcast, and I do these trainings all the time, and I'm a professor as well, Every time I talk to somebody, every single time I talk to somebody, I learn something new. Every time. It's so much fun. You know, so there's no end to the depths of your proficiency in this skill set when it comes to negotiation, conflict resolution, and communication in general. So one of the best ways for you to improve your confidence is to continue to learn more about the topic. All right. Congratulations. You graduated. Negotiation 102, let's talk about psychology. So why? Why are we talking about psychology? Why is it important? What do you think? Oh. 
Kwame, while we um, wait for answers to come in, I did see one uh, question pop up at the very tail end of that last section. How do you balance confidence with curiosity? Aha. Uh -huh. So what's important is this, because you have to be confident. It's an interesting dynamic, right? So one of the skills of true experts or high-level people is the ability to balance two seemingly dichotomous perspectives at the same time. So you need to be confident specifically in your skills and specifically confident in what it is you need and why you need it. Then at the same time, you need to be humble. You need to have humility because humility fuels curiosity. You can't, you can't be curious if you think you know everything, <laughs> right? And so you have to come to terms with the reality that even though I am confident in my skills and I'm confident in understanding myself at a deeper level to know what I need and why, you still need to be humble enough to admit that you don't know everything and you need them in order to learn. So I think that's how you can, you can balance those two things. Fantastic question. And we do have a number of responses that have come in now. So let's uh, feed you some of those. Helps you understand many perspectives. People are complex. What they say they want isn't necessarily what they actually want. Um, and uh, actually related to your own self-awareness of techniques that assist you in negotiating with others helps us understand how other people think and to understand the other person, um, helps, people, um, helps us to consider how, other, uh, how other thing, others think about things based on their ideals, helps us think about the way we come through to others. This is great. This is perfect, right? Helps us to understand ourselves and others on a, on a deeper level, a deeper level. And one of the hidden benefits, too, is that it helps you to not take things personally. So I'll explain how that last one comes into play. Because think about it. Sometimes somebody does something and it, it hurts us. It puts us in a worse position, just objectively, right? Um, and then sometimes somebody does the same thing, but we take it personally. That hurts more, you know? So let's talk about that. So this is the amygdala. Excuse me. This is where we get all of our emotions, both positive and negative come from the amygdala. And specifically, as we talk about emotions, one of the things that comes up a lot is fear. So there are three main fear responses, fight, flight, and freeze. There is a fourth one that is less popular. It is called faint. I shouldn't say popular. It's not like it's running for an office. Um, less frequent. <laughs> it's faint. So imagine if you are afraid of blood and you see blood and you just pass out, right? There's a breed of goat where that's their only fear response. And if you haven't seen that, these are called the fainting goats. Um, Google that. If you haven't, that's your homework. Or you could look at the screen right now. These are the fainting goats. That is an umbrella, and they are terrified. Okay? Now you can look at that, and you could say, you know, you could describe it in many ways, but you probably wouldn't call it helpful. And this begs the question. I'm looking for a one-word answer. A one-word answer here, and it starts with an A. For the sake of time, I'm giving you a lot of hints. What are humans? Keeping it simple. What are humans? I had a very interesting response last time I asked this question. <laughs> it wasn't positive. <laughs> well, my favorite A word is awesome, of course, but the correct <laughs> response I think rolling through here is animals, animals, That's animals, right. animals. That's right, we're animals right? We're not stones or plants, we're animals. And so here's the thing, just like those goats, we're going to have some predictably bad, unhelpful responses to some really common situations, and emotions can get in the way. And so this helps you to treat other people with a little bit of grace, because you say, oh, this isn't about me. This is a predictable psychological response to the way that they are perceiving the situation. It's not about me personally, this is just the way brains work. This also helps you when it comes to emotion management, because when it comes to managing emotions, a lot of times we treat ourselves harshly. So for example, me as a mediator, something bad could happen and I could feel a little bit upset or angry about it. And then that inner voice comes and says, wow, Kwame, don't you teach this? And you're gonna be mad about that? Wow, good job. Toughen up, man, right? That's not helpful. 
And so a lot of times what happens is that not only do we feel bad, but we feel bad about feeling bad, which makes us feel worse, right? So we need to recognize that this is a normal experience. And by normalizing, it helps us to recover faster. It's just critical, critical. And this is how it helps us to not take things personally. And then the last thing we have to remember is this is the frontal lobe. This is the best parts of yourself. Uh, logical reasoning, um, the emotion management, executive function, all of this resides in your frontal lobe. So for you during the conversation, you want to be using this part of your brain. And for the other person, you want them to be using this part of your brain. And I know what you're thinking. Well, Kwame, okay, great. Let me just turn on that switch and let me reach across the table and turn on that switch for them. Thank you for this. <laughs> I'm going to show you how to do it here in Negotiation 103. Congratulations on graduating again. So we're going to talk about conflict resolution. So this comes from my book, um, Finding Confidence in Conflict, How to Negotiate Anything and Live Your Best Life. And it's a, called the Compassionate Curiosity Framework. And it is a simple three-part framework that you can use in all of your difficult conversations, both at work and at home. And step one is acknowledge and validate emotions. Step two is get curious with compassion. And step three is joint problem solving. And it's flexible, too. If there's no emotional issue, fantastic. Get curious with compassion. Solve the problem. You might be in problem solving, and then you recognize that there's the specter of an unhelpful emotion. Now you know what to do. Acknowledge and validate emotions, right? And so you can just cycle through this. With my five-year-old, I do this. With my, uh, with my spouse, I do this. And at work, as a mediator with opposing counsel, I do this as well. So we're going to start off with acknowledging and validating emotions, and we'll start off with a quote. There's no point in sending a message if they are not psychologically ready to receive it. There's no point in sending a message if they are not psychologically ready to receive it. A lot of times we're using our best arguments at the worst times. If somebody's very emotional, what is the point of talking about facts, rules, statistics, data? There's a difference between being right and being persuasive. Being right doesn't always get you what you want, right? Think about it. Imagine if you if you have a toddler who's on the floor crying and just like falling out on the floor crying. We've all seen that before. Imagine if the parent just says, little Johnny, let me explain to you why this behavior is unacceptable. As you matriculate through life and join the professional ranks, this behavior will have a deleterious impact. Johnny cannot understand <laughs> what, what you're talking about right now. And here's the thing we have to remember. There is an antagonistic relationship between the amygdala and the frontal lobe. If you're very emotional, you're not thinking very clearly. If you're thinking very clearly, you're low, less emotional. It's often an either or type of proposition. So you need to sequence your words at the right time. And if somebody is very emotional, not the time to drop, drop knowledge, okay? Before I go on, who do you think said this quote? Any guesses on, on where this quote came from? Let's, let's read two guesses. Any guess on who said this quote? And it always takes just a moment for those responses to come in. So I do want to just uh, read another comment while we wait for that, which says emotional intelligence is so important in the professional space. How can we integrate those principles more? And I'm guessing you're going to talk about that next. Yes. And a, a simple tool, self-awareness. It all comes from self-awareness, right? Oh, understanding where you are. So think about it in terms of a map, right? If I'm looking at a map and I, there's a destination I want to get to, which is emotional stability, I can't navigate on a map if I don't know where I am. And so when it comes to emotional intelligence, the first step is always self-awareness, understanding yourself and where you are emotionally so you can manage that more effectively. And that self-directed empathy will naturally turn into outwardly directed empathy because you'll be able to read people at a higher level because you're constantly reading yourself. Great question. I see some guesses coming in. We have some great guesses. We have a number of votes for Freud. We have some votes mm -hmm. for Einstein, uh, Martin Luther King, um, we're Socrates, close. Ooh, we're Mr. Getting close. Rogers. Um, based on the picture on the slide, Albert uh, Hitchcock. No. And there's a vote for you, too. It's a vote me. for you. Yeah, it is me. <laughs> this is my quote. 
<laughs> yes. So here's here's how we do it. Here's how we do it. When it comes to acknowledging emotions, we're using it sounds like or it seems like. It sounds like or it seems like. It sounds like you're feeling really frustrated about this situation. It seems like this had a significant impact on you. And very briefly, let me explain why this works. Okay. The reason why this works is because of something called affect labeling. It's been used in, in therapy for decades. And so when you're very emotional, you're using the amygdala. We recognize that and we label the emotion using this framework. And the reason this works is because the part of your brain that determines whether or not that label is correct or incorrect is located in your frontal lobe. It's called the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. And so what you're doing is it's a cognitive trick by saying, it sounds like you're really frustrated right now. They have to think for a second, am I frustrated? You're activating that part of the brain. And so then they express themselves and then they start to decompress through the process. And then you say, that makes sense. Remember, acknowledgement doesn't mean agreement. You can just say, I, based on your perception, that makes sense. That is all I say when it comes to uh, validating the emotion. It doesn't mean coddling or it doesn't mean um, d uh, compromising your values or saying that they're right. No, we're just saying, no, that, that makes sense. And you do this until it goes away. And so even if you mislabel somebody, it still works. In the moment, there might be an influx of negative emotions. And what then happens is they'll correct you because people hate being mislabeled. People hate being mislabeled, right? Um, and so if I, I, this has happened before to me, I said, hey, it looks like you're frustrated. And then they got livid and they said, no, I'm not frustrated, I'm angry. And I said, oh, I apologize. Yeah, it, it, I, it makes sense that you're angry. So help me to understand what led to this. And then the person really almost vented. And I just listened, listen, listen, that makes sense. And they started to calm down through the process. So it takes a lot of courage to be able to sit in that emotionality, but this is the path toward getting a little bit more emotional stability so you can actually have higher level dialogue. Then the next step is getting curious with compassion. We're asking open-ended questions to gather more information. That's it. But specifically, we're doing it with a compassionate tone. Because if you're like me, there have been instances where somebody looked at you and said, you're yelling at me. And you're like, what? I am not yelling at you. First of all, you probably were, okay? <laughs> Second of all, yelling is more about tone than volume. And so we want to make sure that our tone is in the right place so that they don't respond as it is a threat because then they get emotional and we just work through that, okay? So we want to ask open-ended questions, but in, in a non-threatening way. And then the last step is joint problem solving. This is the, the point where we've worked through those emotional barriers. And now we've asked questions to gather information while being compassionate at the, at the same time. And now we have the information we need to solve problems. Let's introduce some creativity. Let's talk about solutions. But I want to invite you into the process. You're an important part of this. Because if we are just dictating to other people, then they will try to resist. Even if they agree, resistance will come down the road. And so you want them to feel as though they can look at the deal and see their fingerprints on the deal. Yeah, I had an impact on that because collaboration builds commitment. And that's it. That is it. And here's the takeaway. I mean, you can do this. Nothing that I talked about today was particularly complicated in terms of application, and that is by strategy. You can get very, very unnecessarily complicated <laughs> with the uh, approach for this, but if it's too complicated, you won't take action. So you, this is something that you can do, and it's really just small tweaks that can lead to big results. And so I have uh, less than a minute left. <laughs> I wish I had more time for questions, but I, I appreciate all of the participation throughout. That made it fun. I feel like I just started <laughs> this presentation. I really do. But connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm always on LinkedIn, and take advantage of those those free resources, um, the the various podcasts and the free guides. And we we love doing these types of negotiation trainings. As you can tell, um, I have created a job where I get paid to play, <laughs> really, uh, with with great people from around the world. So I appreciate your time and attention and go out there and have these conversations and in a meaningful way and then build those relationships.
Well, thank you so much, Kwame. As you probably can see in the Q&A panel, there are a number of thank yous um, for your time this morning. We thoroughly enjoyed that session. Um, for everyone, the next session will start at the top of the hour, so you have a few moments um, of a break between uh, this session and the next. But don't forget to join us two minutes um, before the top of the hour for the first prize announcements. Again, we are going to be giving away 10 copies of Kwame's book, Finding Confidence in Conflict. Um, so again, join us in about eight minutes, and we'll be giving away 10 copies of this book. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one.
everyone, and welcome back. And uh, we've got the results of that first break prize. Um, please join us in congratulating the following 10 individuals who have been participating in the Q&A panel and who have been randomly selected to win a copy of Kwame's, let me see, Finding Confidence in Conflict book. Um, so we'll be reaching out to you afterwards um, to see where we can send this. But congratulations to Jana Matthews, Latoya Parnell, Lois Wheeler, Christopher Pollard, Emily Osborne, Jeff Green, Alexia McCaskill, Michael McCarthy, Katie Beck, and Diane Margolis. So congratulations to our 10 winners. Again, we are gonna be reaching out to you um, to see where we can send you one of Kwame's books. And so I'm just gonna do a quick check and I think we are ready to move on to our next panel. And I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Taria. Welcome, Taria. Thank you so much, Jen, and hello, everyone. My name is Taria Thornton, Manager of Education Services and Diversity Initiatives here at Access Lex Institute. In this session, our distinguished panel will examine how successfully to engage first-generation students. They will reflect, reflect on programming best practices and share both their successes and challenges they face in supporting first-generation students on their campus. It is our hope that you'll leave today with concrete program ideas to help your students thrive from orientation to graduation. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists. We will have them say hello and introduce themselves, and we will start with Macy. Hi, I am Macy Edmondson. Um, thank you so much for having me today. I'm the newest faculty member in the University of Mississippi um, School of Education Higher Ed Department. Um, so that's been fun starting a new job in a pandemic. Um, I am also one of the co-founders of NALSAP and serve as the current uh, immediate past president. So thank you for having me. We will next go to Byron. Hi, everybody. Good, I don't know if we, wherever you are. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm not quite sure. Um, but um, my name is Byron Smarty, and I'm the Assistant Dean for Student Affairs here at UCLA School of Law. And I'm also glad to be joining you all today. Good afternoon, everyone. Last but not, not least, good Monica. Afternoon. I'm so happy to be here with all of you. I am a professor of law at New England Law Boston. I'm actually, I've been at the school for 13 years now, and this is my first, uh, third year as director of our first generation students program. And I'm just really happy to be here with all of you today. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I don't know about you, but I'm very excited about this session. As a first-generation student myself, this topic is near and dear to my heart. Before I turn it over to our panelists, I want to provide a little bit of an outline for today's session. Our panelists will follow the experience of a first-generation student on campus. They'll kick it off with onboarding and orientation, discuss ongoing support throughout the year or program, and then share how they've supported students as they graduate and transition into the workplace. And because it is still 2020, they will also talk about how they've supported their first generation students throughout the pandemic. Now, while we will cover the content first, please feel free to drop your questions into the Q&A panel and we will answer these questions at the end of the presentation. With that, Byrix, go ahead and get us started. Thank you so much. So I will launch us off. Um, so like we described, we try to break this down in ways that in some ways reflect the cycle of a law student. Um, hopefully that's organic and, and kind of makes sense to all of you as you develop programming. Um, and of course, as Taria mentioned, if you have questions, really excited to answer them um, toward the end um, or even offline if that's easier for you. So I'm gonna start at the very beginning. Um, 
which is onboarding and orientation, really focus on that transition to law school into that first year. And then my co-panelists will be taking it from there. Um, so a couple of things. These are really like ideas, tips, hopefully things that maybe you thought about, um, but maybe some new information too. So the first would be really collaborating with your admissions colleagues really throughout the summer um, leading up to orientation. I suspect many of you already do this, um, maybe even earlier on during the recruitment process or the post acceptance process, and certainly maybe even leading up to orientation. But the idea here is that you are also doing it with the eye towards first generation students specifically. Um, so what does that mean? It means just proactively and explicitly reaching out to your admissions colleagues and saying like, you know, what information is going out to incoming first years? And can we make sure that either we explicitly um, provide some content, some opportunities for first generation students to learn information or to ask questions, um, or can we even um, edit that information that is going out so that it's um, a little more, more sensible, a little more sensitive to those questions and those experiences. And related to that, um, this is what the, the second bullet point is, right? Scrutinizing any information online and any information that is going out um, so through, through the lens of a first generation student. So that can be many things. Some of you probably, uh, those of you who are watching who handle orientation or at least collaborate on orientation, um, you probably have either a section of your website or an entire website that's dedicated to orientation or to transitioning to law school. Um, you might be sending out, you probably do send out a lot of emails over the summer um, and the late summer before students arrive to campus, either virtually or in person, or even you're mailing out a lot of information and resources. So what this, the second bullet point is encouraging you to do is look at it through the lens of a first generation um, law student, right? Uh, so what, what, what would be an example of that? That could be looking at the vocabulary, being really careful to make sure that there aren't assumptions that you're making, things that you're taking for granted, um, things that might be uh, maybe even a couple years into law school you feel very familiar with, but for a first generation student might be flying over their head a little bit. That's very difficult to do on your own, even if you yourself uh, were a first generation law student. So my advice there would be to work with your current first generation law students and to say, hey, can you look at what we're about to send out this summer? Are there any, is there anything you would recommend we do or edit or, or rephrase so that it's a little more accessible, a little clearer to our first generation um, law students? And frankly, that's gonna help all of your incoming law students, not just your first generation law students. Um, and also asking those students even now, next semester, in hindsight, you're a first year student, you're in your second semester, are there things that we could have either um, discussed that we didn't discuss before, or are there ways in which we could have done it that would have been a little more helpful for you as you were about to start law school? And making sure that everything that goes out is going through that process of review. Um, related to that is this third point of developing and sharing a law school lingo document. So this is something that I worked, at, worked on with current students. I imagine many of you maybe have done it, but maybe some of you have not, which is a really simple one or two page um, document where you define sort of two categories of things. Um, one would be, uh, concepts, terminology, vocabulary that law students, no matter where they go to law school, are probably going to encounter over the first couple of weeks and months of law school. So that's everything from concepts such as case briefing or outlines or horn books or clerkships or externships, terminology like that that gets thrown around a lot in law school that students might hear early on and really, if they're first gen, really have no idea what those things are. But then there's a second category of, of concepts and terminology that you'll want to consider. And those would be things that are unique to your institution. So as we all know in higher education, there are a lot of acronyms and abbreviations and, and, and even, even locations on campus that people use a colloquial way to describe that if you're new to the school, you have no idea what those are. Uh, so the, this document that we work with current students on just tries to help first gen students know what those things are um, feel like they belong in the space, because why is this important? This is important because one of the things we hear from first-gen students is that one of the earliest times in which they start to question things, right, start to question whether they belong, whether they, um, they don't know something someone else knows and that they're supposed to know, they might feel like they're falling behind, it's when they hear this terminology get thrown around. So that can be everything from journals to if there's like a coffee shop on campus that everybody congregates at 
or if people uh, always say like, I'll meet you at this place, right? And this is a way of, again, just creating community, um, helping with that sense of belonging. Um, and it's also a great way to engage with your current first-gen law students in a way that they can feel like they're paying it forward. And then what we do is we share this document with first-gen students, you know, first self-identified first-gen students a few weeks before orientation, and then we send it to all students who are coming in during orientation. So it just helps everybody. And then finally, consider doing a separate pre-orientation or orientation program for first-gen students. A program can be a lot of things. A program can be a panel, it can be a workshop, it can be several days, it can be one day. Um, so I'll leave that up to you depending on your institution and what you're already doing. The goals though, and this is how you should try and think of it in, in, in developing these programs, are, are, are several. One would be making sure you're providing opportunities for incoming first-gen students to meet other incoming first-gen students, right? Building community, seeing that there's other students who are, 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 are approaching the space from similar backgrounds and experiences. It, it creates that sort of posse feel, if you will, of support and of community. Also an opportunity for them to meet upper level students and especially alumni who are first gen or who were first gen because that trajectory is gonna be so helpful to them to see that there are people who not only brought, um, came to law school with similar, um, maybe some challenges, but also some strengths, right? It's not just a deficit, it's also strengths and skill set and reminding them you can do this and as a 2L or a 3L or an alum or an alumna, I will be a mentor to you, right? And creating a space for them to ask those kinds of questions um, so that they can do it. Uh, the other thing would be creating space during those programs for family and loved ones to learn more about law school, right? What is that first year gonna be like? What are some of the things that are gonna be difficult about this that are gonna be different from any other academic program or experience? And then what are ways in which they can support their law student throughout that transition, the first six months and the first year? I think that's really valuable. And then finally, in these programs, an academic component is invaluable, right? So either a mock class where they're familiarizing themselves with the classroom, the Socratic method, with faculty, with class uh, material and, and opinions and readings, uh, but also academic skills, time management, organizing your notes, typing, right? Like getting used to typing really quickly if you're not used to typing your notes. Um, all of those things um, can be really helpful to not overwhelm students before orientation or during orientation, but to plant some seeds. And, and, and a really simple example is talk openly about um, office hours, right? Like what are office hours for and why should they take advantage of them? That's an academic, that's something that leads to academic success a lot of first-gen students don't anticipate. And then lastly, and I'll pass it along after that, um, it's also a great opportunity in these programs for first-gen students to meet key administrators and staff, and maybe even faculty at the law school who can help them. People who are here, who are available. This, if you do this during this, this time, it makes them seem, makes us seem more approachable. And it encourages first-gen students to know, everybody asks for help, everybody reaches out, students do this all the time, and we're here for you, and we can help you navigate the space and answer questions um, as you're um, transitioning to the first year of law school. So I will stop there. I'll be back a little bit later, uh, but I will now uh, hand it off to our next panelists. We'll be talking about um, ongoing support once the students arrive, matriculate, and move into law school. Thank you, Barrex. I appreciate that. Um, so beyond orientation and onboarding, um, what we're looking for for our first generation students is to cultivate a sense of belonging, right? Like we want them to be included and feel like they belong at law school. I'm gonna share a very quick story and some of you may have already heard this story about myself. Um, I am a first generation law student. Um, and as with many students who are attending law school for the first time, you know, we did fairly well in undergrad, right? So we managed to get to law school and, and, and think we're doing pretty well. Um, I vividly remember sitting in orientation next to someone and um, she looked over at me and she said, who is your Civ Pro teacher? And I looked at her for a few moments and I thought, do you mean civil procedure? And she said, yes, who is your Civ Pro professor? And that it was the moment in time I thought, oh, I may be a little in over my head here because I didn't know that you shortened civil procedure to CivPro. 
Um, and so that was the beginning of my law school career. And ever since then, um, I've been battling, you know, imposter syndrome, which I think a lot of our first generation students do. Um, and, and so it is our responsibility or our, our duty to kind of create this inclusiveness so that students do feel like they deserve to be at law school, just like all of the other students. Um, so one of those ways is to help students acclimate to law school. And I picked four categories. There are a plethora of categories, but I picked these four to talk about today. Um, the first is time constraints. Um, I don't know if any of you have access to your law school's LESI results, if you participate in the LESI survey, um, but they do show that uh, our first generation law students are spending more time working, and especially during the first year, right, where we're actually encouraging students not to work and to focus on their studies. That's when our first generation students see a, a, a bigger gap in those who are working and those who are not. Um, so it's important to have conversations early on to help them realize the, the time management skills that are going to be needed for law school and how much time they need to be putting forth to all of their classes and their courses, um, and especially at the end of the semester where they're studying for that one exam, right? Um, another uh, piece that I thought was extremely important was financial management. Um, many of our first generation students are students who will need to take out loans, um, either for living expenses or for tuition, um, for studying for the bar. Um, there are several loans that might come into play. Um, and also these students might be lucky enough to have scholarships, um, which is fantastic. But with those two pieces, being able to jump in on the front end and help them understand how those financial pieces work is so very important. Um, for example, if, you, if a student has a scholarship and the student may or may not be able to use it in the summer or may or may not be able to use it if they don't take so many hours during law school, um, all of those things need to be known at the front end so a student can prepare for their time in law school, uh, especially since we're seeing that our first generation students are those who are working more. Um, uh, and Access Lex actually does a fantastic job at providing that financial literacy piece for our students and also that one-on-one -on -one availability for students to be able to speak to a financial planner is golden. Um, so, you know, introduce that to your students super early on so that they can plan because preparation is key. Um, another thing that I thought was um, super important to prepare for was BAR studying for the bar, um, they need to hear from someone other than the bar prep uh, individuals who provide those services so that they can make informed decisions and uh, choose a bar preparation that's going to fit their needs. Um, and again, doing this early on is, is most helpful. Um, regarding summer clerkships, uh, I've seen students who have turned down a clerkship because of either no, because the clerkship was not paying or because it was very low pay so that they could work during the summer. Um, but I think if, if our administrators and our faculty could let students know how important these summer clerkships really are, especially whenever they're preparing for practice upon graduation um, and, and just giving them the full picture so that they know all of the pros and cons for accepting clerkships during the summer um, is, is so helpful for our first generation law students. Um, Byrex mentioned establishing peer and alumni mentoring opportunities. Um, when students see people who look like them, they are more likely to succeed. Uh, I had a, a program where all of our professors who are first-generation students 
uh, they would um, meet with our first generation 1Ls at the beginning of the semester. And you could see a light bulb go off in several students' uh, minds because they thought, well, if this professor can be here and is a first generation student, then I can too. And it made a huge difference. Um, and also, Byrex mentioned scheduling family and friends events or events that are family and friends friendly. Um, we don't want to make law school an exclusive event that is designed to push people of support away, right? We want those people of support to stay in our students' lives. So if we have more events where family and friends are invited, then it makes a huge difference for our students, especially our first generation students, that their family and friends can experience what the students are experiencing at the same time. The new professor in me would be remiss if we did not talk just a moment about a framework to work with our first gen students. Um, we've been using the term first generation students, uh, you know, since the beginning of this uh, of this presentation. And but what does that actually mean, right? So we we have in our head what we think that means, and it fits into a nice little box. Um, but really, our students have multiple identities. We all have multiple identities. Um, so I encourage you to view uh, our first-gen students and to work with your first-gen students and really any student through the lens of intersectionality. And if you remember, intersectionality was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, who's also a lawyer, um, and she was using the case of DeGraff and Reed versus General Motors, where determining whether General Motors discriminated against black women it should have, the court should have considered the treatment of black women, not of white women and black men, right? Those don't equal the same thing. Black women's experience were and are different. So we have students with, uh, with multiple identities. Um, and I want you to look at this chart that is also from Lessie. Um, you'll see that our highest numbers of first-gen students are also Latinx, um, followed by Black, Asian, and White. And, and one day, I hope that we have a multiracial category, but that's for another day. Um, so, you know, be mindful of our marginalized students and how their identities intersect. You know, we don't want to to put first-gen students in a nice, neat box and assume that everything that we're doing for first-gen students fits every student, right? So I just want you to keep this in mind when you're trying to pro provide support and resources for students. Um, you know, keep this in mind so that you can do it in a meaningful way. And now I will let uh, Monica proceed with work first-gen students working with faculty and staff. Thank you, Macy. And it's so nice to be here with everyone. And in a law school setting, I'm what is called a doctrinal professor. And so some of you in the audience, depending on where you work, that may be surprising to you that I'm also heading up our first generation students program. And similar to Macy, it really does stem from my own personal experience and background. Um, and Increasingly, I was meeting with students individually who were first generation students who, because I tend to be a relatively open person, outspoken person, they knew that I was also first gen and they would come to me with concerns. And over time, it became clear that we really needed a program that was tailored to their needs, to their experiences. And the law school setting by and large is not really designed for the first generation student. Um, I would say that that also applies to our higher ed landscape generally. And so if we look at some of the data on this, it's actually quite interesting. And it's something that we, as those who work day in and day out in higher ed, can sometimes tend to forget. But in the United States, only 14.6, only 14.6% 
of workers over the age of 25 have either a master's or a doctorate or a professional degree, right? And so when we have students who are first generation students and they're coming into that higher ed environment, it's akin to being an immigrant in a foreign land. You really are having to learn different values, different um, codes, unspoken norms, and you're having to navigate all of that in addition to learning the substantive uh, material that you're responsible for. So what we started to do at my school, and like I said earlier, this is the third year of this particular program's uh, operation, is that I needed to figure out a way that I could work with all of the different departments at my school because that becomes so important. And so I worked with admissions so that we would have a question that now we have on our application form where students, when they're applying to the school, they can let us know if they are in fact a first generation student and we ask for their parents' uh, highest, either parents' highest level of education. And that does a couple of things. It turned out, you know, the way things work in the world, the synergy the forces being what they are, we, uh, soon after we started our, our program, we also had a new enrollment officer who was also very interested in this particular population. And so now utilizes that data and students can also apply for a specific scholarship that is targeted uh, to them as first generation students. What that has also enabled me to do is now that I have students identifying, self-identifying as first gen, I can then contact those students right away early in their law school career. I can reach out to them to let them know about the resources that we have in place specifically for them. This is where the faculty role, and I have here, of course, Mr. Rogers, our friend, right, who we all love. And I have to say, for those of us who are immigrant kids in the United States and learn to speak English by watching PBS, <laughs> you know, Mr. Rogers holds a special place in my heart. And he always said, look for the helpers. And I think we need to help guide our students so that they know that there are more helpers at the school setting whether it's college or law school, then they may initially believe, right, that there are. And so with first gen status in particular, it can be a little bit of a hidden um, uh, component to a faculty member's uh, characteristics, identity. We need to really try to be as open about that as possible. And I'll just give you an example in terms of why working in a law school setting with first year faculty is important, but I imagine in a college undergraduate setting, thinking about who are the professors that are teaching large courses, intro courses, who really are getting these students right away when they come in. I teach property law uh, in the first year. Every year I talk about the Euclid case. Those in the room who are lawyers, law, who've been law students know this introduces a section on zoning law and there's a Supreme Court case from the 20s that basically refers to a multifamily home as a quote unquote parasite. Now, I've been teaching property law for 13 years. Every year that I read that case and I prepare to teach my students, it is a personal affront, <laughs> right? Why? Because I grew up in a low income neighborhood. We lived in triple deckers. These were the three family homes in the old mill towns in New England. I say that every year I have a conversation with my students about this, right? Why it's interesting to see the language, the terminology that the court, that judges are using. And bringing up those issues in the context of a first year course that may have 100 students or more is that it normalizes this experience. It says to students, we're not the only ones, right? We're not the only ones who maybe had parents who worked in factories. We're not the only ones who maybe were immigrants. We're not the only ones whose parents, you know, only have a high school degree, whatever it may be. I think it's so important for you to find those allies if you're not, uh, you know, one of the, the faculty, a member of the faculty, see if you can identify members of the faculty who you believe 
understand this message, see why it's so important, and who are willing to even at the very least mention the resources that do exist at your own educational institution in the context of the typical, traditional, you know, quote unquote, normal uh, school environment. So again, it's demystified, we normalize it, and it helps with that sense of belonging. Um, the other piece that I wanna mention also with respect to who might be an ally is the uh, staff members and or administrators and or faculty members who are experts on diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? And so we tend to think about race and ethnicity, but I think it's also so important to think about socioeconomic class and background in this context and to be very explicit about making that part of your diversity, equity, and inclusion message. And I think if you find those individuals on campus who are particularly interested in these issues, they are also very good partners for you um, in this work. I wanted to tell you just a little bit about a specific focus that the program at my school has taken, and that has to do with mental health and wellness, but very much uh, in accordance with what some of the literature describes as having a, uh, a health focus as opposed to a disease focus, right? So in other words, when we think about the mental health issues that many law students face and that we know they carry with them into the legal profession, right? We have a legal profession in this country where lawyers suffer from rates of depression that are higher than almost any other occupation. Well, guess what? We start that in the law school years where there have been studies, whether you're looking at studies by uh, Sheldon and Krieger, that basically look at how subjective well-being is declining over the law school period, not just the first year, but the entire law school period. So how do we help students, right? I think what we recognize in this community is we don't want it to wait for a crisis to then say, oh, well, we have maybe some support services how do we do this in a way that we are trying to inculcate those uh, coping mechanisms that are healthy coping, coping mechanisms, that we're trying to build resilience um, and we're instilling in students, hopefully, healthy mechanisms that they can then carry with them into their profession. And Macy mentioned something that I think is so critical, which is this idea of many of our first generation students they have strong family networks. They have strong home communities. Unfortunately, for far too long, there has been a message in higher education, certainly in legal education, that that is dead weight. You need to cut those ties in order to quote unquote, succeed. We really need to be mindful and aware of these messages that we're sending either explicitly or implicitly because if we want to use that type of a psychological model and the approach that Kwame Christian mentioned so beautifully, we need to keep this in mind and we need to think what is going to help these students be successful here as students, but also later on in their lives, right? Across a lifetime, looking at a longitudinal, looking at a long-term outcome, I think is incredibly important for us and it starts here. So to that end, Faculty, right, and this is where, you know, my little spiel here is really about faculty members have an incredible role to play um, because they're modeling. They're modeling these behaviors for the students. They're letting students know what is okay, what is acceptable in this environment, this new environment that many of them are finding themselves in. In terms of a concrete action that I think everyone can take at their school is just increasing access and awareness about mental health and wellness resources. So even if you're at a school that, for instance, my school, we're a standalone law school. So we don't have the level of resources that perhaps a school that is affiliated with an undergraduate institution might have, but that is not a barrier, right? It really is not a barrier. And there are opportunities such as working with your local lawyers concerned for lawyers group. There are these nonprofits that exist in every state in the United States that any law school, any faculty member can reach out to. And one of the very specific programs that we've implemented is 
we have as a component of our first generation students program, a group. And this group began as a monthly group session for first gen students to just be themselves with no law school facade to talk about what is going on in their lives, what they're having issues with. And the first year that I did this, I was there alone as a law professor helping guide the students. Well, guess what? Unlike Kwame, I'm not a clinician, right? I don't have that background in psychology. And right away, I partnered with this incredible woman whose photo I've now put on this PowerPoint, who is Barbara Bow, And she's a clinician at my local lawyers concerned for lawyers. And in the last two years, she and I have been co-facilitating these what have now become weekly group sessions for our first gen students. And we're focusing on that health model, right? We're looking at this as building these traits, resiliency, so that these students can be successful in the long term. And I just wanna go back to one point before I close with, with this portion, which is the need for more empirical data, right? And it, this goes back to the initial comments that were made by the president of, of, president of uh, Access Lex. There's a lot more research that we need to do as a community. Those of us who are already on the same page about wanting to help this population of students, we need to learn how we can best support them, right? Because we have our ideas, we know what worked for us as students, what didn't work, but we need a lot more data so that we can help. You know, I saw one of the questions in the chat earlier was, how do I deal with the pushback? that I may get from colleagues or maybe from administrators about why we want to spend time and resources assisting with this population. And so I think that data is incredibly important. Again, opportunities, right? Thinking about what are the opportunities within our grasp. For me, I'm at a standalone school. I'm not affiliated with an undergraduate institution, but guess what? I attended an undergraduate institution. And so I've been able to affiliate with my undergrad institution as a research associate and what that does is it now gives me access to an institutional review board so i'm poised to be able to conduct this type of research and data to try to not just um, help my institution manage a lot of these issues but hopefully working with this entire community we can really change some of these narratives i think for the educational community because for far too long i think this has been a neglected uh, a neglected population so thank you so much for for letting me talk to you today and let me just put um, i'm going to turn it over to the next uh slide and turn it over to um, our next panelist. Thank you. Okay, I guess I can tackle this part. Um, I know that we're gonna talk a little bit about me working with staff, but I can, should I move ahead? Okay, I'll try can weave this all in. We'll, we'll make a best attempt here. Um, so in terms of starting a program, I should specify two quick things. One, uh, a program, like I said earlier, can mean a lot of different things. I'll be speaking mostly about a student organization um, on your campus, but I think a lot of this translates to the kind of work that Monica is doing. It doesn't have to, it could be administrative, it can be institutional. And the second thing is a lot of this, I think translates across disciplines and academic programs. So I think a lot of these, um, sort of suggestions and tips and things that I'm going to discuss uh, will work with uh, if you're not at a law school. I think you'll still hopefully find something helpful here. Um, so the first would be, uh, when I'm thinking again of, of largely a student organization, um, one would be working with students. This comes up actually quite a bit. Um, what exactly does first gen mean, right? We've been talking about that in different ways during our presentation today. Um, but that's something that students themselves ask themselves as a community when they're, uh, let's say it's a graduate program, right? Do we mean first gen college graduate? Um, do we mean first gen um, professional school student? Do we mean first gen um, law school specific or another professional school or master's program? I think it's really valuable to have, to kind of facilitate that conversation among the students because you want the students to um, have buy-in and ownership over sort of the identity and the community that they're trying to build and to just have open and frank conversations around 
what type of community they're trying to accomplish through the organization. Um, and, and sort of the way in which, at least my experience has, has been and, and the direction we go in is one, it's, it is important to um, sort of acknowledge the sort of the unique identity experiences and needs and opportunities for first gen college students within a grad program. I think that's still important to amplify and elevate and recognize. Um, but I think then beyond that, thinking of all the other first generation, um, again, experiences, opportunities, that can include um, everything from first generation, you know, citizen, first generation, um, law school pro uh, a student as opposed to another program, uh, and just having the students themselves revisit that conversation over time so that their programming and their resources are, are accessible and, and, and a big tent without sacrificing um, or, or, or sort of minimizing um, some of the, you know, particular uh, experiences um, that uh, some of their students will have. And again, reminding about embracing intersectionality. I think one of the wonderful things about in an academic program is having in, in the first-gen community um, students come together that they, who otherwise really sometimes never do, right? So these are students who, um, who might connect with others across social identities, um, that could be race, that could be disability, that could be socioeconomic status, that could be gender, gender identity, um, political ideology, that could be uh, faith traditions. I mean, it, it is a really wonderful um, opportunity for them to, to just meet other students and to connect around this identity um, in ways that they otherwise might not. The other thing in, in working with students, and I think this is true no matter if it's a student organization or a program that you're running, and it's just trying to strike the balance between supporting what they want to do. So I saw a lot of the questions in the chat um, that I've been seeing, um, my, my answer is ask your students. Right? Like I, I actually think that that's really valuable to ask the first gen students, um, you know, what programming would be helpful to you, right? Like if we're developing an event, what's a good time to do that? What kind of content would you like to see? What support can our offices, not just student affairs, not just career services, not just financial aid, but all, as an institution, how can we help you um, while giving them ownership and independence of sorts to create the safe space where sometimes they only want students in the room or in the virtual room, if you will, talking about their experiences and giving advice. Um, I'm not going to lie, sometimes it's, it's, it is difficult because by, the, the, by its very nature, if you're a first-gen student, you might not know what you don't know, right? So, um, so it's, it's trying to strike that balance between reaching out to students and saying like, hey, I know you're all planning something, and this of course assumes you've created the organization. Um, or you can say like, we're thinking of doing this program, what are your thoughts about that? What feedback do you have? Um, do you want to be involved? And if so, at, at what level is that feasible for you? Um, we've already talked about first-gen contacts, which basically means highlighting for students um, early on who the people who can be resources for them could be in different areas. Um, again, career services, academic support, faculty, so that they don't have to do all the legwork of like figuring out who do we ask to help us with a, a panel or with a workshop. Um, Similarly, check in during pivotal moments, not just law school moments, right? Depending on the academic program you're in, there are just these checkpoints, right? That's the start of the semester, that's a month into the semester, that's around studying for finals, that's around the time grades come out, that's around the time when job searches are really ramping up, graduation, uh, and the summer too, right? If they're doing internships over the summer, it's that first time in that space, and sometimes they feel like, well, I can't seek help from the law school right now because I'm not enrolled. That's not true, right? Uh, it's a great time actually to check in with us and for us to check in with them and to offer support and, and have conversations around how to navigate whatever they're dealing with in, in, in that setting, um, either an employment setting or a volunteer pro bono setting. Um, and then actually this point about honoring graduation, um, that to me is so important, right? I think having, uh, it could be a really informal event, but something that you're doing at the end of the academic year to bring together um, the graduating first-gen students and, and really just marking that as its own unique uh, moment for them and letting them reflect on their experience at the, at the law school or at the academic program, letting them speak to other students, let other students uh, uh, show their appreciation for the mentorship that a lot of times these three L's have provided. And then you can also um, invite people um, at the law school to speak, right? Like have a first generation faculty member or staff person, administrator, give brief remarks. Uh, I think it's like a nice way of kind of elevating the program and make it a little more official without being stuffy. Uh, and my experience too is 
Uh, I don't want to overgeneralize, but this is the kind of program that you can usually get money for. <laughs> and what I mean by that is there's usually a graduate of a law school or an academic program that's not a law school or, or if it's a law school, a law firm that will give the school, it's not a ton of money, right? But money for like food for the event or a nice gift, right? Like a portfolio or something for the graduates. So if you're wondering like, how would we actually pay for this? This is the kind of thing that in my experience, you can find people. So working with your development office or with others to identify who those organizations or individuals are. Um, and then this is a good segue, and I'm not gonna repeat too much of what we talked about. I just wanna reiterate how important it is to talk early and often about um, the bar admission and application process, because a lot of times students, not just first-gen students, but they think the bar exam is applying to the bar, right? And that's not true. That's a component of being admitted to the bar. But there's so much else, including the application, the moral character and fitness component, the MPRE, um, the financial aspects of it, bar prep companies. Um, so making sure that you're always thinking of all of your students, particularly your first-gen students, who might not reach out to you in the first place. So making sure that you are proactively sending information to all students, that you're also maybe forwarding that email that you send to all students um, to your first-gen students or to a student organization and saying, hey, if there are questions about this, I just want to really reiterate that people should come talk to us because it is complicated, it's hard to navigate. Um, and then lastly, over the summer, I think it's really helpful to have alumni um, who can check in with graduates. Again, not just first-gen graduates, but I think particularly first-gen graduates having first-gen, it could be the same alumni they met earlier during their time in law school, but saying like, I did this, I got through this, it is difficult, it is stressful. Um, and, and not so much here, like the prep for the exam, I, I'm thinking more of like affirming messages, right? And, and pep talks and checking in with them and then connecting students, those students with resources um, that can exist still at the law school if they are struggling with more kind of technical or substantive aspects of bar prep. So I wanted to mention that too, and then I will hand it off to, I think, Macy, and actually all of us will collaborate on this piece around COVID-19. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we've had a couple of questions in the uh, chat about how do you do all of this during COVID, right? Um, because again, what we were trying to do is cultivate a sense of belonging and doing that over a computer screen is a little bit more difficult than in regular times. Um, and Zoom fatigue is so real. Um, and I'll share just a very quick story with you because I know that we're, we want to get to some of your questions. Um, I hosted a uh, like an online meet and greet for our first gen students and I had somebody from the writing center um, available. I had um, a research librarian available. Um, I had a first gen, um, another student who was available. And we were all there waiting for these people to pop in for this meet and greet. And guess what? Nobody showed up. So um, I didn't, you know, at the time I felt like a failure, but now I am learning from, you know, what we can do better. So because Zoom fatigue is real and sometimes they won't come to you, make it to where they can go to it. So right now I'm in the process of making like a repository for resources for first gen students. Like that's particularly curated for first gen students. So I have a few articles in there. I don't know if they're gonna read articles, but they're there. Um, I have a link to um, the Writing Center. Um, I've recorded other folks on campus who can be helpful to them, and it's geared just towards first-gen students. And there's a place where you can sign up to have a mentor if you're interested in a mentor. And um, it's not my favorite because I'd rather see these people in person and help them, and you know, have a, a nice dinner for them or what have you. But I'm, you know, we do what we can during this time. Um, so creating a re repository of, of resources is helpful. Um, individual check-ins, uh, that goes a long way. And you probably can't do it on your own, so divide and conquer. Um, I know that uh, there were others in the chat that were mentioning um, 
um, other administrators in the law school, career services, financial aid, um, divide your first gen students up and just have somebody check in with them individually. You know, how's it going? What do you need? Uh, do you need any help understanding anything? Those individual check-ins at least show that the law school is aware of them, they see them, and they want to help them. Um, so that is uh, extremely uh, helpful. And then also, um, we do have a number of first-gen students who have caregiving responsibilities. Either they have children or they're caring for other people in their uh in their families. And so um, having that message with others in your law school so that they understand what's going on behind the screen is so helpful. And so if you have any resources that can help with that, it will also be helpful in, in making sure that we're encompassing all of those things that might be uh, present in a first generation life during law school. Um, we are getting super short on time, so I'm going to, I think we might move to questions. Is that okay, Byrex and Monica? Great. Okay, thank you for that. So absolutely, the information you all have provided is absolutely applicable, no matter what your setting is. Prior to coming to Access Select, I worked for a college of dentistry, and that was one of the best parts of always coming to the Access Select conference. I can apply the information to the setting I was also in. So let's go ahead and also give a bit of information. One of the other aspects of Access Select conferences is that you all are so helpful. So if you have lingo documents or anything else that you want to share with other participants, you can send that to conferences at accesslex.org. We'll make sure that we share it with the other attendees today. All right, so we have a great question. We always talk about the benefits of having first-generation programming and how it is very beneficial to students and the entire community. But sometimes there is pushback and there are challenges associated with trying to build a program like this. So what do you recommend when um, they're receiving pushback or even from some of the professors who are first-gen who don't see that it's necessary how can you really get that buy-in? So I, I can start off with this one in terms of um, A, by being realistic. I think you really want to be realistic and you want to recognize that not everybody is going to immediately see this issue in the same manner that you do, right? And so for those of us who did have an experience of either being first generation or maybe having grown up in a working class background and just finding the higher education environment to be very uh, different than what we had been accustomed to uh, growing up. I think it's always been somewhat common sense to us that this is a very different type of an environment and that proactive steps need to be taken in order to make it a welcoming environment, in order to foster that sense of belonging. And this is where I think maybe what Kwame Christian was talking about in terms of some of those strategies might be incredibly helpful here, right? Because you want to, and this is something that I think um, it grows with time. In other words, the first year of your program, you may not have immediate buy-in from all of your faculty colleagues or from all of the administrators. However, with each passing year, you are going to have happier first-generation students in the current student body. Once those students graduate or start to graduate from your institution, you're going to find that the experiences that those students can then talk about in terms of what they had in place for them when they were students is such that now those stories are going to start to get the attention of maybe individuals who initially didn't see how this could really be beneficial. And Byrex had talked a little bit about the idea that, you know what, this is the type of program or these are the types of initiatives or these are the, this is the population that many in the alumni community may actually want to help support. And so, for instance, at my own institution, I have found that one of my biggest allies 
and my partners and supporters is actually the school's communications team. Internal communications, but also external communications, because they see these stories and they say, this tells a really great story about who we are as an institution. And so, you know, I say you need a little patience, but I think you can get there by really starting to demonstrate some concrete examples of why it's so important. Well, thank you so much for your responses and the impactful and applicable content that you provided in today's panel. A thousand miles starts with a single step and you all have definitely provided us with some steps that we can take in all of our different institutions. So join me in thanking our panelists, Monica, Byrix, and Macy. And thank you so much, Taria, mm -hmm. and, um, and to all of you. Really appreciate that session. And I know that you all can't wait for another chance to win something fun. Are you ready? All right, here is your next chance to win. I am going to ask you a question. Get ready for the chat panel. Here comes the chat panel question. What is the name of the new Access Lex Bar Review Program? And up for grabs this time around are 20 super cozy hoodies, just like what I'm uh, modeling for you here right now. Um, so go ahead and throw those in the chat panel. And then we'll see you back here at a uh, couple minutes before the top of the hour uh, to announce those winners. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you soon.
Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I honestly have the best job in the universe because I get to work with the really fantastic bar review engagement team that I affectionately call the Heart of Helix. And congratulations to so many of you who uh, got the correct answer, which is absolutely um, Helix Bar Review. So thank you. I'm thrilled to know that so many of you already know the name of our program. And um, you're going to be getting one of these fabulous hoodies. I do, um, I'm gonna step off screen here for one moment. Um, we do have both this gray version um, and this super fabulous black version too. So one of them is going to be coming to the following 20 winners. And I'll make sure I put this in um, into a note too. And I'll be emailing all of you afterwards to get your sizes and your addresses for these. But drum roll please, are you ready? Here we go. Amanda Fox, Susan Bogart, Casey Graham, Alicia Miles, Ema DeBong, Melody Weagle, Lynette Lorenzetti, Paul Leopold, Terrence Cook, Trenye Mason, Jenny Branson, Hong Tran Escobar, Joni Weirdu, Andre Marrero, Queena Muirs, Douglas Jansen, Lindsay Stetson, Michelle Cooley, Cassandra Jeter Bailey, and Nancy Benavides. Congratulations to all 20 of you. And again, we'll be in touch to get your addresses and your sizes. All right. I am now going to just do a quick check. It looks like we've got our next presenters on the line. And I would like to go ahead and turn over the show to Jennifer DeSanza. Jennifer? Thank you so much, Lisa. I appreciate it. I'm Jennifer DeSanza. I'm the regional manager for the Mid-South in the Access Lex Center for Education and Financial Capability. This session will explore how to best advise students based on their individual identities. I'm very excited to moderate this session. As a former law school student affairs administrator, I can appreciate the challenges in navigating this landscape. Today's speakers will discuss intersectionality, privilege, and how to move on beyond allyship in support of your students and the ingredients in their own use soup. So I am very pleased to present our presenters for At the Corner of Privilege and Oppression, Strategies for Advising Students at the Intersection of Multiple Identities. We will do the questions at the end of the session, but feel free to throw them in the Q&A panel as we go along. First, we're going, I'm going to introduce Gino P. Ray. Gino, could you unmute yourself and say hello? Hi, can everyone hear me? We can hear you. Great. I am Gino Ray. I'm the director of the Legal Scholars Program for the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Tori, are you there? Tori, are you there? Are you there? Are you there? Gino, can you hear me? No, I can't hear you. Hi, Troy. I can hear you. Jennifer, we can't hear you now. Can you hear me? Hello? I hear you, Troy. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, well, I'm hoping everyone else can. Okay, so good afternoon. I apologize for that. My name is Troy Riddle. I am currently the Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer for the Natural Resources mm -hmm. Defense Council. In my prior life, um, mm -hmm. I served uh, in education uh, 
person for uh, twelve years. So it's nice to be here with you. I appreciate you sharing or taking time out of your day to share share the space with us. Well, welcome everyone. I'm so glad that we can be here. Uh, this is a very unique way uh, to have this kind of session. Uh, as we are so no, uh, accustomed to, Troy and I are to doing this session with kind of the human connection, the face-to-face -face connection, uh, because it really allows you to get more interactive and, and to dive a bit more uh, deeply into the conversations. But we're going to try to create a space here where we can have a conversation, uh, and, and hopefully we'll, we will be able to do that with these ground rules. And, and the first rule is that we're here to create space. These conversations are going to center the narratives of people who have been uh, suffering at the hands of oppressive systems, and we're going to issue calls to action. Uh, we're going to grow together. We are here to grow together. So we don't have all the answers. We are simply facilitators in this human exchange. Uh, I believe that this is kind of, these are, this is a part of what, what I call healing conversations. And in those healing conversations, healing is equal parts individual as well as communal. So hopefully by being able to have these conversations in the safety of community, uh, we'll be able to continue to see ourselves grow as we rise from allyship into other levels of supporting our students. And finally, we thank you. We thank you for trusting us to lead you in this journey. These are difficult conversations to have. And the way that a lot of these terms and, and, and things have been framed, uh, it, it can seem like a personal attack a lot of times to just use certain words. And we want you to understand that we're here to have a conversation to deconstruct all sides of the conversation and find a way that we can comprehensively and collectively move together. Uh, so thank you. Let's see, let's dive in here. <laughs> There's a newsflash that we all exist at the intersection of multiple identities. This may, may or may not be a secret for most of us, um, but all of us are a blend of wonderful uh, pieces that make a whole. And let's paint a picture of that by understanding the intersections of Troy Riddle. <laughs> Thanks, Gino. So, so there are a few emojis here, but I, I'm a little bit more complex than this. But I will just say uh, that I am a black, able-bodied, cisgender male. I'm the firstborn and the baby boy. I'm educated. I'm first generation. I'm a lover of music and a musician on the low. Don't tell anybody. But I, but I'm also someone who has battled depression religious guilt, survivor's remorse, imposter syndrome, and other feelings of inadequacy. And guess what? I carry all of this around with me every single day. Well, that's kind of hard to come behind, Troy. You make it pretty difficult, but... Uh, I'm Gino Ray, and here, some of my intersections are, you know, I put a, a, a mermaid of me, uh, image of me here, because I believe that I am Black, and my Black is magical um, from the way I understand my space that I occupy in this world. Um, I descend from wonderful, beautiful people uh, who have instilled in me wonderful, beautiful gifts and talents, and I can only hope that I can go out into the world and live up uh, to how great those gifts are that have been instilled in me. Uh, I put my peach here because I am a Georgia peach. I am from the great state of Georgia. I tell people everywhere I go, I am a country boy. Um, and like Troy, I am also a musician. Uh, I love the outdoors. I love hiking. Um, and I identify as a uh, gay man. And so I, I'm full of all of this magic, all of this beauty, all of these wonderful parts of who I am. And all of these come together uh, to help identify and, and create a more complete picture of who I am and how I identify and so with that in mind, what is intersectionality? So from the textbook, Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, she's a feminist scholar, critical race theorist, uh, civil rights ad advocate. She defines intersectionality as overlapping and intersecting social identities and the related systems of oppression, domination, or discrimination. So what that means is that we all exist with these varying social identities. We, we, we come from backgrounds where we may, we may be a woman and we may be wealthy and we may be black and we may have all of these different pieces of our, our identities that come together. And those identities will impact how we engage with systems of oppression and domination. So 
in the context of being a, a, a male, I may have some privilege in, 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 in that particular part of my intersection that dictates or, or informs how I might interact with people who are not male. And so understanding how your identities interact and relate to potential systems of oppression, domination, and, and discrimination is the core of what intersectionality is getting at. Um, and, and, and how does this connect to the, con the context in which we're speaking from intersectionality and privilege? So I'll let Troy tell us a little bit about a quick privilege primer. Okay, thank you. So I want you to kind of notice the chart. They kind of build upon what Gino said. So, you know, it, you are, your many identities are parts of kind of the whole you. Some parts uh, you create for yourself, while other parts of your identity have been created, named, and framed by society for centuries, right? We call them social identities. And your, your social identity is the you that relates to other people in society. Um, much of our culture comes from our social identities and the groups we belong to or get lumped into by society. And, and, and sometimes this is not always your choice, right? As others may place you in categories, even though you don't identify the same way, right? So it's the proverbial box, right? Putting you in the box. Well, th th those identities, right? Some social identities hold privilege, which is denoted in this graph above the line that says domination, right? Even within us, there are parts of us that hold some power and other parts that are oppressed. And the identities that fit neatly into these the imaginary box that I just mentioned are typically the identities with uh, the most power and the most agency, okay? So one of the examples I used to, to use um, and when I talk to law students about, about this is my privilege in the hall of law school as a JD holder, as a, a senior administrator, there were privileges that I had walking through um, the halls of the law school, right? But not so much as a black man driving my car uh, in any city in the United States of America, not so much, right? So privilege is also uh, contextual, right? And situational. Um, privilege is the benefits received due to how close you are to the dominant culture and privilege. Uh, my dear friends, uh, is unearned. It just is based on these society normatives that we kind of find ourselves into. Um, another example that I'd like to share is um, uh, of privilege and power in this country, right? At least uh, for me is, and, and many of you, is the English language, right? We live in a country where, where English is the most commonly spoken uh, language. Um, I can read, I can understand signs uh, and directions. I can walk into a store and the person assisting me will likely know what I'm talking about, right? Um, I don't have to worry about it. It just, it, it just is, right? Now, as a person of color, or more specifically a black man, whether the person decides to assist me, right, is a conversation for another panel, space, and time, right? But what I want you to get is that privilege is situational, it's contextual, uh, privilege comes with power, and the people who do not benefit from their social identities, who are in the subordinate culture, have little to no privilege or power. And so I want you to just reflect on this chart a little bit um, and see where your identities fall, the things that kind of resonate with you, and just notice how many of your, your, your identities provide you privilege, and then how many of your identities do not. And just to think about that and hold on to that as we move through um, the presentation. Thank you. So thank you for that, Troy, because that's, that's actually an amazing way to frame that and, and leads us to this next com conversation, because oftentimes when we're told we have privilege or when we realize that we hold privilege, because of the way the word is wielded sometimes in certain conversations, it may make us feel guilty. It may make us feel uh, like we're a problem because we have privilege. It's not necessarily about holding privilege. It's really about how you use it. It's about possession versus use. We all are privileged in some ways, um, especially if you're living in the United States of America, um, even between you know country to country of origin, we hold some privilege over other countries in the nation, just by, uh, in the world, excuse me, by being Americans, right? And so all of us hold some sort of privilege. How do we use our privilege and how do we wield it? So we talk about, often talks about, talk about equal rights and equity, you know, now the, the, the push is towards diversity, equity, and inclusion in all of our institutions. Uh, we're really moving around anti-racist agendas. What does that look like? 
Um, in the in the civil rights movements of the of the past, we've seen it largely look like you know moving legislative agendas, moving judicial agendas, and that was necessary because the very laws of the nation uh, uh, were were disenfranchising citizens of the nation. But as we move away, and laws on the books are becoming a bit more uh, equitable in their language we still see that there's a problem, there's a disconnect. And why is that problem there? Well, it's because it's not about trying to legislate privilege, it's about how we're using privilege and wielding privilege on daily, on a daily basis in our daily spaces. And so when you hold privilege, the, the, the best, the thing to be most mindful of is how, once I am aware of my privilege, am I intending to use this privilege and the use of the privilege, the most appropriate use of that privilege should be towards censoring those people who have suffered the oppression under the, the, the privilege systems and being able to balance the scales by leveraging your privilege for their liberation. Awesome. And Troy's gonna show us a little story of how intersectionality works here with the story of my guy, Bob. <laughs> yeah, you gotta love Bob, right? Bob is in quite the quandary that I think many of us have found ourselves in uh, from time to time. So I'm just gonna kind of walk you through this chart. So, so meet Bob. This is Bob. Bob is a triangle, right? Um, but Bob is a striped triangle. Uh, and Bob is proud. Uh, well, he, he should be proud, but Bob is having some trouble. So some people don't like Bob because Mm, they don't like triangles, right? So Bob faces oppression uh, for being a triangle and for having stripes, right? And so Bob is trying to find his place, right? So Bob is thinking, luckily, there are liberation groups, but they aren't in uh, intersectional kind of relationships. So what does that look like? That means that Bob can go to the group that embraces triangles, but he cannot share or express uh, uh, his identity as it relates to his stripes. Right? So he's really unfulfilled in the meeting with the triangles just because of their shape, right? But then if he goes to the, 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 the box where the, where the stripes are welcomed and, and, and understood, right? He can express that part of his identity, but there's no talk, no mention uh, ever of being a triangle, right? Now, the, the unfortunate thing, and this is how we find, I think, a lot of our groups on campus is like, so we just focus on our own identity and there's not a kind of a, a collaboration or a push for collaboration for groups to kind of make space or room for people who don't necessarily fit neatly into a box. And so Bob is wishing that the, that, that, that people would just kind of work together or these groups work together so he could find one space uh, with which he could show up and be his full and authentic self, right? And so I think the goal is to, to, to get you to think about this as we create these groups and put these teams together and we try to kind of put people in the, the proverbial box um, uh, with the understanding that, 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 that people are more than what they appear. So Bob is more than just a triangle. He's more than just a triangle with stripes. And so, to, so we have to try to create space um, and room for those those identities to 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 exist fully, um, and so that's kind of the goal, and that's kind of the ask of, of this this session. Thanks, Gino. Thank you. So, what might all of this mean in the context of student advising? We are seeing a generation that is a lot more aware uh, of the interplay of privilege and oppression in the context of understanding their identities and how they express those identities to the world. Uh, and they are not willing to hide parts of themselves. They are not willing to not fully be who they, who they are in this world, right? right? And so they're gonna be coming to us and we're gonna see students that, that, that approach our institutions with a strong sense of self and they're going to be advocating for belonging, advocating for space, advocating for uh, uh, a sense of equity. We're going to be receiving those students and we're sitting on the other side of the desk. And simply because we sit on the other side of the desk, we hold privilege. And so because we're gonna see, and I, I frame this in the context, we're likely to see a rise of students interested in pursuing a career in law in order to defend identity, but we also have students who are interested in defending education uh, and pursuing education and students who are interested in pursuing social work and students who are in the STEM fields. And they're showing up in those spaces because they, are, they want to ensure that people like them, 
people who look like them, who think like them, who feel like them, and who have suffered under the same oppressive systems as them, they want to be sure that those people are represented at the table and that they are able to make an impact in those spaces. So we're going to see them coming to us more charged and more aware and more clear about who they are and how they identify in the world and more and clearer about their ask asking for space, asking for uh, 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 equal treatment and equitable outcomes. They don't just want access to the degree anymore. They don't just want to be have, have a JD. They want to pass the bar. They want to ensure that they have the same opportunity at the same jobs as their white male counterparts have. They want to ensure that when they get those jobs, they have the same opportunities to get on the partner track as their, as their counterparts. They want to ensure that when they make it to partner, that they are not uh, paid discriminatively. Uh, uh, they, they're getting $100,000 less than another partner. They want to make sure that there's equity from the bottom to the top, and not just for them, but for the, all of those people that are coming behind them. So this is what we're about to see, and we're already seeing upticking there. And are we prepared on the other side of the table to understand how to leverage our privilege for their liberation? So how do we respond? I'm so grateful that so many people would log into the LexCon at Home conference and be willing to share in these conversations because what it indicates for me a lot of times is that you 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 have the baseline um, interest in learning more about these topics, learning more about who you are and how who you are might in engage and interact with these topics. And so I appreciate that. That's the basis for what I consider to be the entryway um, to really, really, really shifting and using your privilege to leverage it for liberation. That's allyship. And, and so I appreciate all of you for, for joining us as allies and being introduced to the conversation. But there is so much more beyond allyship. And, and to help you understand where I'm coming from, I kind of describe allyship um, as their friend of the cause, right? But friends of the cause can sometimes easily find a place on the sidelines. Um, and, but they find ways to get in the game like when it really matters, when it's something that's really egregious, when it's something that's really front facing. Right. And so I, I from my and these are my definitions. And I, I, and I say this all the time because allyship is up to me. Um, when I receive someone in, in, into the space of allyship, I determine because I'm an oppressed person, I get to tell an ally that they are my ally because they've met my criteria for allyship. And so this is a bit of my criteria. But we can't stay at allyship. Right. And so the next phase is activism. Allies then get active. They activate. They want to be a part. They want, they're willing to be vocal. They can attach to the fight. And that fight has already been in progress for decades or centuries. Uh, they're well-intentioned, but sometimes can lose sight of the fight and can be blinded by their own privilege. But they're still there. They want to learn. They want to be. And, 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 that's, and that's the part that matters. Yes, we understand that there'll be moments that as we grow, we may still fall uh, uh, prey to privilege, our own privileges, and they might get in our way. But we're growing through. And when the activist continues to grow and develop, they can move from activism to advocacy. And this is where the advocate will lead the fight. They will take up the banner on their own, but sometimes they will still see themselves as slightly separate from the fight. I'm fighting on behalf of, I'm fighting to alleviate the suffering for someone else. They have not yet arrived to that highest place. Remember at the, at the outset, I said that, in, that healing is equal parts individual and communal. They have not quite arrived to the place that the reason why I must advocate and fight to this place is because if they are oppressed, I too am oppressed. And they're, they're, they're on their way there, but they're not quite there. But that's when we arrive at the place that I think is, is the apex. It's abolitionism. And we don't talk about that word anymore because we, we think of it as being only associated uh, with enslaved Africans and, 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 and people who were trying to help the cause of ending slavery. But I would argue that in many ways, oppressed people are still wearing shackles in this country. And so when someone rises to the level of, of, of being an abolitionist for a cause, it, is, it has become deeply personal. They are fully entrenched in the fight. They preserve their privilege only for being able to leverage it for the liberation of oppressed people. And they've gotten to the point, and this is where the abolitionist joins forces and in, in a communal sense understands that your suffering is my suffering because now they are willing to make an equal sacrifice. They're willing to make the same sacrifice that you're willing to make. If you're willing to put your line, your life on the line for this issue, they're willing to die right alongside you, but they're willing to do that to ensure your liberation. So on this journey, as we're climbing uh, and growing, 
But the, the, the idea is to move from allyship to activism, from activism to advocacy, and from advocacy to, abol to, ab to being an abolitionist. And so just take a personal inventory, take a moment to be a bit introspective right now and to think about for yourself where you identify on that spectrum. N neither one is better or worse than the other, but it's really important that we know where we are today right now in the fight so that we can understand what kind of growth we need to take. What types of books do we need to read? What types of people do we need in our circle to help move us to the next space that we currently don't have? How have we been blocking ourselves off from the opportunities, from the people, from the, from the, from the information that can help us grow to the next level? This assessment helps us see exactly where we are and helps us identify the goal of where we want to be in the fight. And then hopefully we'll be able to see more clearly a plan for how we, how we get to the next phase in our ability to leverage our liberation for, uh, leverage our privilege for the liberation of oppressed people. Sure. Gina, if I could just jump in here and say, you know, as you as you indicated, um, no particular role is better, right? We would love to have more abolitionists, but I'm not, you know, I'm not even sure that I'm there yet, right? And so, so <laughs> it could be a journey, all right? But 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 I think what's important is to to thine own self be true. If you are an ally, don't try to show up as an advocate because then no. the, the person or the people that you're trying to advocate on are frustrated because you're not delivering in that advocacy, right? So so you've got to know who you are, what lane you're in, and stay in that lane until you're ready to move. And there may be some of you who never move. You may sit at allyship for the rest of your life, and we'll take it. <laughs> we will take it. The students <laughs> will take it. Um, the goal is, and the hope would be, that there would be more people who would move along this continuum that I think Gina has laid out brilliantly, um, th this continuum to, so that we have more abolitionists in the fight to really kind of tear down these structures that have really been created to keep certain people oppressed. And so, so, so just, just to thine own self be true, know where you are. And if you never get to advocate, don't beat yourself up, right? We'll take you in, yeah. in, in allyship, you know, forever, right? So, so just wanted to kind of put that out there so you don't feel pressure to be something that you're not, but know who you are and communicate that with you, with your friends and colleagues so that there's no, um, there's no room for misinterpretation. Oh, I thought you were an advocate. I thought you were advocating for me. No, 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 no. I'm just an ally. <laughs> so, so, so to my own self be true. Yes, thank you so much for that, Troy. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you take us on a journey because um, you know I love soup, right? So for those of you who don't know, <laughs> I love soup. So it's my favorite meal, and it's my favorite time of year now because I can make soup just about every day, and and it makes a lot more sense than it does when I'm making it in the middle of July. But I still make it anyway. Um, so if anyone wants to send me soup recipes, please, I I, I stand ready to receive them. Uh, but Troy's going to take us on a little exercise to just help us understand uh, our own individual soup and ingredients that make up who we are and how those soups might interplay with other people's soups as we come in contact with them. Right. So thanks, Gina. So yeah, so yeah. So uh, along the, the, the continuum of to thine own self be true, there's a, um, a nice man, um, and I, I don't know how or remember how I stumbled across this quote, but ever since I've stumbled across it, it has resonated and I carry it with me everywhere I go and I and I and I share it as often as I can. Um, and she said, um, the, well, let me let me frame it differently. So I believe that the key to real allyship, advocacy, abolitionist, what work, whatever you wherever you are or whatever you want to be, um, is is hinged on your self awareness. You've got to know who you are, right? And so for me, um, the, the, the quote that is kind of uh, shapes this for me is that we don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. I want you to just kind of let that marinate for a second. So everything we do, whether we're reading a case or we're reading, uh, you know, a, a, a biography, we see and view the world through our lens as we are. And so I think it's really, really important to know who you are, how you show up in the world, how people experience you. Because oftentimes, you know, people go through the world blindly, like all kinds of catastrophes happening, you know, like a bull in a china shop, because no one understands or they haven't taken the time to understand how people experience them. And so I find this exercise, I think, 
to be really helpful in helping uh, people to think introspectively about who they are, how they show up in the world. And so I wanna kind of walk you through it. And I believe the handout is gonna be made available and I encourage you to use it to engage your students, your colleagues in discussions as you get to know one another, as you try to kind of learn from one, one another as you move along the continuum. And so what is this about this used to recipe? Um, so, so, so basically, uh, the, the, what we're suggesting is that there, all of us are made of ingredients. Next slide. Um, all of us are made up of ingredients. So just like a soup. So in our base, in our broth, we have these things that I would call immutable characteristics. So those things like race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, disability status. Some would argue we're born, right, with these things. Now, I want to respect um, a, a very dear colleague and friend of mine who has seen me do this presentation uh, and has, has, has had discussions with me uh, about her religion and her feeling that her religion and faith are part of her base and broth and not where they are on this chart as optional. Right. And so I want you to just kind of see this as a guide to a way of thinking about who you are and not necessarily as being constrictive and in a particular what, what proverbial box. Right. So in the basin broth, we've got race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, disability, status. This is we just kind of show up. And then depending on where we are in the world, right, our geographic location, economic status of our family that we just happen to be born into, um, our educational level, our, um, our family structure, right? Um, those early additions then begin to kind of shape. So we're putting all of this in the pot, right? And then we move along and we have these optional ingredients. Those are the hobbies and the passions and my love for music, right? Um, religion and faith, if, 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 if at all. Like there are some people who just don't want anything to do with religion and faith. And so that's not an ingredient in their soup. In their, and that's okay. Soup still tastes just fine. Um, your career, what have you chosen as a career? What are your political beliefs? Those are the optional ingredients that you get to sprinkle um, in, into your, your soup recipe. And then, uh, I think more importantly, and the things that I don't think we, sh we, we, we think about a lot are the secret ingredients. And those are things like your personal experiences, the things that shaped you um, as a child, right? Changes to other ingredients. I like to use this one because when I was, um, as far back as I, I grew up, I was raised by a mother and a father. I, and then at some point, um, they decided that it wasn't working. <laughs> and mm -hmm. they said, they said bye, right? And so now the, my ingredients have changed, right? So I, I was used to this one thing and now my ingredients have slightly changed. And I didn't realize the impact that that had on me until years later, right? We, but, but it was always in my soup. And I don't know who I encountered with that bad ingredient or that changed ingredient, mm -hmm. I should say, in my soup that might have rubbed that person the wrong way. And then we have those hidden identities. Right, those things we don't want anybody to know about, right? And or the misperception of ingredients. I don't know how many of you have ever been assumed to be something or um, uh, in a particular group when, when it just wasn't true or of a certain belief or um, it, it just wasn't true. So so people can misperceive your ingredients. They think they're tasting, mm, is this uh, cilantro or is this? Parsley, right? So, so there's a misperception of your ingredients, but all of those things, if you take all of this and you combine your base ingredients uh, to, to create a broth and you bring it to a boil and you sprinkle in these early additions and all of your optional ingredients and, and those secret ingredients, and you let that simmer for 18 to 25 years, kind of our formative years. You let that simmer. That's a long time for something to simmer. And it simmers for someone that it becomes a part of who you are. It's just there. That is what makes you you. That's what makes somebody else somebody else. And what we will learn through kind of exchange and engaging is that we all are just different variations of very common ingredients, right? We're not... We're special, we're unique, but we're not that special. So all of us are, 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 are made of these similar ingredients just in different doses and portions, right? And so that's what makes you, you. And so what I'd like you to do is to think about your ingredients and ingredients to your soup and how you show up in the world, how you show up as you sit across the desk, 
uh, your your students, right? And 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 keeping in mind that they have a different soup recipe, right? The the goal is for us to figure out how to to share enough that we can we can form these bonds of allyship and go along the continuum con con continuum to to abolitionists if that's the journey that you're on. But to be very thoughtful and introspective about who you are as a person and 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 what you bring to this world and how people experience you. Thank you, Troy. Yeah. yeah, if we were in person, I would we would go into a breakout session, or you know, we have you you know, pair it with with someone and share your recipe. But I think you know, for for time yeah. constraints, didn't want to try to do that and technology and all that stuff. But but I really do want you to be thoughtful about what's in your soup. And 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 what I would all, all always end with when I talk to my students about this was to, to get them to think about something uh, to think about this. So, and I would say this, so the next time in a class discussion, your classmate says something that's really off color, you find it really, really offensive, right? Instead of rushing to put them in a box and say, oh, that, that person is racist, that person is sexist, to maybe think about what ingredient or ingredients are in their soup that make them think that way, feel or believe that way. To think about it like that, and I think it will, will help us to create kind of more of a space of empathy uh, and understanding, which is so necessary for, for this work and this movement. So to, to, to not rush to judgment, but to think about, I wonder what that's about. Right? What's missing? I'll give you an example. So, so I was very intentional, and Gio and I talked through this earlier today. I was very intentional. <laughs> And uh, he asked me for three bit emojis or whatever that would that I would use for the intersectionality piece of the, the presentation, and I gave him three. I, I know he took he chose five, but that's another conversation. But I gave him three. Yeah. And the one thing that I omitted intentionally was anything related to being gay. Um, and and I and I did that purposely because I know people think, well, wait, I think there's a missing ingredient in his soup, right? Somebody has already decided that. Maybe you know me, maybe you just suspect, right? But but what but but Gina was much more comfortable sharing that outright. And and I attribute part of it to a generational difference in the time that I grew up, that wasn't a part of my identity that I could embrace. And so I didn't. And that is what took me on the journey of kind of self-discovery, where I battled depression. Like, I just was not able to embrace that part of my identity. And so still today, I am, for me to actually have this conversation with, I don't know how many people are in this room, and I don't want to know because I'll stop talking. But, but for me to say <laughs> that this moment is really about kind of my growth and evolution. But it's still not the part of my identity that I show up. I feel like I show up the most wanting people to embrace or understand. And so, so that's just kind of an example of, 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 of kind of how people can be on these journeys um, yeah. and, and have to kind of play and navigate with their identities because the spaces aren't safe. And that's kind of my experience. I grew up in, at a time where my friends were dying like every day. It just wasn't a safe space. And so that part of my identity, I never fully embraced. It has been a long and arduous journey to get to this moment. Yeah. I'm done, Gina. Troy, thank you, because that is it requires so much courage um, to have conversations like this, but then to even go that beyond the surface and go very deeply into your personal space to make this point. And I, I, I appreciate you for that, and I honor you for that. So thank you. Um, and, and, to, and, and to continue along that line with the youth soup, I love this, this exercise, and I encourage you all, especially if you're working in the space where you get a chance to do uh, direct student-facing programming, uh, diversity and inclusion stuff, any of that kind of stuff, I encourage you to do this type of exercise, even as an icebreaker outside of the diversity and inclusion context, because what it does is it allows each individual to see themselves more clearly and to, to start out the journey with this new community that they're gonna be a part of, understanding what parts of themselves uh, uh, might be a little bitter to the taste, you know, um, that, that of the people who are gonna be encountering them. What parts, parts of themselves add a little sweetness? Um, what parts of themselves are more muted flavors, you know, that people don't even know are there, you know, and this helps them see themselves clearly, but it also, as Troy was saying, helps you to think about 
what other ingredients might I be encountering? And in the context of our advising work, what I want us to think about is when we encounter these students, we would talk about those optional ingredients, those, uh, uh, those later additions, the secret ingredients, all those kind of things. Keep in mind, as we're encountering and touching the lives of these students, a little bit of our soup is going to spill over into their soup. And I want you to be mindful, what are you adding to their soup? What are they taking away from their experiences with you, from their inter encounters with you? Did they take away something that amplified their flavors, something that, 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 that in, in encouraged and inspired and, and made their, their, their space brighter? Or did you add something that was bitter? Did you add something that took away from their flavor? Did you add something that diminished some of the parts uh, uh, and some of the ingredients of who they really are? So in our advising work, really think about that. We imprint on the students that we work with. What impression are you leaving? And are you leaving one that is rooted in the use of your privilege to help leverage it for the liberation of the students you are encountering? Or, or is your impression one that further disenfranchises and, oppress and oppresses our students? So. I appreciate you all, uh, and thank you for letting us do this. I, 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 I thought about this as, as Troy and I were preparing this, and I said to myself, I will never accept <laughs> uh, uh, an offer to do a panel or a workshop when I just started a brand new gig, and I have not fully adjusted in that space. And I, I, at one point, I felt like I had taken on too much. Um, but as I get to the end of this presentation, I realized that I needed this medicine just as much as I needed to come and, get, and offer this medicine. So thank you all. Thank you, Access Lex. Um, I'm really grateful. I'm really appreciative. And thank you, Troy Riddle, for your brilliance and for uh, uh, allowing me to stand in the presence of your light as we do this work together. So uh, thank you all. I think we're ready for questions if there are any. Uh, Troy, you have anything else to add? I don't have anything to say. I'm fighting back tears. So thank you all. I really do appreciate the, the, the opportunity to share in this space with you. Maybe back to you, Jennifer, for any questions? Or can I see them myself? That might have been so heavy. People just need time to I know, see the moment. <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> Um, there are, there are. Thank you so much. This is wonderful, and uh, I don't know if you can see the questions coming in, but there wow. are so many thank yous out here, and just wow. thank you really all. appreciating um, your willingness to be vulnerable and share in this conversation today. And and we do have some questions out there for you. And since we have a little time yet, I would love to throw a couple of them at you. And I'm going to start with this one, um, and you know, either of you feel free to respond. How do you best leverage your privilege to raise others? Ooh, um, I think it's a process and I think it's nuanced, right? And it can be as simple as, I, d I mean, if you're in the admission space, right? Identifying a candidate whose voice is not being amplified in the process. And you know that you're on the committee and your opinion is well respected. And if you lend your privilege to helping amplify this student, um, that's a simple way to do that. Now, there are a lot more um, high level institutional ways that you can do that as well. I mean, there are a lot of uh, movements that are happening. There are a lot of uh, uh, businesses that are being started, initiatives that are being started by uh, black people, people of color, women, uh, other people from other disenfranchised groups. There are ways to redirect your dollars. You know, how do you budget? Uh, who are you banking with? You know, all, all types of things. Who do you buy your car from? Who do you work with to get the mortgage on your home? Who do you, I mean, these are all things that you can think about in ways to leverage your economic resources to help uh, small businesses, to help people who are developing ideas, to help people who are trying to seed uh, community-based organizations and communities that really need them. Uh, where are you donating your, your dollars to every year? There are so many simple ways and so many very high level ways. The work that you're doing at the institutional level, if you are a dean of admissions, if you're a dean of diversity and inclusion, if you're a faculty member, there's a lot of opportunity to leverage your privilege every day in those spaces. Um, and it's so nuanced and so diverse. So, and if Troy has anything else to add. Nothing to add there. Thank you. Hi, Troy and Dina. We, um, I'm not sure if you've seen, but there's so many wonderful comments about uh, the soup handout and the conversation that you had about kind of creating oh, wow. your own. And so one question came in and asked, you know, how does this all work as the soup changes over over your lifetime? 
Well, if you're lucky, it, it, it will, right? So that's the beauty of, I think, being human. And that's one of the things that I, I, I wrestle with, particularly now with uh, this generation of young people coming in there with, with this cancel culture. I, I, I'm so anti-cancel culture because of this very reason. Like, I think it, it, it ignores a person's humanity and their ability ability to change, evolve, and grow. You know, in, in essence, their, their, their ability to, to be human, which is, was, which is what they are. And so I think with respect to that question, as your ingredients change, once again, the, the key is for, for you to know and acknowledge that, to understand it, and understand how that affects the flavor of your soup, so to speak, right? So, so if that change, you, if, if there's an ingredient that changes, and it, it alters, it fundamentally alters, you know, who you are, how you think, what spaces you move in. Um, use that, right? Use that understanding to kind of, um, to help people or, or, or to be more intentional about how people experience you, experience you. I think that's what I want to say. The good thing is you should, the, the ingredients can change and they should change if, 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 if you're growing and evolving as human beings. I think the key is to understand what those changes are and what they mean for you and how you show up in the world. Yeah. And I, I would only add that, you know, the, 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 the beauty of my journey, and I think that's, that's a question that we really do only answer individually as we kind of go on our own healing journeys and self uh, discovery journal journeys. And for me, as I've grown and things have been added to my broth and my, and my soup, they've taken me back to my base and my broth consistently. And it takes me, I grew up cooking in the kitchen with my mom and having some of the most wonderful conversations and with my grandmother and my great grandmother. And one of the things that they always taught me was, son, if you got the basics, if you got good fundamentals, you can't really mess up a meal, you know? And so they taught me the, the same things. If I got a good base, if I got a good broth, it doesn't matter what I'm encountering as I go along. The soup, the, the flavor might change, you know, in my 30s, it might change a little bit in my 40s, but if I'm always tending to the base and the broth and ensuring that it is solid, it doesn't matter what I add to it. It's still going to be good. And so I find that the work for me is in, it's so deeply introspective. Every day this work is about me. And it's like if I keep that lens on me, that it's always about what soup am I carrying into the world? Because the thing about soup that I learned was the moment I said I wasn't feeling well, soup came in as medicine. And so there was lemon and there was chicken stock and there were, you know, onions and there were all garlic and all these other medicinal things that had properties. So I see my soup as, as medicine. When I go into the world, I've got to be sure that I'm taking something that's not only good for me and good to me, but that it's healing others so that I have to, I'm bringing light and love. So as I grow and I evolve and other things are added to my soup, it always takes me back to the base and the broth. Make sure it's solid. Thank you so much. And this might be a little bit harder of a, of a question, but there is someone asking about what do you do to advance this work in spaces that aren't safe? Abandon ship. No, I'm just, let me, let me stop. no, I mean, it's, it's, it's a difficult one, right? And, 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 and I think it goes back to the ally activist advocate um, abolitionist uh, model. Understand that if you're in a space that's not necessarily safe, then you're in a space where you may be the pioneer. You may be the first ally to arrive in that space. You may be, so the work that you have to do there may be, may be slightly different. You may not be trying to walk into a space like that and tomorrow start a diversity and inclusion center, you know, and, and have uh, uh, diversity enrollment go from 7% to 25% overnight. That might not be your work. Your work may be diversity from 7% to 8%. You know, your, your work may be getting getting one more faculty member, you know, even in the pool strongly considered. Maybe that's the that's the uh, 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 the progress that you're there to make. Understanding from from the way that Troy Troy uh, framed it, understanding where you are on the spectrum, but also understanding where the spaces you work in are on the spectrum will help you understand what the nature of your work should be in that space. It's 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 good to push. We've got to push because it's constantly getting there. But it's really like a shepherding. Right. It's, it's finding that skill. I was talking to a good friend about this yesterday. It's finding that skill 
to be confident, be still, and know where your goal is at, and to move ever so slightly sometimes people in the direction that you need them to go. So being aware of where you are on the spectrum and what the capacity is for you to fight in that space, and also being aware of where the space is and where you're starting from, so you can set realistic goals about what the outcomes are gonna be about moving the needle in that space. One comes to sow, the other comes to water and to tend, and the other comes to reap. That's kind of the, the process. You may just be there to be the person who plants seeds. You may not see the harvest. You may be, plant, as they say, you may be planting trees uh, whose shade you will never sit in. And so just understanding where you are on the spectrum and where your institution is on the spectrum so you can understand where to expend your energy is going to be the best course of action. Sure. The only thing I would add, I would just encourage that person to transform that space into a brave space that allows them to do that. And they can do that by really leveraging their privilege and influence on the colleagues that need to be brought along. Like this, this, so, so this work is just not about, you know, the, the, the disenfranchised or the marginalized. One of the, uh, I'll share real quickly a, a book that I, I stumbled across called Waking Up and Finding Myself in the Story of Race. And it was written by a white woman uh, in Boston, raised in New England, very privileged, uh, who thought she was enrolling in this class to learn how to, 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 to support the poor Black students that she had in her class. That was really why she enrolled in this course. But when she got to this course, and, and this is the kind of the basis of the book, her, 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 her revelation, when she got to the class, it wasn't about how to save, you know, the poor Black children uh, in her class. It was about her. And looking, once again, introspectively about who she is what privileges she had and how she could leverage that to support the students that found themselves in her classroom. And so I think just understanding where you are, what that environment is, but being committed to, 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 to creating the space that you need to further the work. Yeah. Well, thank you both, Troy and Gino. Thank you so much for this wonderful uh, conversation. Uh, if you haven't seen all of the wonderful comments in the, the Q&A panel, we'll definitely uh, get, have, find a way to get those over to you. Um, so now we find ourselves um, with the next break. And so again, thank you so much, Joy um, and Gino. Thank you both. We're gonna mix up all. a bit this time. And the next session is gonna start at the top of the hour, but if you are interested in a short yoga session, again, you don't need any sort of supplies or materials, but if you would like to uh, be interested in a short yoga session um, for a chance to win a home yoga kit, I'm going to post the Zoom link on the next slide and you can join Lissa in that, uh, in that Zoom room. And so if for some reason that link is not working for you on the slide, you also can find it. Um, we're gonna post it in the Q&A panel as well. Thank you all and see you in a few minutes. I don't think that that is for public consumption, so I'm saying. Oh, I'm sure that, I mean. Right, right.
All right, welcome back everyone. Thanks to those of you who joined us for some relaxing yoga. We hope you're feeling uh, refreshed and centered. And uh, the lucky random winner of the home yoga kit is Calandra Clark. Calandra, congratulations. We'll be reaching out to you um, to, to be able to send that home yoga kit out to you. And I am now going to turn it over to our next panel and our next moderator, Kamisha, welcome. Thank you so much, Jen. Hello, everyone. My name is Kamisha Little, and I'm the National Director West of the Bar Review Engagement Team. Macro ways to foster academic success from your student's first day to their last day. And they will be inviting you to participate in the conversation and share your tips as well. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Um, please welcome Priya Garg. Priya, can you please unmute yourself and say hello? Hello, everyone. Thank you. Now, Chris, can you please er, unmute your mic and say hello and introduce yourself? All right. Chris, can you try that again? I'm not sure that we can hear you yet. Okay, I've unmuted. So do you have any um, sound? I can hear you now. You can? Yes. Okay. So if you didn't hear me before, I'm Chris Church. Um, I'm a law professor at Cooley Law School. Thank you, Chris. Can you please now unmute yourself and introduce yourself? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. My name is Kimberly Dane. I am the Assistant Dean of Student Services at the University of Michigan Law School, and I'm very excited to be with you today. Thank you. We're so excited for this session, and before I turn it over to our panelists, I want to take a minute um, to share more a few notes with you in the audience. Um, in this session, our panelists will provide a quick overview of a specific topic area related to academic success. Then they will invite you to join them in a breakout room of your choice to dive deeper into the conversation and share our collective brilliance. When we come back together, we'll join back here in this main room to discuss the highlights um, from your discussions. And now I'd like to turn it over to Priya. Thank you so much, Kamisha. Um, I think I to introduce myself at the beginning. I'm Priya Gard. Um, I am a pediatrician at Boston Medical Center, and I am the Associate Dean of Medical Education. And like many of you, spend my entire uh, time really working um, with students and helping them to think about academics um, and how they reach the goals that they set for themselves. Today, um, I'll start off by saying that all of us are hoping to engage in a conversation where we share with you um, through a few slides our thoughts on the topics um, specifically about academic success and then uh, hope to hear from all of you and really learn from each other. So let's start with what is failure. Um, many students, as you know, define failure as lack of success, it's something that all of us probably hear in our roles. Um, and for many of our students, they've reached us through numerous successes. They've received awards, accolades, A's, 100%, and everything they've done until this point has been successful. And this success has led them to being accepted into our schools. However, many students receive their first failing grade when they come to professional school. In medical school, this is quite common. Um, and when they see that fail, they really think that something's wrong with the exam the institution, how could they have received a fail? Um, how do we, and really, you know, our roles and our responsibility, I think, is to think about 
how do we begin to change the culture of failure at our institutions? How do we work with them so that they know that it's not equal lack of success, success but it's really part of success and part of your developmental journey as a professional? So why is failure important? Um, many of you may be familiar with this book, Make It Stick. Um, and if you aren't, I highly recommend uh, reading it. It's one of my favorites. Um, and the authors of the book state that when students struggle with a problem, attempt solutions, fail, and try again, learning's really improved. That's really the way that you can promote long-term consolidation and retention and fixing of ideas into memory. Um, in medicine and law, we're really trying to help our students um, solidify concepts that they apply for the rest of their life. But often the first time you're introduced to that concept, it's challenging and difficult. And desirable difficulties slow down learning. They don't feel as effective as other strategies, but all of us know they're really what remains with you um, as you go through learning. So I think one way to really think about how to address failure in your curricula is to use the approach and the theory of self-directed learning. You know, some of you in the audience are probably familiar with it um, and know that it's really an essential component of adult learning. Uh, one of the uh, authors of the theory, Noel, said that in the broadest meaning, SDL describes a process in which individuals take the initiative with or without the help of others in diagnosing their learning needs, formulating learning goals, identifying resources for learning, and choosing and implementing appropriate learning strategies and thinking about their own learning outcomes. Failure is really the opportunity for students to receive feedback on their strengths as well as their areas of improvement, all for the purpose of getting better. It helps them diagnose their learning needs, focus on their own outcomes, and then think about where they wanna go at the end rather than the achievements they have at that one point in time. Uh, one of the authors that all of you are probably familiar with is Carol Dweck, who wrote Mindset, The New Psych Psychology of Success. Uh, as a parent with elementary and middle school children, this is what they hear a lot about today is growth mindset. But what always um, surprises me is when I come to my graduate students and my medical students, it's almost like this mindset has disappeared um, and failure becomes this really painful experience for them. And they really think it starts to define you um, and they have a hard time facing the problem. And Carol Dweck really says that to have the growth mindset, you need to stretch yourself and stick to it. And when things aren't going well, you have to know that's the hallmark of growth. Um, and that really that mindset is what allows people to thrive in some of the most challenging times in their life, lives. And when you are in graduate school, that is a really challenging time in your life. Um, she talks about high school students in Chicago, for those of you who might have read the book. I think it's one of my favorite parts because she says that in those graduate students in Chicago, one of the things that they're, um, I'm sorry, the high school students in Chicago, one of the things that they did at their school was that when someone didn't pass a course, they didn't write fail, they wrote not yet. And really, she and I both think it was fantastic and something we should all think about is when we talk with our students, how do we really begin to have that conversation and say, you know, you may not have passed this time, but that's just a not yet. Um, and there's really a future learning curve that can develop from this. She went on to describe um, the, a study that they did with the high school students where they looked at their brains. And as a uh, physician, this is really interesting to me, um, that students who had a fixed mindset um, said that, uh, and I'm sorry, oh, I'm gonna go back, I think I missed. Uh, I'm sorry, so what she said was that students who had a fixed mindset um, really often thought that cheating the next time um, instead of studying would be the way to address um, a failed test and that um, failure really looked worse to them um, and really reflected how they felt about themselves and resulted in this impact on their well-being. And she said study after study, they found a similar thing. And when they looked at the electrical activity of the brain for students who were confronted with an error um, who had fixed mindset, there was really limited activity in their brain. But for those students who had a growth mindset, they found that they were able to really um, think about ideas of how they could do better, engage deeply, and their brain was on fire. They had all of these synapses and they were able to process the error and learn from it and correct it. 
Um, the last thing I want to talk about and what I'd like to end with is really talking about the elephant in the room, which is imposter syndrome. And that's really the illusion of success um, that students and I think all of us feel at different points in our career. And imposter syndrome, um, which comes from the American Psychological Association, can also be called imposter phenomenon. And it's a psychologic pattern where individuals doubt their skills, their talents and their accomplishments, and they internalize the fear of being exposed as a fraud. Um, in our society, as all of you know, there's a huge pressure to achieve and there can be a lot of confusion between approval, love, worthiness, um, and self-worth really becomes contingent on achieving. And I think this is really the heart of one of the things we need to think about as we mentor students and start to have this conversation about how you develop as a professional. Um, we need to help them realize that all of us have imposter phenomenon at some time or another, um, and it's common. And it's re especially common when you embark on a new endeavor. And in professional school, every phase has a new endeavor. Um, and so graduate students are really susceptible and they need to think about how they can really remove outward signs of success and worthiness to true success, which is development, failure, learning, and setting goals. Um, there, there are ways to, to overcome imposter syndrome, and I'm gonna leave us all with these few thoughts in terms of all of us as, uh, as people who are guiding students to say that the way that you can overcome imposter syndrome or help students uh, through this is to encourage them to talk to mentors, help them identify mentors early, help them recognize their expertise, whatever that expertise is, um, to help them see really are um, experts for others. And then remember when they do well and realize that no one is perfect. Um, this last image is, is the iceberg illusion, which I think is really important for us to think about. And that is that everything on the outside seems perfect and shiny, but really the development, how you got there and how we all get there is through all of these steps of dedication, hard work, disappointment, sacrifice, failure, but the persistence is really what leads to that success over long term. So I really hope to engage with all of you in the afterwards in our um, small breakout rooms to learn more from you about how you've thought about these ideas. I appreciate your time. I'm going to pass this over now to Chris Church, who is going to share with us her thoughts and her wonderful course on anxiety in the practice of law. Okay, <clears throat> so um, Priya, the way that we sort of looked at all of this is Priya was going to be talking about sort of one-on-one -on -one working with students. And I'm gonna talk about a class uh, that we've actually created to deal with some of these um, academic issues. And then um, Kimberly will be talking programmatically. So we kind of have this flow going for you guys. Um, let me, here we go. So uh, I, I should probably give you a little bit of background. Before coming to academia, I practiced law for 20 years and I mentored <clears throat> a lot of brand new lawyers. Lawyers who were right out of law school and lawyers who were one or two years into practice. And we commonly refer to the practice of law as life in the pressure cooker. When I started uh, in the academic world at Cooley, and I became the uh, associate dean of uh, academics at the school, I began to see a lot of issues surrounding anxiety. Uh, all my kids are in their 30s. I saw they were dealing with anxiety. Their friends were dealing with anxiety. And I'm looking at my students, and I'm seeing so many symptoms of deep anxiety about law school, about being called on in class, you know, all of these kinds of things. And then add on top of that, the high stakes test um, of the bar exam. And, uh, you know, and I started really talking to my colleagues about anxiety and what's gonna happen when this generation starts practicing law and enters life in the pressure cooker. So um, 
one of the responses really got me thinking because the response was very much like Kwame was talking about earlier today. When you're dealing with um, fear <clears throat> and anxiety is a form of fear, you get into that fight, flight, or freeze syndrome. And the response that I got was, what happens when you have anxiety, your reactions are all of the things that get lawyers in trouble. And it doesn't matter if you are in um, law school or you are in another graduate school, this applies to any type of profession, that when you get into the profession, the things that are typical responses to anxiety are things that are gonna get you in trouble. You don't show up where you're supposed to. You put your head in the sand and you don't respond where you're supposed to. You don't deal with the problems as you're supposed to. And so I started thinking about this in the context of creating a one credit class on anxiety and the practice of law. And the more I researched it, the more I realized that this was a very, very important subject. Um, just some of the statistics, the, the ABA did a uh, study on anxiety. Uh, they looked at 4,000 students at 84 different law school. And the conclusion of the study, 76% of the 4,000 students were showing symptoms of a generalized anxiety disorder. Um, there's a Massachusetts blog that talks about 96% uh, of law students experience significant stress and compare this to 70% of medical students, 43% of other graduates, and, uh, graduate students. And we know from Larry Krieger's work, we do a lot to our law students that really sort of create some of this anxiety. So the, um, the fight, flight or freeze response not only gets us in trouble in practice, it gets us in trouble in law school. And so that was the, um, the, the germination of this idea of a class and the focus on the class is really the ethics of protecting the client if we can help students learn how to deal with this anxiety, it gets in the way of learning, it gets in the way of being effective in your testing, and it then will get in the way when you are practicing law. So if we can learn how to deal with it in graduate school, then we're learning strategies and techniques that are gonna make our students more effective when they go out into practice. So those were the goals that I created for this class. This my first and foremost goal is to protect clients from harm by addressing some of these, recognizing some of them, because some of our students don't even know it's happening until we start talking about it, and then um, um, being able to see it. I also wanted to use this class to get them to think about happiness and job satisfaction, because that's what builds optimism and resilience. And then also to connect some of these anxiety issues with obstacles to learning. So I wanted to just show you, this is my course description. This course has three main objectives. These are the three main objectives that you've got. Um, we're gonna, <clears throat> in my breakout room, uh, talk a little more deeply about the course itself and um, talk about anxiety as a fear response and how you perceive that and how you're dealing with it. And one of the main things that I uh, really, I think is the favorite lesson of this class is test anxiety and strategies that really help students deal with test anxiety that are based in science, right? I wanted to show you a little bit about the structure of the course. It goes for seven weeks. We do two hours, because it's a one credit course for seven weeks. 
So the first seven weeks are all very um, defined for what we're doing. The last week, or the last half of the term, they have to implement at least one new tool or technique. They have to do a reflection after every class, applying what they've learned to their personal lives. Then they have to do a reflection at the end of the semester where they have implemented at least one of these tools and techniques and how did it go, right? So learn about it, do it, reflect. All of the things that we looked at with um, uh, self-regulated uh, learning. So that's, that's just a little uh, brief introduction to this particular class. I'm going to turn it over now to Kim Dane. Kim, you wanna come on? I do, hello. So trying to advance to the next slide. So my portion of this is the roadmap for working together because helping students to navigate the impact that all of these factors have on their academic performance and on their professional lives and on the, their ability to actually thrive um, both in school and then in the profession is, is an all hands on deck effort. And so I've, the, the experience that I'm speaking from is from my experience at Georgia State. So I am brand new to the University of Michigan. But at the uh, at Georgia State College of Law, we were able to do a really, um, really laudable job at, at trying to get all of our stakeholders together to work towards this outcome. So it's uh, one of the first things we had to start with was kind of figuring out where we were. We had to do an assessment. We needed to find out what were things that were impediments to student success, what were things that were creating heightened levels of anxiety in our students, uh, what resources we had, uh, whether it is financial or curriculum development or staff, faculty, uh, university-wide resources that could help us give them the tools that they need to succeed. And as an ASP person coming in, um, you're sort of a, a just you're you're a low person on the totem pole. Even if you have faculty status, you know you're there. There are hierarchies in higher ed, and so it really takes um, being strategic and being. And I was very fortunate there because um, we had an amazing faculty and had a lot of support from up top. Uh, not everyone has that experience, but even where you um, find that ASP is a little bit more marginalized, and by ASP, I, uh, academic success or academic support programming, you, which I say academic support programming, academic is actually a misnomer because you are really whole student support. It is not really limited to academics. The things that impact students' academic performance are often these either thoughtful intangibles of mindset and attitude, or sometimes it's the tangible living conditions of students who are coming from diverse backgrounds and have uh, different access to resources and different experiences that they're bringing to the table that can create barriers or, um, or create greater access. So as the ASP person, you really have to assess sort of what all the things that are in play. And then the next step is to identify your allies, figure who else in the building can help you. And I say who else in the building, because when I think of allies, I think of this being a whole school process. To be honest, the person who knew the most about our students and student lives um, were often people who were off the radar. They were our librarians. They were our, actually our janitorial staff it was fantastic and spent a ton of time after hours in the building. And once in a while, we would get one of our custodians who would, who would knock on my door and say, hey, there was a student crying in the bathroom last night. Here's her name. And those kinds of collaborative where everyone in the building feels a sense of ownership for student well-being is really incredibly powerful. So everyone, um, our, our, everyone from our dean to our custodial staff was, and everyone in between, um, it was a matter of getting them all on board with being student-centered, figuring out what our shared mission and goals were. How were we going to, what did we want them to have as an experience? What was really important for them professionally and personally for them to be able to navigate both law school and entry into the profession and then a successful professional life? 
this required a lot of collaboration. And so if it's siloed, it can be done. You can definitely make an impact if you are uh, an island unto yourself. You will still be impactful. But when you're able to collaborate across um, the, the school and across the university, it is incredibly impactful. So being able to collaborate with um, legal writing, with our doctrinal faculty in a law school context, um, with our housing folks, like all of these, with our, our counseling and professional, uh, counseling and psychological services those collaborations of kind of coming together and, and having those different resources uh, really not only pitch in, but participate in the formulation of policy and, and formulation of programs, uh, it, it's really incredibly impactful. And whatever programming you land on, it's gonna be really important that you have measurable outcomes. You're gonna need to be able to mark your success along the way, see whether or not things are working. And you have to be honest, because the, the thing is you've gotta be brave. You've gotta try things that haven't been tried before. Uh, you've gotta try things that maybe have been tried before and or maybe weren't incredibly successful and, and figure out why they failed. And if there's a way to do them differently, that will allow you to succeed. And, um, and it's important for you not only to measure that, but then to share those measurements and to, to have everybody on board as you're, as you're uh, figuring out what worked, what didn't, uh, what was our measure of success and, and how do we go, go forward and have that ability to not only share your successes, you're going to have to share some of your failures and then modify and be open to that piece. So when we're talking about assessment, looking at what are you, you know, where are you and what are your challenges? It's really important for you to take time and understand who your students are and who and, and who your institution is. How, what institution are you at and how does it work? Uh, who are the players? What are their goals and objectives? Who do you serve and, and what it matters if you have a school that is a, a mission-based school. For us, we were at Urban Law School, and it was really important uh, for us to be able to serve the Georgia community, be able to, we were creating lawyers that were likely going to stay in Georgia. Uh, they were going to have a really diverse impact. They were gonna have different places that they, we, we didn't have all corporate lawyers coming out. We didn't have all big firm. We had lots of people doing public interest. So it was really important for us to build programs that, that imparted skills across those different dynamics. We needed to identify our stakeholders and, in, and figure out who it was that was impacting the student experience. And again, that goes for, you know, they have so much time and so much contact with our library staff and our research, our research staff, especially in the first year. Our legal writing and research folks and our legal writing and research, our, our research librarians were just critical in formulating this plan. And then we needed to figure out if our student experience as it was as it was taking place really aligned with the goals and objectives that we had for uh, us. What did a student who was going out into the world need? What did a student who was going out into their particular uh, area of law, into their peripheral region? What were the skills that that student was going to need? And were we, give, were we imparting them? So that was really fantastic. Uh, the next thing we had to do was engage our allies, and we had, to, and, and this process was going door to door. This is a, this is really a socializing this idea where I was knocking on a lot of doors, and then eventually it wasn't just me knocking; it was me and the former ASP person, and the uh, and the associate dean, and then it was me and the associate dean and a few students, and then it was me and a, a few research librarians, and and then more and more doors were being knocked on and so what we were asking were you know we were counting on both our intuition what do we think would be the likely outcome of a particular program or what it what in our experience what what has happened in the past um, what could we predict might be the outcome and and things that valued were valued and then we were looking at scholarly research you know what is the data showing us what are best practices which of those apply to an institution that is like ours which ones might need to be modified for our particular institution so if there was a research that was done on student on um institutions that were lower performing or student or evr a different bandwidth as far as you know t14 schools how would we modify that research and be able to to apply it and working together to do that was in was really fantastic 
So um, our, the, the first natural place was to align ASP, our academic success programming, with our legal writing program because all first year students had to do that. Then we did, you know, if we're giving out kind of a broad view of this, we began at the pre-admissions program, like from the time that they walked in the door, admissions helped us identify students who would be, who, who would benefit from participating in programs. And we participated in, pre, we built a pre-orientation program. Then we designed an orientation that really had an eye towards uh, doctrinal classes and the legal writing classes. And we worked with those faculties to help design what, what are the, the base skills that need to be introduced? And all of this was designed with an eye towards bar readiness and being able to enter the profession. So our program was designed across the full tenure. It was, we had a summer program, we had orientation, we had collaborative uh, course that was offered. We had, we developed a, an intervention course for students who might be at risk or who were underperforming. And then we developed programming towards licensure and readiness for the bar exam. So I would love to talk about kind of how this is done in so, places that you all are doing well. And, and I look forward to helping me see you in the breakout rooms. Thank you so much, panelists. What exciting information that you've already shared with us. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing now what our audience has to add to this awesome conversation. So at this time, we'll be moving to breakout rooms. We want an opportunity for you all to learn from one another. So soon you'll see links pop up in the Q&A box in the Q&A panel that will take you to the Zoom room of your choice to join the dot discussion. Um, and here we're looking to learn from one another. So the three rooms that will be broken out, Priya will be in room one discussing learning from fear. Chris will be in room two discussing anxiety and practice. And in room three, uh, Kim will discuss a roadmap for working together. So just momentarily, a link will pop up on the slide. You can select that link to go to your room, or you can again, look in the Q&A panel to join the room of your choice. So if you'd like to join Priya in room one to discuss focusing on learning from fear, ways that we can change the stigma of failure and address self-directed learning, you can click. If you'd like to join Chris in room two to discuss anxiety and practice, specifically thinking about how to help students understand anxiety and some best tips to overcoming anxiety on high stakes test, please click the link on this slide. And then if you'd like to join Kim in room three to discuss a roadmap for working together, figuring out how we can center our efforts on students and identify stakeholders, resources, and collaborate uh, over time, please click on the link in this slide. And if you missed the slide, again, you can go to your Q&A box, uh, Q&A panel, and select the link for the room that you'd like to join. And then shortly, we'll join back here to discuss briefly and wrap up our conversation.
All right, this is the voice of Kanisha. We're still waiting for some of our panelists and participants to return. So we'll give them a few moments to do so, to return back from their Zoom room. Um, in the meantime, if you have great questions, feel free to add your comments and thoughts in the chat box. Um, we'll see how long we get to discuss in just a moment when everyone returns to our room. Kamisha, can I ask if there are, we did not get a chance to do a, a robust conversation. We didn't have a chance to do our, our interactive piece in our room. I would really love to ask the um, attendees to, to drop information in it, whether or not they have had particular experiences with um, places that they experienced successes and challenges in formulating support programs for students. So if if our panel, our non-panelists, but if our attendees would be willing to just drop a, a success and a failure in, I would really appreciate that. That would be so helpful. You know, it took us a little bit from our room, so I'm also happy to share some of the things we learned in our room. That would be helpful. Wonderful. Now that we're all back, yes, Priya, will you get us started with a quick discussion of what you all discussed? Yeah. So um, just as a point, we are learning from failure, not from fear, although our students were definitely fe fearing things. And um, I think what we really talked about in our room um, was, you know, that we're trying to normalize something that's um, a part of a student's development. And I really heard wonderful ideas from different people in our group who have already started to integrate either growth mindset into their advising groups that they start early on in medical school. Um, we heard about a course that was focused on resilience. Um, and that was a one credit course that was in the spring where students came together um, and really to talk about how do you face adversity? What are the things that are going to come up that you're going to face? Things are going to happen during law school and what to be prepared for those things and how do you really deal with it? Um, and then and then just in, in the end, we just had a few moments, but I think the general theme that we really talked about was that we need to say to students, we need to prepare them for what the experience will be and to tell them that this is normal and that all of us who are mentors need to share also our failures, that students really want to hear that, that that's happened to all of us and we, we can also share with them. We're not this ivory you know, tower, but really we are people who went through failures and this is how we got through it. So I'm thank you to everyone who can't join my breakout room. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I think um, two takeaways that I, I thought were really, really good. There was a question about anxiety and in the, in the law classroom where students are cold called or using Socratic method for cold calls. And what we talked about was um, it's, it's not a great learning technique. I can tell you that a number of my students tell me they don't hear anything the professor says until they've called on somebody and then they go, wasn't me. Because the anxiety levels of, am I gonna be the one they call on? Um, is just a little overwhelming. And then uh, it, once a student is called on, then all eyes are on that student and then the fear response kicks in and the message that is received from students who are trying to engage with the professor in the Socratic method is that if you are struggling with this case, with this concept, what the issue is, if you struggle, you're failing. And we need to figure out how to create messages to our students that we want you to struggle. We're glad that you're struggling. It's only through struggling that you learn. Um, and then that decreases the anxiety response where they don't feel like they're failing. It really ties in exactly with what Priya um, has been talking about. 
So that was a real interesting discussion. How do you get faculty buy-in on that? We hold faculty roundtables where we actually talk about the pedagogy of teaching law. And, um, and our faculty are very receptive to some of those ideas. Um, and uh, then the second one was on test anxiety and how do we try to minimize test anxiety. And one of the things uh, that we talked about was just the idea of writing down all of the negative thoughts in your head. By writing them down, you are freeing up working memory in the brain to be able to deal with the questions. And that the science tells us that students who do that raise their grades by at least a half a grade. My students eat that up. Um, and then um, another uh, person was talking about how do you help teach students to reframe that negative voice that's saying bad things about you and change it into celebrating your successes and um, really um, celebrating your successes, the things that you do well, instead of having a voice that's constantly telling you bad things. And one of the things I tell my students is give that voice a name and make it a stupid name. And so that they, it's not me talking to me, it's the stupid voice talking to me. So that's sort of the um, takeaways for us. Thank you. And Kim, briefly, some takeaways from. <laughs> well, we did get a chance to do an, an interactive piece. We were sort of, I was trying to identify a place to launch from and we, we ran out of time. But one of the things that has come up in the chat is this idea of getting doctrinal faculty to buy in to this programming and seeing their role in it being a kind of a whole school effort. And one of the things that I would want to say that we've experienced is that when we were able to find just one or two doctrinal faculty and do a pilot program and have them go out and be our emissaries, because what we did was did a small group program with them where we did like uh, we did facilitated study groups using a question that they gave us. And then the next week when the students went back into that classroom, the conversation was so much more robust. It was so much more engaged that the faculty person was like, wow, that was that was incredible. They were able to engage at a whole different level. And then when we got to the next faculty meeting and I announced oh, we're, we did this program, they spoke on it. And then it began to be socialized in that way. Um, the piece about finding skills, getting people to to agree on what skills are necessary. This sounds terrible, but when you can show faculty that they get a payout, they get exams that are easier to read, they get higher performance. We were able to show that students who participated in the programming experience, uh, uh, we had fewer dismissals. We cut our dismissals by 50%, the numbers, so our retention improved significantly. We showed after for folks who participated in our remediation program, they had a, a pretty significant improve, improvement in grade point averages and in performance, and certainly reduced the number of students who were excluded in the following semester. And that shift to a more robust classroom experience and more readable exams. Faculty found that the faculty who participated, who had students who participated, said their exams improved. And so once we got that first cohort, um, they went. They really, they really proselytized and and helped us get build buy in. So I don't know if that's helpful, but that that responds to some of the questions that were in the chat yeah. about what people found challenging. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists and thank you to everyone who was able to participate in the breakout rooms. Um, we have had a lot of discussion happening and I know there may be things you want to take back. So I want to point out all the wonderful resources um, that's here on this slide. Um, in addition, Chris has even shared her syllabus for us and that will be in the resources panel on your screen. And with that, a big, big hearty thank you to each of our panelists, Priya, Chris and Kim for sharing your thoughts with us and helping us generate great ideas. And with that, I'll turn it back to Lisa. Thank you so much, Kamisha, and thank you all to the panelists and to all of you for participating. We're trying to mix things up a little bit to see what works in this new online space, and we'll look forward to your feedback as well. 
We are going to take a few minute break once again. And before we do, I'm going to set up the next question and the next chance for a prize. And so here we go. I've got a little trivia question for you. My question for you is, we know we're going to Nashville. Who knows what Nashville is known as? You can drop your answers in the Q&A panel and the first correct answer is going to win a fabulous prize. So we'll see you back here at two minutes to the top of the hour. Cheers.
Hi, everybody. Welcome back. We are here for our big reveal of our trivia question and our next prize. And there were a ton of answers in the chat panel. Thank you so much for getting out there. The answer to the question, Nashville is known as, first, I'm going to tell you a fun answer. A couple of you said you went to college in Nashville, and the uh, fun name was Nash Vegas. Um, that is not what we were going for today, but I'm glad to know some extra trivia. What we were going for is Music City, and we are going to be delighted to welcome you to Music City next year. Our winner for this round goes out to Melissa Hale. So, Melissa, we will be getting this delicious box of Nashville treats out to you. And uh, we are going to get this set up for our next uh, presenter as well. And I think all of our panelists are here. And uh, so let me go ahead and turn this over to Leandra. Leandra. All right. Can you hear me and see me? I can hear you and see you. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> I know there is a bit of a delay, but thank you so much, Lissa. And hello to all of you who are joining us. I am just so happy uh, to see some familiar names. I wish I could see your faces. Uh, but my name is Leandra Ross, and I'm the regional manager in the South for Access Lex Center for Education and Financial Capability. Let me tell you, I have been poured into today, and I really hope you have too. And so we have come to the second to the last session of LexCon at Home, and I have the honor of moderating for three of my colleagues who will take an in-depth look at the current student loan landscape, review proposals, and enacted COVID-related uh, legislation, and put together a list of practical habits your students can begin to incorporate to bolster their financial health, both during their graduate program and beyond. So whether you're in medical school, dental school, law school, or a graduate program, this information is going to be applicable to you and your students. So that we get through this comprehensive content, similar to the other sessions, we're gonna hold off on the Q&A portion for our panelists until the end. However, don't be shy. Feel free to drop those questions in the Q&A box throughout the session, and I'll make sure we collect those for my colleagues to answer. So with that, it's now my pleasure to have our panelists introduce themselves, and I'll start with Derek. Thank you, Leandra, and welcome everybody to our session. My name is Derek Brainerd. I'm the Director of Financial Education at the Access Lex Center for Education and Financial Capability. Nancy? Hi, everyone. I'm Nancy Keneally. I'm the Director of Policy here at Access Lex Institute. And we'll toss it over to Ashley to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ashley Nord Strupa, and I am a regional manager for the Northeast Region at Access Lex Center for Education and Financial Capability. Well, thank y'all so much. Like I said, I'm really excited to get started. Again, today we're going to be talking about legislative relief, the student loan landscape, what's next in Washington, and how your students can, again, boost their financial health. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ashley to kick us off. Thanks, Leandra, and thank you everyone for joining us today. We're gonna to be talking all about how we can best set up our students for success after the pandemic, when all of this is behind us, hopefully sooner rather than later. Thankfully, federal legislation um, and economic relief was extended early to alleviate some of the financial stress that most Americans are facing, but especially for our students. Federal student loan borrowers have received months of interest accrual, suspended and suspension of payments, among other overall economic relief. Uh, Nancy, ooh, sorry about that. Nancy will speak to us uh, about what's coming up in Washington, both um, holistically with new legislation, with legislation that's being talked over, as well as what we might be able to see with the, with a new administration coming in next month. And Derek is going to talk to us about what type of resources 
we can use with our students and those who are graduating to help them set themselves up for financial success post pandemic. And so let's just jump into legislative re relief. The most major economic relief seen this year by our students and borrowers uh, in 2020 came in the form of the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act. It's really a mouthful. Um, it's much easier uh, and we probably recognize it as known as the CARES Act. Uh, it was signed into law on March 27th and it provided over $2 trillion in needed economic relief for American workers, students, families, and businesses during the COVID-19 pandemic. And most of the relief we're gonna be talking about today centers around that CARES Act. <clears throat> so first, and what is near and dear to my heart is student loan relief. I've been working with student loan borrowers as an advocate uh, uh, for student loan, for student loan uh, legislation and student loan change since 2006. I'm always trying to find ways to assist students to find ways to find accessible education at a financially responsible price and how to get there. So student loan relief uh, was granted during 2020 through the CARES Act and this shape of the zero rate, as well as the suspension for payments. As And we also, for most of our students, saw some directly through stimulus checks through the Higher Education <clears throat> Emergency Relief Fund for higher education institutions, and then unemployment relief, an extension of unemployment relief that uh, has, I'm pretty sure is a little unprecedented with the extra with the extra weeks of uh, unemployment relief. And we're gonna go over all of four of these with a little bit more detail. And at the end, I'm gonna do some um, number examples to show you how much our borrowers and our students are saving during this time. So first and foremost, let's talk student loan relief for our students. Um, this is how the CARES Act helped relieve a lot of the stress and anxiety associated with making payments and interest that was accruing during these trying times. Federal student loan borrowers were placed in an administrative forbearance or suspension of payments from March 13th to September 30th of 2020. And that has been extended twice. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, during this period, no interest has been accruing, 0% interest. So for current students, the 0% interest rate is indirect relief because payments are not required while you're in school at least half time. For borrowers no longer in school, the 0% interest coupled with the payment suspension has been direct relief, allowing individuals to funnel more of their funds to their needed essentials, whatever they need on their daily life for them and their families. For both groups, the 0% interest will lower how much borrowers will pay over the lifetime of their loan. Next uh, for direct relief has been the stimulus checks. They're actually called the economic impact payments. The most of us know them as the stimulus checks. Um, that was direct relief to our students, our borrowers, most, uh, most individuals in the country. So eligible individuals who filed a tax return uh, received the $1,200 in a stimulus check. And those who filed a joint tax return received up to $2,400. For those of us lucky ones who have children, they received up to uh, additional $500 per child. Higher income individuals had their payments reduced uh, if, they were filing joint, uh, if they were filing jointly and had an adjusted gross income up to $198,000. So once you hit that $198,000, you are no longer eligible to have a stimulus check. Uh, likewise, if you're filing head of household, the maximum amount uh, once you got over that threshold was $136,500. And then for all others, it was $99,000. Each of those uh, adjusted gross income thresholds increased by $10,000 each qualifying child. As an example, if you were a family of four filing jointly and the, and the two parents may, uh, combined had an adjusted gross income of $100,000, that family with two children would have seen a, a stimulus check of $3,400. So the $2,400 for the joint filers and then $500 each for each child. Hopefully that all makes sense, but please put your questions in the chat panel and we'll get to them at the end. The next form of 
direct relief, and which is a little unprecedented for most students, was the uh, unemployment relief. The CARES Act provided pandemic emergency unemployment compensation. It's quite a mouthful as well. PEUC, uh, this allowed for an additional unemployment payments for up to 13 weeks uh, above what would normally be your um, maximum amount. Depending on the state, some students found themselves eligible for unemployment benefits, though they wouldn't normally have been eligible. I had students come to me asking what they should do. Um, did I think that they were eligible? And every student that I worked with, I said, there's no harm in applying. Uh, I had a student from Suffolk, uh, Suffolk Law who, who got back to me and said that she applied. Uh, she had worked the pre, uh, in the previous previous year and she was a 1L student and she ended up receiving unemployment benefits, which made life during the summer a lot easier for her because she wasn't able to do her internship. So as you can see, there were definitely some uh, direct relief when it came to the unemployment relief for our students. And this additional 13 weeks is set to expire on December 30th, unless it's further extended. And then finally, the Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund, or HEERF, uh, that allotted $14.25 billion to institutions as, as grants. A portion could be used to, for the institution itself, but no less than 50% had to be used to provide emergency relief grants to students themselves for their expenses caused by the pandemic. Now, uh, this is not Title IV student aid. Students need to be Title IV eligible to receive the grants, but it wasn't actually Title IV aid. But when students received these grants, they had to be uh, they had to be related to expenses that they that they faced due to the coronavirus. Uh, disruption in their in in the campus life not their financial need the heerf emergency emergency grants needed to be paid directly to the student and could not be applied to offset their institutional charges all right so student loans like i said these are near and dear to my heart uh at Access Lex, all of us uh, in our center are accredited financial counselors, and we work with students nearly every day or borrowers to discuss their financial needs and provide financial education and coaching. And during the last, what, eight, nine, ten months, uh, one of the most asked questions that I've received is about changes to their student loans. They're really confused about what's been going on with them. So I want to clearly outline that federal student loans, whether you're a student, whether you're working with a student in school or a borrower who is a recent graduate, everyone has 0% interest rate on their federal student loans from March 13th to originally September 30th, and then December 31st due to a presidential executive order. And now, uh, as of December 4th, it was announced by the Department of Education until January 31st. So those who are going to repayment for the first time or those who are going to be re-entering repayment will be going into repayment in February. All payments for those in repayment have been paused for that, for that period. So let's take a look at how that's going to affect our students. So here I've outlined the interest rates pre-pandemic. So as a graduate student, you'd be eligible for unsubsidized loans, and grab plus loans in the federal arena. Uh, they, are, they were 6.08% and 7.08% pre-pandemic. They were set to change on July 1 to 4.3% and 5.3% uh, respectively. They are now set to zero through January 31st. So I am a numbers kind of person, it's probably why I'm a financial counselor. I like to see how this is really going to affect them. So if you have a normal graduate student who borrows 20,500, the maximum for the unsub loan, uh, they would accrue normally pre-pandemic accrue $1,030 in interest over the last 10 months or the 10 months between March and January. On a grab plus loan of $40,000, they'd accrue interest of just uh, over $2,300 for a total of almost $3,400 in interest. Because of the 0%, uh, period, they're not going to accrue any and any interest. Now you extrapolate that out to our graduate students 
who are borrowing $150,000, $200,000, they're going to be seeing a significant, significant savings. <clears throat> now, talking about savings, uh, for students who are thinking about making payment applicate, uh, making um, payments during this time, um, especially students that I've talked to um, from the medical professions, uh, who graduated this year, they wanted to maximize what they could do with, with, their, with their payments because they were lucky enough to be employed. Payment application is always going to be the same. Uh, it has to apply to fees first, if there are any fees that were incurred. Any interest that has accrued on your loans would be covered before principal. Principal is then covered. And in the cases where I had students, so specifically, you, uh, I, I worked with uh, UMass, uh, UMass um, Medical School and BU Medical School quite a bit. And I had, and even U, UMass Medical actually graduated their students early in April so that they could uh, get into the field early because, due to the pandemic. I had students that were working in needed fields and they wanted to start making payments because they could uh, and maximize what they could do with their payments. So uh, you could actually have supercharged payments. By supercharge, I mean they've already covered the interest that's been accruing on their loans. There's zero percent accruing right now, so any payments they, they were making was going toward principal and even a little bit extra principal because there was no interest to be accruing. And with that in mind, my last topic before I transfer it over to Nancy is repayment plans and forgiveness. So if you have um, students, uh, borrowers who are on the income-driven repayment plans, even though they're not making payments right now, they are counting toward the maximum amount of payments uh, for them to qualify for forgiveness. And likewise, anyone who is on an income-driven plan or an eligible plan and working toward public service loan forgiveness, again, even though they're not, they're, they're not making payments right now, if they're performing the qualified service, then these payments will count toward public service loan forgiveness. And I've had uh, quite a few students come to me asking how they can uh, end their in, in grace period or how can how so that they can take advantage of public service loan forgiveness because they're working in, in an eligible field right now. So with that, uh, Nancy, are you ready? Yes, I am. Can everyone hear me? All right. Uh, thanks, Ashley, for walking us through that. Um, that gives us a good setup in terms of what has already happened in Washington. Um, and I'm going to talk about what we might see happen in the coming weeks and months. So first, I want to walk through a couple of proposals that have been put forth by Congress um, since, the, since the spring, since the CARES Act was um, enacted in March. So first we have the House Democrats Heroes Act. This was passed by the House. Oops, I don't know. I'm advancing the slides. Oh, I just put that back to my slide. Okay, I'm not sure what's happening, um, but I will just, um, hopefully someone can put me back on that slide. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, so House Democrats passed the Heroes Act in May. Um, and this bill would have um, several important higher education provisions. First, it would have extended the CARES Act payment pause through September of 2021. Um, it would have applied that payment pause to privately held FELP loans and Perkins loans borrowers. And it would also have forgiven up to $10,000 for private student loan borrowers. Um, as I said, this passed the House in May, but it didn't advance further than that. It didn't go anywhere in the Senate. Uh, because there was no Republican support for it. It was then, however, um, streamlined and reintroduced in September when negotiations picked back up after the August recess. However, again, um, it failed to get any Republican support in the Senate. And then on the flip side, on the other side of the Hill, the Senate Republicans introduced their Heals Act in July, just before August recess. And in regard to higher education, this bill would have simplified the FAFSA, it would have consolidated the repayment plans, and it would have provided approximately $30 billion for higher education. Um, there are also some liability protections in this bill that would have um, shielded employers um, 
And this would have included colleges and universities that reopen as well to protect them from lawsuits from employees. Um, what you'll notice is that missing from this bill is any extension of the payment pause. Um, so that's just a flavor of where um, Democrats and Republicans stand in terms of what they want to see in the next COVID relief bill. Uh, but now I want to talk a little bit about what's going on with the negotiations. Um, so Congress and the White House have been trying since the spring, since the CARES Act was enacted, to um, come to an agreement on another bill. Um, it has long been agreed that um, we need to have at least one more relief package. However, um, you know, we haven't seen that come to fruition, um, as you all know. Um, but the major players here have been um, Democratic Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi and Secretary of the Treasury Stephen Mnuchin. They have been trying off and on all summer and fall to try to negotiate a package that everyone could agree with. Um, there was hope that the election would provide some incentive for all parties or all stakeholders to come together because no one wanted to, you know, be to blame for not extending unemployment or not distributing another stimulus check. Um, but again, as we all know, that didn't happen. Um, things really fell apart in the weeks leading up to the election and negotiations ceased at that point. So now where might we be going? Um, the election is behind us. Uh, now that we've had sort of a few weeks to sort of figure out what's going on, where things stand, um, some action has restarted in Congress. We just saw in the last week or so, a bipartisan group of senators have released a, a package that they hope will lay the groundwork for a deal that leadership can agree on. Um, this is a $900 billion package. It includes some things for higher education, including um, $4 billion for the student loan payment pause. Um, we think that that would get a, buy us another couple of months with the with the payment pause, and then they also suggest eighty two billion dollars for education. Although that would be split between K to twelve education and higher education, um, I will say that the details are few and far between, and things are very fluid. Um, this this proposal has restarted negotiations, however. Um, Secretary Mnuchin, um, Speaker Pelosi, and now Leader McConnell are starting to talk again. However, there does remain some sticking points, and they they are the same sticking points that have, have sort of tied this up all summer and fall, and that's the liability protections that I spoke of in the HEALS Act. Uh, Democrats do not support that. Um, another sticking point is state and local aid. While Democrats would like to see state and local aid in a coronavirus package, Democrat, or excuse me, Republicans don't support that. And then another sticking point is the stimulus checks and the amount. Should it be 1,200 again? Should it be less? Should it be more? Um, so those three things are, are what are really sort of hamstringing negotiators right now. Um, what I will say is that Congress is set to be in session until next Friday. Um, right now, the spending bill runs out on Friday, and so the sense is that they will, if there is a COVID relief package or deal to be had, it will be tacked onto that spending bill. Um, but that doesn't mean we have the next eight days to make a deal. What that means is the deal needs to be made relatively soon so that staff can then draft the language. Um, that would obviously have to be drafted before next Friday. Um, obviously, um, the leaders in the House and Senate could extend the session. Right now, they're scheduled to be here till the 18th. But, you know, if they're getting close to a deal, they may extend it another week. They may go till Christmas Eve, which we have seen them do in the past. Um, so, it, again, like I said, it's all sort of very fluid right now. But we are we are watching very closely. Um, and so that's the lame duck that we're in right now. But what does this mean for 2021? Well, regardless of what happens in the lame duck, whether we see a package or not, we fully expect that President-elect Biden and Democrats in the Congress will push for another COVID relief package. Um, they have, all, or Democrats in the Congress have all along been proposing a much larger bill than what this bipartisan group has put forward. So with a Democrat in the White House starting on January 20th, we expect congressional Democrats to push again for a larger package. Um, whether or not that will come together and what the scope of that will be depends on a couple of things. Um, some are known and some are unknown. 
Uh, the first is we know in the House that Democrats will retain have retained control, but we also know that their margins are much smaller. So in this current Congress that we're in, they have had the ability to pass large, expensive, sweeping bills like the HEROES Act without much pushback. Um, you know, they could stand to lose a couple of more moderate members or members who don't feel comfortable, maybe with the price tag or some of the provisions. That's not going to be the case next Congress. Next Congress, they will only have a majority of about seven or eight or nine seats. And so what that means is if moderates and Democrats in Republican-leaning districts don't support a bill, it's not going to pass the House. And so I expect that we would see smaller, less sweeping um, bills next Congress in the House. Um, one of the unknowns is, of course, who is going to control or which party is going to control the Senate. Um, that has not been decided yet because we have two seats that um, we still have to determine. Um, in Georgia, there are two seats that are going to go to a runoff on January 5th. Um, and so right now, for the next Congress, Republicans hold 50 seats and Democrats hold 48. So if Democrats pick up both seats in Georgia, they will effectively have the majority, with Vice President-elect Harris being the tie-breaking vote beginning on January 20th. Um, if they fail to pick up both, um, that means Republicans will retain control. Um, so again, even if, Repu if Democrats pick up both seats and they get control of the Senate, that's a razor-thin margin. That, that, is, that is a margin of one vote. Um, and so for them as well, they will have to put forward less expensive and sort of less far-reaching bills if they stand a chance to get them through the Senate. Because again, you are going to lose moderates who may not agree with um, how expensive a bill is or what provisions are in there. And if Republicans retain control of the Senate, um, it is unknown whether or not they will work with their Democratic colleagues and a Democratic president on bipartisan areas that they agree on. So um, all that to say, we don't know what next Congress will bring other than we expect to see a push for another coronavirus package. So that's a lot. There's a lot going on now. There's going to be a lot going on in 2021. So you may be asking yourself, how can I get engaged in this? I'm not in Washington. This isn't what I do for a living. How can I make my voice heard? Well, here at Access Lex, we have our Make the Case Ad Advocacy Campaign. We have a number of tools and resources that you can use, and I'm just going to talk about a couple of them right now. The first is our Executive Policy Committee, and some of you um, on the line may be a member of this. And this is for school administrators who are interested in um, staying up to date on what's happening in Washington, but also doing your own advocacy on behalf of your students and your school. Uh, we convene roughly every quarter via conference call. My team and I provide Washington updates. We talk about what's going on, when you should be getting engaged, what some of your talking points can be. And then we also wanna hear from you what your successes in advocacy have been and what some of your challenges are and how we can help you. So if that's something that you're interested in, um, you can always reach out to me at policy at accesslex.org. Um, and that, that email address will be on one of the last slides so you don't have to jot that down. And then the other ways you can get involved is contacting your member of Congress. Um, and again, we have tools and resources to make this incredibly easy for you. Uh, but first, I just want to reiterate that it is incredibly important that you make friends before you need them. Um, and by that, I mean you don't want to reach out to a congressional office for the first time when a bill is moving and you want to get your priorities in there or you see something in the bill that you want taken out. Um, I encourage everybody, particularly with a new Congress starting in January, um, to reach out to your members of Congress early and develop those relationships. Um, I know that, you know, we're not, you're not able to come to Washington, but in some ways being virtual makes this easier. Um, you can have conversations, you can have phone calls with staff, you can invite the member to participate in virtual events that you have um, so that you can sort of bring, sort of virtually bring them onto campus and help them understand what an asset your school and your students are to their state and district. Um, and so when it is time to weigh in on a specific bill, that's when you can come here to our Make the Case Advocacy tool, and the, the link is there for you to jot down. And what we have done is we've made it really easy 
for you to send an email to your members of Congress. And so we periodically um, upload pre-drafted emails on different topics. Right now, we've got several up there related to COVID relief. Um, and all you have to do is go in, put in your name and address, and it will link you to your member of Congress, your, your two senators and your representative, and there will be a pre-drafted email that you can either edit, you can add personal details, personal stories, stories about your school and your students, or you can leave it as is and just hit send. Um, and, you know, we hope that, you know, we know that everyone's busy and we hope that this tool will make it very easy and efficient for you to engage with your members of Congress. Um, we also have other resources like one pagers, talking points, webinars, videos, things like that, um, that you can check out on our website. And then finally, another way to stay up to date on a more frequent basis is to check out our Higher Education Policy Roundup. Um, my team um, publishes this on our X blog every Friday that Congress is in session. Um, and what it is is a post that basically just tells you what's been happening this week in Washington. And so we do a little blurb, a paragraph or two in the beginning to tell you what has Congress been working on, what has the administration been doing, related to higher education and student loans. Then the news you can use section links you to relevant articles of the week or new reports that have been put out. And then finally, and you can't see it on the screenshot, but the last section is bills that we've been watching. And so these are higher ed and student aid related bills. And I would encourage you to look at those because there may be bills that you could support or that your schools could support. And that might be a really good opportunity for you to reach out to your member of Congress at that point. Um, you know, it doesn't always have to be the big bills like COVID relief or Higher Education Act reauthorization. If you see a smaller bill that you think would really benefit your students, I encourage you to reach out to your member and ask them to support that bill. Um, so again, as always, um, if you have any questions or need any help with your advocacy, I encourage you to reach out to me at policy at accesslex.org. And with that, I will turn it over to Derek. Thank you, Nancy. And as you can all tell, we spend a lot of time uh, talking directly with students about their student loans, repayment options, their fears, their anxieties, um, and just navigating that whole system, as well as a lot of time keeping our finger on the pulse of what's going on in Washington through all the work that Nancy and, and her wonderful team are doing. And I highly recommend that, that weekly roundup. It's something that I look forward to getting every Friday and looking at, and it really is news you can use when you're talking with your students about these, these topics. So I'm gonna kind of pivot right now to taking this idea of student loans as one piece of the financial puzzle that we know our students are navigating and bringing it out to a, a little bit more of a comprehensive or holistic look at at the struggles or the barriers that we've been seeing with students since the pandemic began, and then how we can take those lessons that we've learned from the pandemic when it comes to managing our finances and translate those to setting up our students for success when they enter the, the workforce, the post-graduation space. So I just wanna um, uh, begin with this uh, by just talking about this uh, 2016 systematic literature review. It's titled Mental Health Outcomes in Times of Economic Recession. And what this did is, uh, what this comprehensive literature review is, it took looked at consistent evidence over 100 research papers that economic recessions throughout time and additional mediators, such as unemployment, income decline, and unmanageable debt loads, uh, were significantly associated with poor mental well-being with increased rates of common mental disorders, with substance-related disorders, and even suicidal behaviors. And again, the, the study, if you wanted to look it up uh, and read through it for yourself, is called Mental Health Outcomes in Times of Economic Recession. And so these times of economic recession, we think back to 2008 to 2009, right? Um, but in June, the, our country entered a recession in earnest. And since then, it's been steadily rising. Now, there's been this sort of disconnect between what's actually happening in the economy at the macro level and its increase toward this recovery, this quick recovery, and what people are actually experiencing. 
So if you look at the unemployment numbers that are coming out week after week, it's still record levels. If you talk to students who are having their license exams delayed by months, and therefore their starting dates for their first careers push into 2021. And these folks that are just like many Americans, uh, eight out of 10 of them living paycheck to paycheck are not knowing necessarily how they're gonna cover their living expenses. This is real, uh, real stressor. In our pilot study, uh, for our uh, max personal finance program, we found that that 40% of students that that participated were unsure where, how they were going to pay for their monthly bills. And this this issue is only exasperated by the the environment in which we've been living for the last 10 months. So we've learned some really big financial lessons that I wanted to just um, to pass on to you all today. And before I dive into these four overarching lessons, I do want to say that these are included in the financial success checklist in the resources tab for this presentation. And this checklist um, puts all of these points together for you so that you can take this. You might look at it for yourself and say, are we doing all these things in our own household? Uh, and then you can pass it on to your students. Please do, um, uh, please do that as you, as you see fit. So, Living on less than you make is something that times of financial strain just obviously it, it illuminates and it makes it even more important as to why this is on the on the list of uh, financial lessons. Um, living on less than you make, this means making frequent housing, food and transportation decisions that will help you live on less than you have coming in. Now for students, we know that, that many of them are not working full time, maybe, maybe a handful are working part time, so they do have funds coming in from earnings that they can manage. So here we might be talking about student loan refunds, if that's how your students are financing their experience. That still counts. And if you want, if you can live on less than is coming in for the student loan refund and set aside a piece for an emergency fund, if you do not have one already in place, that can be a very good use for those funds, obviously. Um, when possible, and there's, you know, buy things in bulk, uh, look for those deals, save 30% on a purchase when you're buying it through a Costco or BJ's. And that's something that is really hard to replicate in any sort of savings vehicle or the stock market, right? So those things that we do with our money every single day, food, transportation, shelter, these are, these are decisions that students make even term to term or semester to semester. These are the big ticket items in this first lesson that really gets driven home in periods like the one that we're in now. We always talk to students about using a budget to help monitor and control this. And we know that, that so many people don't use a budget, uh, maybe because it's tedious, maybe because it's just not a, a fun thing to do. And so we are constantly teaching and advocating for budgeting methods that work for, for the student. If it's not a traditional, um, Mint or Excel spreadsheet or paper and pen, and they're going to project their income and expenses and look for that so that surplus or deficit and track their spending throughout the month. If it if that's just not what they're going to realistically do, any sort of monitoring and controlling is better than none. So we do talk about the 50-30-20 approach: 50% on needs, 30% on wants, 20% on a rainy day or for future expenses like a licensing exam or that car after graduation or making a move to where your first job is. The budgeting is powerful. It just doesn't have to be all that traditional view that we think of when we think of budgeting. And again, it's going back to, are you actually using the budget to track daily spending? Um, prioritizing, prioritizing emergency savings is certainly something that we've all probably taken a step back over the last 10 months and say, wow, Either A, I'm really glad that I had some money set aside so that I can have some peace of mind if something happens to career, if something happens to a spouse's career, um, or if we just need that money, right? Uh, it, or B, this brings to light, I really need a cushion. I really need some savings in the bank, whether it's in a checking account, a savings account, a money market account, something set aside. So making emergency savings a priority is a lesson that we learn uh, as as humans, <laughs> seemingly every um, large crisis that we go to, is it really just drives home this idea. So again, with students, are they able to, uh, if they have earnings of any kind, set aside any amount automatically every paycheck, whether and just siphon it to a savings account, $25 here, $50, $100. And if they don't have earnings because they're just full-time uh, academic, then 
that may be a good use for some of their student loan refund um, versus not having it set aside and then having to turn to higher interest credit cards in the, in the case of emergency. And this extends past graduation, right? We're talking about setting your students up for success post pandemic, but also post graduation. So automating uh, contributions to their 401k when they do start working to at least match the employer's matching contributions is a great practice and uh, establishing and automatically funding separate savings accounts for different goals they might have down the road and starting to funnel money into those things as they can. And again, this is dependent on resources. This is dependent on income. This is dependent on their situation. But this is why going back to the first piece, living on less than you make is so crucially important because if you can make decisions in those big ticket items, those to the, the shelter, transportation and food, then you may be able to free up some cash flow to service some of these other needs. The third category here is being debt sensitive. And we always teach or talk to students about borrowing only what they need for monthly expenses um, from student loan refunds. And, and obviously, as you saw from Ashley's example earlier, with the savings that, have, that are happening right now with the 0% uh, interest waiver during the pandemic, the same thing goes for, for money that you just don't borrow because you were strategic enough to say, I only need X amount, so I'm not gonna borrow the full amount just because I can. So being debt sensitive when it comes to student loans, but also use it in your use of credit, in your use of any sort of personal loan product uh, is also something that we've learned. Debt in a crisis ex exacerbates the stress. Um, we feel it sometimes tenfold if we are beholden to somebody else financially. So being debt sensitive before it happens, during the crisis, and then afterward for the rest of uh, our life course is a, obviously a best practice. And then finally, monitoring financial health metrics. Um, we have a, 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 a lesson in a handout when we in something we call the financial dashboard in our personal finance program. And financial health metrics are probably what you think of. They're your credit score. They're your, how many months you could cover with your emergency fund. They are your net worth, right? Your assets minus your liabilities. Is that trending up year to year? Um, and they are your debt to income ratio. The thing that lenders will look at most when they're looking to uh, maybe give you a mortgage down the road. Uh, how, much, how much do you pay in debt payments each month versus your monthly gross income? These are your, your financial health metrics. And so well, that's the other lesson that we learned. Just because we're in a, a precarious position now, um, or if you're a student that has a lot of student loan debt and no income or nothing, no assets to really speak of, your net worth may be negative, right? And in many students, this is the case. But we want to impress upon them this lesson that we've learned. If you can steadily track your monitor and your, your health metrics over time, and those are progressing in the direction that they should, then uh, you're going to be in a more stable position when a crisis hits, when uh, a recession hits, um, or just a um, you know something a bump in the road, right? If it, whether it's a temporary period of unemployment or uh, or something like that um, after graduation, these are all things that we've learned, uh, relearned the importance of over the course of the pandemic. And again, all of those items are on that financial success checklist that you can get from the resources tab for this session. But it's not just that. Like those are some some timeless, um, straightforward financial concepts that we know work, right? They're proven. But what we've also found, you know, since the pandemic began, we've had the really the honor of working with thousands of students across um, our Max Coaching and our Access Connects financial coaching services. Um, and they're asking a lot of questions. Many of them are about student loans. Um, and many of them are also about, what do I do with this money? Should I be putting it in an emergency fund? Should I be paying down loans? We have questions about credit, about how to engage with family, about money issues. And we also have run a series called Managing Your Money During the COVID-19 Pandemic, a webinar series, um, where we address a lot of what's going on. And so what we found was that there's also a need for folks to really invest not only their money in terms of being debt sensitive, paying down debt, and then investing for wealth, but also investing in knowledge. You know, when I teach about investing um, to stu with students, I, I usually talk about a three-part framework: uh, learn, earn, invest. Right. So right now, as a student, you're in that learning phase. Uh, many students are, and so this is the perfect time to invest in knowledge, research those local resources or programs that can help you. 
read financial books, articles, and research from authors that have different points of view. We don't want to get that sort of narrow focus in terms of one way to win with money when we know that there's several ways you can do it and they may speak to you depending on your on where you're coming from. Um, listen to personal finance podcasts, TED Talks, YouTube videos, whatever you like, and then look for free courses on personal finance. These are just ways that we can use this time to sharpen our skills financially. But we also at the same time need to be consistently building our brand. So I love this and I love how we see these kind of themes interwoven throughout the day. You know, Kwame talked about in the first session today how negotiation really is every conversation, right? He, I love his definition. It was so inclusive. It's really any conversation where somebody wants something. And so when it comes to building your own brand, something we always talk with students are about, about is to be engaged in that, be present to those conversations. And when we say network constantly, that's pretty much what we need, what we mean, right? And so effective networking can be those negotiation con conversations, and moments that we're in that Kwame was teaching about earlier. Seek experience-based opportunities, negotiate for income and benefits when the time comes. And I loved how Kwame even mentioned that's a rare thing. And in those many negotiations, those several, those hundreds, those thousands that we're having as students now, up to those those more rare but very important negotiations are just as important. And then continuously sharpen your communication, speaking, and writing skills. We can't emphasize this enough. Um, uh, and and it comes down to, and I, I do want to reference the other, um, one of the other sessions from today, Gino and Troy talking about the intersectionality, knowing where you come from, knowing your strengths, knowing what you want to work on, and knowing how your past experience um, influences the way that you view the world, but also how you handle money. We talk, we talk about money scripts and money stories all the time. So being very self-aware in that way and continuously sharpening your communication, speaking, writing, networking, negotiation skills is what is definitely a best practice when it comes to setting yourself up for financial success. So in our center, we believe that financial capability comes at the intersection of knowledge, skills, and access to resources. So you're gonna be somewhere on the pipeline in every three of those categories. And where they all come together is what defines your financial capability. So access to resources is absolutely huge. And when needed, definitely pushing students towards resources, especially if they're in a moment of crisis, financial counseling, career services, uh, tax and investment professionals, not for credit, credit count, not for profit credit counseling, and then food pantries and local and government assistance programs are things that we should all be aware of so that we can refer students to them and then they can be aware of them for the future should the need arise. So with that, I want to, uh, just again, reference our checklist, setting your students up for financial success. We have the financial success checklist. I hope that you all enjoy it, use it, pass it along. Um, and also uh, as a result of this session, you know, share the advocacy toolkit and all of those templates and the items and resources that Nancy mentioned. Um, and please plug into our free events. We have free online events um, for anybody. And these are open enrollment, national uh, webinars, the road to zero, a strategic approach to student loan repayment that we're all, we offer multiple times throughout the um, every month. And your public service loan forgiveness action plan is another popular one. And as uh, as Congress comes out with potentially a new stimulus package here, you can rest assured that we will be continuing our managing your money during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, series so that you and your students, everyone's invited, totally free, stay in the conversation and keep your ear to the ground on what's going on with those relief measures so that students know how to navigate these things effectively, okay? We wanna offer you this free resource. Maybe you have questions, maybe students have questions, but you wanna talk in a more personalized way with an accredited financial counselor. Please use Access Connects. This is our free student loan helpline, but we really answer any financial question that people have, again, with our team of accredited financial counselors. And that's at accesslex.org slash access connects. So with that, I know we only have just two minutes left, but if there's any questions that we can uh, that we can answer now, we are happy to do so before we take our break. Lissa and uh, Jen, and by the way, and on behalf of uh, Nancy and Ashley and myself, I just want to thank you all for an amazing day and just for being here. Thank you for your engagement, and uh, here's to student success in 2021.
Well, thank you for that. You know, as a former financial aid administrator myself and an accredited financial counselor, I always love a good uh, student loan landscape financial success success discussion. Uh, and so we do have time at least for one question that has come in. I know we've gotten several questions. And so what I'll do is say, reach out to us. Uh, I think we're going to, it's in the resources section, or we're going to provide our contact information uh, because we would love to assist you with the questions that have come through. But one of the questions that came in is, do we know if there's any more talk in Congress about eliminating federal loan origination fees? And any of you can answer <laughs> if, if you want to. Sure, I can take that. Um, yeah, so there there have been conversations over the last several years about eliminating eliminating those origination fees. Um, that's something that Access Lex has supported as well and has been advocating for. I expect to see that come up again in the conversation of Higher Education Act reauthorization. Um, this is something that has a lot of support in the community. It has a lot of support on the Hill. So I think it, it will probably be incorporated into some sort of bill um, in the next Congress, not to say that that bill will be passed, but as they craft a bill, I think we will, we will see it um, because there is support for that. Great. And I will say if Derek and Ashley do not want to add more to that, I just want to thank you all again, uh, my colleagues. This was a pleasure doing this with you. Um, to all of our colleagues who are listening in, thank you again for being here. We're so great to have these partnerships with you. Thank you so much to our panel. Thank you, Leandra. And um, this brings us to our next break. So the next session will start at the top of the hour. Um, but don't forget to join us two minutes for the next prize announcement. We'll see you then.
Welcome back, everyone. And uh, we are so thankful to have so many of you joining us today. In this break, we're simply drawing one random attendee's name who's going to win this Harry and David Tower. Um, so again, all you had to do was be here. And so congratulations um, to Jennifer Cobb of Stetson Law. Um, so congratulations, Jennifer. We'll be reaching out to you uh, to uh, send you this gift packet. Um, from Harry and David. All right, so we um, we are still here. We have one more session left. I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Teresa Popron. Teresa, are you here? All right, I'll just give her one moment to pop on. Teresa, can you hear us and can you turn your webcam on? and unmute yourself. All right, well, where she is, uh, while she gets started, I will just kick us off and I'm sure she will, she will join us. Um, so as 2020 comes to a close, it seems very fitting that we're closing today's program with a session on lessons from the COVID crisis. Our three outstanding panelists will share their reflections on the pandemic the lessons they've learned and the programs and services they've created to best support their graduate and professional students during this unprecedented and challenging time. And please allow me to introduce our panel. And Isa, I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself and just say hello. Lisa and Isa, can you Hi, Isa, welcome. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. So, well, hi everybody, I'm so happy to be here. I'm the Assistant Dean for JD and Graduate Admissions at Seton Hall Law, and uh, just happy to share some thoughts. Thank you, Isa. Welcome, Emily. Hi there. Hi, Emily, can you turn your webcam on? Yes. Hi, everybody. It's nice to see you. I'm Emily Scavaletto. I use she, her pronouns, and I am at UC Davis. Glad to be here. Thank you, Emily. And welcome, John. Hi, everyone. I'm John Stiles. I'm the uh, financial aid director at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. And uh, I have worked in uh, law school admissions and financial aid before, but happy today to give some perspective and lessons learned from our medical school. Thank you, John. And Teresa, I see you on the screen now, so I will turn it back over to you. Hey, thank you, Ben. Are you able to hear me? How's the audio? I can. Wonderful. Well, thank you to all of our presenters for being here and to all of you. I can't believe that it's toward the end. Well, it is, it's our final session. I feel like we were just getting started this morning at 1030 and what a fabulous day of learning and information and sharing we have had. You know, when our students, the faculty, administrators, staff, everyone, everyone were scattered off campus and into this new learning and teaching um, working and, and living environments, it was really critically important to maintain open and consistent communication and to continue to try to build and foster a sense of community uh, during this period of, I guess, remote existence. Um, there were also a lot of new challenges that we and, and all of you did not anticipate that really required a collective approach on your respective campuses to doing the right thing for your students to help them get through this unprecedented situation. 
And I am just thrilled that we have this session today and it seems fitting that we are ending it, our, our conference today with this, the lessons learned from, from COVID. And so our panelists are gonna spend about the next 30 minutes or so talking about what, what we're calling the three C's, communication, community, and conscience. Conscience, And specifically, Issa and Emily and John will share how they and their respective institutions have the challenge of communicating with their students, building community among them, and, and, and doing the right thing in this environment. And then we're, we've saved some time after that for each uh, uh, for questions. So as my colleague Leandra said uh, during the last session, please do not be shy, drop them in the Q&A panel and we will get to those. And the way it's gonna work is we will go through each one, communication, community conscience, and each one of our panelists will address that topic. And we'll start with um, different ones each time. So let's go ahead and get started with communication. And Emily, if you could kick us off, that would be great. Definitely, thank you, Teresa. And uh, thank you to Access Lex for having us all here. Um, for everybody that's come, we're, we're really grateful. And uh, hopefully John, Issa and I can provide some of our thoughts and then obviously answer any questions you have. Um, if you're anything like John, Issa or myself, you have now, uh, finished up or are experiencing um, a nine month online training course in crisis management. Um, so congratulations. <laughs> um, many of us handle small crises all the time, but the level, scale and speed of the COVID-19 pandemic has truly tested all of us in ways that I don't think any of us imagined back in February. Uh, combine that with an election year, uh, racial and social justice events nationwide, um, for us in California, out of season wildfires. Um, and it's a wonder we all didn't just hide under the covers uh, until 2021. Um, but of course we didn't because we couldn't, because that's not who we are. And we had to be there for our teams, for our students and for our schools. And so one of the things we had to do is figure out how to communicate with our students um, and certainly other stakeholders um, in the time of this pandemic. UC Davis Law went um, to completely remote instruction in mid-March, um, just two weeks after I sent an email to everybody saying, we think we're probably gonna stay in person for a while. Um, so it happened quickly. Um, and so in communicating with our students, what I often try to do is figure out what is motivating the students, at least right now in this moment. Um, and during the pandemic, the two things that I heard most often were uncertainty and rapid change. Those were the things that were really problematic for students. And they felt very motivated to never have something be uncertain and nothing change. And of course, that was not how we were gonna be able to, to move through the first few months and, and later months of the pandemic. Um, but in looking to communicate with them, um, we did try very hard to make sure that we provided messaging that was consistent, calming, and as accurate as possible. So in the, in the things that you're gonna hear in this communication session, Certainly when we're talking about technology and the logistics and sort of how we did what we needed to do, overriding that and sort of um, on the umbrella of that is that we really did try to be as consistent, calming and as accurate as possible. Um, I work in restorative justice circles and one of the things that we talk about is a fair and consistent process for those that are involved. And so we try to create a dialogue for students um, looked at them to engage, give them an opportunity to be heard about how what they were going through, um, give them always, if we can, an explanation for their decisions, uh, for our decisions, and provide clarity about what's expected from them. So we set up a um, COVID-19 student advisory committee early on that met every two weeks starting in April. And that was made up of um, four of our students that were already elected in student government and then seven other students that were um, application-based selections. 
And from them, they provided, I met with them every two weeks, um, and they also provided recommendations to our dean, to our faculty. Um, from them, we started uh, a weekly email. Um, we uh, also created three different uh, big sort of info sessions that anybody could come and just ask questions about various topics of what was going on. Um, we also created a Zoom room reservation system for our student organizations because our student advisory committee really felt that the, understandably, that the student life would suffer. And so immediately we were able to get a system where they could reserve uh, Zoom links and then we would have a calendar um, of, of events still for our student organizations. They also provided student surveys on grading, uh, Zoom class, uh, experience um, uh, surveys as well. So I'm going to let John and Issa talk about some of the other methods that you see on the slide and the screen that we also use. Um, but again, all of this was sort of with the goal in mind of being um, as consistent and, and uh, as calming and as accurate as possible. So I'll turn it over now to Issa. Uh, thanks so much, Emily, for setting the stage for us. As, as you've already heard, it was a time of um, pivoting and, you know, really sort of jumping on the bandwagon as quickly as possible. But, you know, when we think about communicating with our students and trying to remain as transparent um, but calm and sort of positive as we possibly could, um, one of the first things we did, I know at Seton Hall Law, and particularly as it relates to the admissions team, which is the team that I sort of lead up, is that we were very committed to pivoting as quickly as possible to moving all of our events online. We didn't want our students, particularly our incoming students, to miss an opportunity to continue to learn about the environment that we hope they would join in the fall. So we really switched quickly to some virtual events and tried to give a variety of different opportunities even within that virtual platform. So from webinars to small meetings to other platforms that allow for a more networking, small round table sessions, just to give students an, audio, uh, an opportunity to engage in a different way, just like they would if they were to come on ground and on campus. As Emily also alluded, we really increased our email communication um, and try to keep our students, particularly again, our incoming students, as informed as we possibly could. Now, sometimes that meant we sent them an email today about, again, as Emily alluded to, um, starting classes on ground, and then tomorrow we had to send another email saying, well, that's changed, and this is why, and this is now how we're going to proceed. But I will say that our students have really appreciated that transparency um, and liked that they were kept informed um, even if it maybe was a, um, a lot of emails or even when we said, listen, we're trying to keep you informed, but we're still not sure what's going on either. We increased the ability um, for students to do virtual office hours. Those are both for our, for our current and incoming students. So various deans uh, and senior leadership just set up office hours so that students could drop in and ask questions, express concern, talk about what's happening in the future, how that impacts them, uh, sort of in a one-on-one -on -one setting. So we had a variety of virtual office hours. We also held a lot of what we were calling town hall meetings for different populations. So we had a town hall meeting for um, staff, faculty, and administrators. We had a town hall meeting for students. We had town hall meeting for incoming students and also for our alumni population. Again, just to keep them informed as best as we could. And again, I have to credit our dean um, for all her leadership during all this. She sent a number of video messages, um, which we worked to record as things were changing so that as we were trying to inform various con constituents, it wasn't just an email, but they were actually able to see someone um, sharing some stories, uh, talking to them, and hopefully showing some empathy um, in, in the situation as well. So I'm gonna kick it over to John to see if he has anything to add, but those are some of the things that we try to keep in mind as we work to communicate with our students. Great, yeah, thank you. Yeah, in the uh, uh, financial aid office where I work uh, at a medical school, uh, it was quite a, a quite a spring, and I, I love the word pivot. 
uh, that ESA used because I think that you know we're, we've been constantly pivoting all of us uh, this whole year as things change from one direction to the next. Um, our, our medical school at Cincinnati, we have about 700 students. Uh, the, the university at large is about 46,000 students. So we're a small population compared to the larger university, but uh, we were in a unique position uh, with our program being a four-year uh, med school program. Um, our first and second year students were able to flip uh, or pivot uh, to an online uh, remote learning experience. But our third and fourth year medical students, um, those are the clinical years involved in medical education. So students in the third and fourth year really are out on the hospital floors, uh, going through rounds, shadowing doctors. And so uh, we really had to entirely pause their clinical rotations for really two months, which meant they were they were pretty much sitting uh, idle waiting for uh, uh, things to, to open back up again. So it was quite a strange time um, doing uh, financial aid meetings with our fourth year students getting ready to graduate. We've always prided ourselves on meeting one-on-one -on -one with our students uh, in person. So we were able to still meet one-on-one, -on -one, but of course it had to be virtual in the spring uh, via uh, WebEx in our case. Uh, one thing I will say in terms of technology that did not work for us, uh, we used um, uh, Microsoft Teams, which is a great product, but we invited our students to sign up for what we called virtual uh, open office hours. And so, you know, typically a lot of students may, you know, sort of pop in your office and uh, ask a quick question. And so we were trying to mimic that with the use of Microsoft Teams. And our students, for various reasons, really did not uh, or have not gravitated towards wanting to sign up for those uh, sort of 15-minute appointments. But um, we also found out that our students did not like uh, getting constant emails because things were changing so quickly. We felt, you know, we wanted to uh, let students know right away what we knew. But they were saying, "You're giving us too much email, too many, uh, too many details." So we moved to a weekly digest uh, or summary format, where um, multiple offices from student affairs, financial aid, career services, medical education, and so forth. Uh, would put all of our information together into a Saturday uh, email summary that goes out. And in fact, we're, we're still doing that today. Uh, and students, I think, appreciate that because they know that that is one place they, that is one email they have to read every week. And uh, it has really all the important information that, that they may need to know. Now, we still send emails during the week, but uh, again, we know that that is when um, communication that, that our students will be uh, certainly checking. So, you know, this idea of communication is so critical with, with COVID-19 and, and this pandemic. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's interesting to hear, you know, the different ways that the three of us have operated, but we are uh, excited to hear your thoughts and questions as well uh, at, at the end of the session. Our next um, uh, of the three C's is uh, community, and I'll turn that over uh, to Issa. Thanks, John. So again, you know, I think with, with the pandemic and with 2020 being the year that it has been, uh, there have been a lot of challenges. Um, and uh, certainly with communication, it was a challenging experience. We've had lessons learned, lessons that work, lessons that didn't work. But for the most part, um, using the technological tools and all the platforms that were out there, we were, most of us, really able to pivot really quickly. The bigger challenge, I think, um, and continues to be a challenge, especially for those of us that were on the sessions today that talked about the first generation community and um, the intersectionality of our identities, there was a lot of conversation about building a community, creating a community, finding a space for students to connect. Uh, and at a law school, um, and uh, like John, uh, we actually flipped, I think, in, in careers. I had the opportunity to work in med school um, admissions for a while, and now I'm back in law school admissions. And so I think for all of our communities, um, the ability for our students, our faculty, our staff, and our alumni to get together, to socialize, to um, learn outside of the classroom is something that is very important and a big part of our educational experience. And so the pandemic really had us 
pause and think about how are we going to do that and still deliver that um, in a very remote um, now sort of isolated community. Uh, and so one of the things that we did, I know at Seton Hall is our Dean immediately created a, a committee or task force, if you will, of some key stakeholders to continue the conversation about creating community in these challenging times. And this committee was tasked with uh, finding ways for our students, faculty, staff, and alumni to still have meaningful engagement outside of the classroom. Uh, and so we were able to create through these committees uh, some events uh, that we were able to put together and we're in New Jersey and we had the flexibility as the fall um, progressed to have some on ground events, um, carefully and socially distanced, of course. And so the Creating Community Committee was able to put together a few social events that allowed students um, in very small groups. So we had to do it a lot, uh, several iterations thereof to meet in person, particularly our first year students, um, and allow them to engage with each other, allow them to engage with the faculty members that they'd be meeting with. Um, we definitely got creative and used all of our resources. We reached out to our alumni group and asked them to help us again in thinking creatively. And through their help, we're lucky enough to have an outdoor space. And through their help, we were able to uh, create um, a, a more welcoming garden, a more welcoming outdoor space. Uh, we were able to get a tent and some Adirondack chairs and, and ways for students to gather even through the fall and, and colder months um, using the tent and, and again, some social distancing with the help of some generosity uh, of, of our donors and our alums. So we really got creative in reaching through all of our community members to continue to find ways for our students to connect. Um, we created what we're what we call or we're likening to homerooms. Uh, each students, particularly our first year students, were assigned to what we called hazard homes or small homerooms that we would uh, they would meet with, um, and they'd have a leader who was not necessarily a faculty member but another administrator so that they would learn and be able to engage with other members of the community. And it was a very informal gathering where we would meet and just talk about what's happening, what's going on, um, what can we do to help them, what are they challenged with, um, what's happening in class. It was really just a great opportunity to get together, um, again, very informally, no structure, no agenda, as one might, um, in the coffee houses or in the cafeterias and just sit down and chit chat. So that was really helpful as well. And our students really found it helpful um, to have again, another avenue to turn to uh, for some help and some resources. Our faculty at the law school really took a larger role in helping our students assign and create study groups for those of us in law school. Um, we know that that generally happens organically but because of the isolation, it wasn't happening as organically and, and students were really struggling. And so they looked to their faculty for help and we were able to work together with the students, the classes and the faculty to create an opportunity for them to still engage in study groups and have that meaningful um, experience. As you might imagine, our school psychologist saw increased hours, um, but we were able to support her and, and we're working to continue to support her through interns and, and getting her um, you know, some more space and time to do that. But again, making sure that students knew that that was available to them, as well as other resources, as you heard again earlier today as well, other resources through our Bar Association, our Alumni Association, that students could turn to for continued mental um, health and wellness. And then finally, we tried to make sure that our traditions, if you will, still happened in a virtual setting so students didn't lose out on the traditions that were truly Seton Hall, such, a, such as our uh, virtual Thanksgiving celebration and our uh, Christmas holiday celebration. We found ways to transition it into a remote um, event that still had the spirit of these traditions so that again, we didn't lose that spirit and we continue to um, 
um, really foster that sense of community. And I just have to share that the Creating Communities Committee was really creative in their social events. They did things like virtual bingo, we had things like virtual doggy meet and greet. So again, there were way there were times when it was about academics and continuing to be successful in the classroom. But we really balanced it to make sure that students had uh, an outlet for fun um, as well as for um, mental health and wellness. And so I'm going to turn it over to John to see um, you know share his thoughts on what they might have done on the medical side for community creations. Yeah, great. I'll touch really just on two points, one being um, something similar that we did uh, to what Seton Hall did with what we called Caring Communities. And then uh, I'll mention also our Gratitude Awards. So uh, we noticed uh, really that our, our um, new students this fall were really lacking uh, in that social network due to the virtual learning. And many of our students uh, come from outside of uh, the Cincinnati area, outside of the Midwest even. And so beginning in a new city uh, and not necessarily knowing anyone uh, has been tough. And so uh, we also noticed uh, in the first year, uh, we have weekly assessments that uh, are conducted in uh, some of our core classes. And we were noticing an increase in failures on those weekly assessments compared to prior years. And so, um, you know, we inferred that, you know, a, a big component of that is probably a lack of of, of networking, a lack of students being able to um, to interact with each other's and, and, and maybe with faculty as well to the same degree that they had before. So our caring community groups really came out of that. Uh, similar again to Seton Hall, these were groups, uh, small groups of students, usually about 10 students uh, that were facilitated by a faculty or a, a staff person. Uh, with really minimal agenda, uh, really, you know, an opportunity for students to uh, ask any question, uh, you know, if they didn't know who else to turn to, this was a, a platform, a vehicle for them to do that and, uh, and hopefully find, uh, find connection in a smaller group. Um, the first two meetings of these weekly uh, caring community groups were mandatory for all students. And then after the first two weeks, um, students could continue or they could uh, could leave the group. And we did see sort of mixed results. Uh, some of our students loved the caring community groups and wanted to stay in. Uh, and others, uh, as soon as they hit those first two mandatory sessions, they were gone. And so uh, we're surveying the, uh, the first year students right now and trying to you know, get more information and drill down on why that was. But, um, but again, it was something that we, we felt we had to, had to try to, uh, to help those new students. The other thing is our gratitude awards. So um, this summer, the college instituted uh, a process where anyone in the college, a student, faculty or staff could nominate anyone else. And uh, these are weekly awards that are communicated out uh, to everyone uh, via email, really recognizing uh, individuals' efforts and their dedication to empathize and, and epitomize our uh, college's culture of caring uh, and, and kindness. And so that has been a great way to recognize students, faculty, staff, anyone who's contributing to that culture, because we're seeing really there's, there's uh, less of this uh, idea that oh, that's not my job. Uh, I think with this pandemic, a lot of people are realizing, yeah, it may not be my job, but uh, you know, I'm gonna take that extra step or I'm gonna go above and beyond what's in my job description to, uh, to uh, help foster that sense of community and kindness. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Emily and have her share her experiences there at UC Davis. Thanks, John. Yeah, I, I don't want to repeat everything that's been said, and, and certainly I've learned a lot from John and Issa uh, about kind of how they have really worked and had a whole, like, committees working on the community aspect. Um, I think for UC Davis, um, we spent a lot of time working with our faculty in creating um, community for our students. Um, certainly, we have, um, we did a lot of support for our student organizations and that is a, a big part of, of our campus. Um, but our Dean did a very, did several smart things um, during this, this process. But one of the things that was very helpful is it, he created a teaching and learning committee of our faculty. And that has really brought sort of a renewed sense of community within our faculty that has carried over into our students. And so I think that has also 
um, been something as a student affairs officer that I can work with both faculty and students because a lot of times our students really do want they, they miss that connection with faculty it's not the same as we know seeing them on zoom and so the faculty had them create study groups um, they had them create um, uh, more where well, they had more virtual office hours where they were able to attend we had special faculty panels that was just to meet with first year students uh, uh, kind of just about who the faculty are and um, not necessarily even about a topic, but just to get to know them. So a lot more emphasis on on kind of getting to know. Um, the other thing that we did with our first year orientation is that we divided all students into groups of 25, and we had an hour with them and their faculty members before school even started. And so that was a great way for students to meet each other, meet their faculty, meet us about and, and know what services we could provide. And a lot of students have said that was really helpful in at least making those initial initial connections. The last thing I will just say, um, and I agree with so much has been said about building the community and the importance of it, is you know we've talked about sort of building and sustaining this community, but we've got a whole nother season to go in spring, right? And so. My suggestion is one of the things we're going to be doing is debriefing as a community, right? Giving ourselves some time, not quite yet, wait till exams are over, um, but in early January, needing to debrief. How did things go? What can we do better? It allows you know, us to, to, again, sort of hear from our students a little bit more, create that, that um, bond with them and also with faculty and staff. Um, so that's one of the things that I also suggest is just making sure we're, you, you take the opportunity to debrief with as many people as, as you're able to collect um, as being very, very helpful. Um, so the last of our C's is conscience, and I'm going to turn it over to John, who's going to start us off. Great. Yeah, as we were uh, talking about all these ideas uh, before the uh uh, before the conference today, I think we all sort of realized there were uh, sort of a myriad of ways that uh, our schools were all approaching this in terms of uh, adapting what we've done in the past uh, to to really do the right thing for our students. And, and that may look, uh, you know, often like uh, bending a policy or changing a policy that we thought was was very important in the past. Uh, but but being flexible with that in order to um, uh, you know help our students. So some of the ways that uh, that we've approached that delayed office. So I have sort of that lens of, of which we view things. But um, we expanded our uh, emergency funding uh, dollars at at the university um, prior to this pandemic. Uh, that did not include graduate and professional students. So um, we were able to um, have our students have access to that. Uh, the, these uh, one-time grants at Cincinnati are up to $500 for emergency financial needs, such as housing or food or travel. Um, and, and so we were able to direct students to, uh, to that application process. Uh, we also, as a university, waived late fees on tuition bills. So um, all summer long and really all fall long uh, up, up until now, we have not been charging any late fees on tuition bills. And that's been uh, been uh, very helpful for some of our students given uh, certain circumstances. Uh, like many schools, we also reduced our fees for uh, campus services and parking as, as students were not utilizing rec centers and various other student services. So, um, you know, we felt that was the right thing to do to, to reduce fees. Um, we also moved uh, from an, uh, an academic standpoint, we moved our grading to pass fail on a temporary basis for our first and second year students that are in a more traditional academic setting. Um, given the changes in the, in the curriculum and the modes of instruction in the spring, we felt that moving to a pass fail system was, uh, was the right way to go. So um, lots of things that um, you know, we've looked at. Uh, the, the last thing I'll just mention quickly um, was uh, last month, we uh, invited students that were unable to return home or um, or, or uh, we're, we're planning to stay in the Cincinnati area to attend a Thanksgiving meal that we held at uh, our university hospital. And so that was another 
uh, maybe it's a community event, but uh, we felt it was also a, a, a way to sort of do the right thing and, and give our students uh, somewhere to go on Thanksgiving Day if they had nowhere else to be. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back to Emily. Great, thank you. So one of the things that I loved about, so John, John is the one that said, let's talk about the right things that we need to do and, and, and how did we do the right thing? And I, I just really appreciated that because you know, there are so many things out there that you have to get to, but you're always trying to do the right thing, right? For students, for everybody. And it's not always easy. Um, and so I think the examples that John provided are are terrific. And I, I know a lot of schools have, have done some of these. Um, for us at UC Davis, we did increase our virtual uh, mental health options. So we have a full, um, a full time uh, counselor that is there, but we also added some other online options. Um, we also provided um, some funding for tech enhancements um, so that people could buy hotspots or internet um, upgrades if they needed to. Um, we don't have scholarships with uh, grade requirements, um, but we did make sure that students were messaged and understood about any private scholarships that they could apply to see if, if you know, and we would help them to see if they could keep their private scholarship um, if they were still getting pass-fail grades, which is what we went to. Um, and then one of the big things for, for me and us, I think, at Davis during this time, um, you know, as we're trying to do the right thing, um, we, we really looked at um, how can we support our most vulnerable students, um, our most vulnerable faculty and staff, um, we hired a diversity, equity, and inclusion fellow um, on a contract basis that will hopefully be renewed next year as well um, to really look at the support that we were given, giving to um, our, di our diverse um, students, but also all of our students and all of the ways that they may might be impacted. Um, you know, one of the things that we also did was um, we our dean established a racial justice speaker series that is going on this entire academic year. And the nice thing about having um, the online option is that we can get speakers from all around the country and around the world. And so we're doing that. Um, and and that has been um, you know we know that that um, early on there was a lot of xenophobia surrounding COVID. Um, that COVID has really hit populations of color. Um, harder than other populations. And so that has really been on the forefront of a lot of our minds, our faculty, our students, our staff. Um, and also just thinking through what does it mean to be an institution that is an anti-racist institution and looking at an, an unpacking during a time where we are not able to kind of come together and have these conversations in person we have established ways to do that still um, virtually. And in some ways that's been easier because more people are able to contribute, more people feel sometimes safe in their homes. Sometimes those difficult conversations are easier actually to have. Um, so some of that programming and the support that we've provided um, in that area has been really key for us in, in, at our campus. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over now to Issa to finish us up on the conscience slide. Thanks so much, Emily. I, you know, my colleagues, both John and Emily, have really uh, already spoken about a lot of things that I think we are all doing in our own educational institutions to do the right thing. Many of us, you know, um, renewed conditional scholarships, moved to pass fail, uh, worked with financial aid on the allocation of funds. Uh, but one of the things I think that we're also all doing, and, and Emily alluded to this a little earlier, is um, it was easy to sort of get caught up in, in the whole COVID thing, but 2020 was so much more than just COVID. There were so many other things that were happening. And so part of doing the right thing was to ensure that we are allowing students to um, still have a support mechanism as it, as it came to all the other things that were happening. So even though we were trying to deal with the pandemic and, and going remote and trying to um, create a good community that way, 
we also had to do the right thing by making sure that our students, faculty, and staff were taken care of during some of the other challenging times of 2020. So always thinking creatively about, you know, when the election was coming around, what kind of things do we need to put in place to make sure students feel supported, our faculty feel supported. And uh, one of the things that we did was to really focus on what we call our uh, community conversations. And it, exa it exactly that, it's a conversation open to the entire community to talk about what's hot, um, what's on the pulse of, of society today. And so we had one shortly after the election. We had one, um, you know, talking a little bit about sort of some of the racial tensions and injustices that were happening, just allowing students, faculty, and staff to come together and talk about their feelings, um, their experiences as it related to the, these issues um, in addition to, or maybe outside of the COVID pandemic. So we had to make sure that we weren't just tunnel vision and just dealing with the pandemic um, as, a, as a way to, to you know, make sure everybody was okay. So that's one thing that we did. And I think Emily already alluded to that. Um, the other thing that there are only other two things that I wanna highlight. One is um, it's really great to see how our alumni uh, stepped up to bat during these challenging times. So um, in the law school world, as many of you might know, when it comes time for exams or getting ready for midterms, students really like to have hard copy printed materials of study guides and outlines and whatnot. And without access to the building, that made it really difficult. And it was really great to see our alumni stepped up to the plate and offer to have those materials printed at their firms and have it FedEx to the individual students who might need it. So it was great to see that, again, doing the right thing meant getting all the members of our community involved to think about how we can work with and help each other in the process. And then the final point that I wanna make is all of us work for students and they are our first priority. But part of doing the right thing is making sure that we as team members, as staff members are also supported and have the opportunity to have a mental space for our own emotions and how we're feeling. And our Dean was very thoughtful about this and made sure that as she was communicating with students um, and faculty, that for staff and administrators, she also made time for them. And throughout the fall, she hosted um, safe and socially distanced following all guidelines, um, lunch or meals with each department to just check in and see how everyone was doing and um, talk about life in general. And it was really nice to have that time with her, um, each department to know that they were um, sort of, it was the school was grateful for the work that they were doing. The Dean saw them and knew what they were doing. And just to have that short downtime to maybe talk about something not related to the pandemic or the challenges of 2020 as it related to students, but just about you and what's going on in your life and the fact that you have a family and three kids that you're trying to homeschool. So that was really nice too, to, to again, remember that doing the right thing means doing the right thing for everyone. Um, certainly our students come first, but we also have to take care of our own as we do that. So, um, those are pretty much our thoughts as it came to the three C's and the lessons that we learned from the pandemic. And I think we're gonna continue to learn as we move forward. There were things that happened um, that we implemented in the pandemic that our lessons learned that were successful and we'll continue to implement even if we're able to return to whatever our new version of normal is. And as John and, and both Emily alluded to, and there were certainly some lessons learned of, well, that didn't work, so how are we going to tweak it? And I think um, we continue to get feedback from all of our constituencies, our faculty, students, and staff to see what worked, what didn't work, what else we can do um, to improve the situation as we move forward, because it looks like we're gonna continue in some similar fashion this way moving forward. So with that said, I'm just gonna turn it back over to Teresa for the questions. All right. Thank you to all three of you for all of that wonderful sharing. You know, a lot of words come to my mind when I, when I listen to all of the great 
approaches that you took. I think about the creativity, the adaptability, all the collaboration, the flexibility, innovation, and, and doing it all under really, really challenging circumstances. And John, I, I think that the word pivot will end up on this year's, um, you know how they publish that list of words every year, the most popular words of, of uh, the, the, the 2020. I, I'd be shocked if pivot is not on there. But all of your sharing has stimulated a lot of questions and thank you to all of you out there who have been dropping them in the chat panel. We have time for um, at least two, possibly three, we'll see. Um, the first question is, You've given us so many great examples and they sound ideal, but have any of you had to build back students' trust in the wake of the confusion and um, the disappointment that has been sown since the start of the pandemic? And if so, what are your suggestions? And I would throw it to whoever would like to take it. This is Emily, I, I will I will take it. We, we had a... Um a petition from our first year law students before law school started. So um, in July of uh, 2020, before they got there. Um, and some of it was, I think that, that the messaging that they received from admissions and from the rest of the school was, you know, we're trying very hard to be hybrid. Um, we hope that we will have some in-person classes. And then they got the message that unfortunately we would not be and I think that that um, broke some trust for them. And so the way that we sort of brought that back is that they had formed kind of a, a working group and a petition. And we had all four of our sort of senior deans and including the dean um, attend a Zoom meeting with this group of about 15 to 20 students and listen to them and hear what, what their frustrations were about tuition and about moving and leases and some, you know, and, and all of this, we, we sort of knew, unfortunately was going to be an issue, but it was very helpful. I think for them to hear that we had thought about it and it was helpful for us to hear directly from them about how that the decision, I mean, we were all sort of set on it, but that ha how that decision had impacted them. And so I guess my one suggestion, and, and, and I don't mean this to, to um, sound like just go ahead and do this because it's, there's lots of, of things, but meeting with the students, right? Listening to them, hearing them out and, and doing it in a way that there are some high profile people there that are actually hearing them and listening to them. I think that that was important. Thanks, if Emily, just, for that great oh, suggestion. Yes, go ahead, Isa. Oh, sorry, I was just going to jump in real quickly um, just to sort of piggyback on what uh, Emily had said. We didn't necessarily have to gain back trust. I think our, we didn't uh, lose too much trust. But I think our students were really disappointed and a little bit angry with us when we went ahead. And um, so for the fall semester, we went ahead and created the academic calendar and accelerated it so there was no fall break. And I think students didn't know what they didn't know. We didn't know what we didn't know. But I got to tell you, without that fall break, our students in particular were really tired and worn out um, by the time Thanksgiving rolled around. So when we rolled out the spring semester uh, academic calendar and it looked like there was no spring break, there was a little bit of an uproar with our students. And uh, similar to Emily's situation, um, I think we're lucky to, to work in a community and environment where students felt comfortable sharing their grievances in uh, a thoughtful and respectful way, of course. Um, and our dean is, is a very big believer in being transparent. And it's funny that today's session opened with, you know, negotiations and whatnot. And they went through some pretty big negotiation um, conversations because the, the school felt really strongly that um, – having a spring break was just not responsible given what's happening with the pandemic. But they came, we came up with a great compromise uh, to make sure that students aren't then going through the entire semester totally tired, totally worn out without another break again, like we did in the fall semester. Um, you know, as well. So I think it's that transparency, the ability to make sure that both sides were heard. The students wanted to know that we thought about it, how we thought about it, and we wanted to 
make sure that we heard from them and that they knew that we heard from them um, is a really great way um, to build back trust or, or gain that trust back and uh, that sort of open communication and transparency um, and then try to act on it as quickly as you possibly can, if you can, um, will help gain that trust back. Great, thank you. You were putting into practice what Kwame was talking about this morning. Make sure that they know that they're heard. Okay, we have another great question. And especially in the financial aid world, has anyone figured out a way to recreate the desire or the ability for students to uh, quote unquote stop by for that quick question in, in, a, in a virtual environment? Well, yeah, I will tackle that. Um, so we did attempt this at Cincinnati. Um, we uh, utilized Microsoft Teams to communicate with uh, one another from a staff and faculty level. And so we leveraged Teams by uh, creating 15-minute uh, intervals that uh, sort of a, a appointments that students could sign up for. Uh, students would go to, uh, and we did have IT resources, IT sort of help us with this, but they created a web page where our students could go and they would see listed there all advisors from financial aid, career services, student affairs, registrar, uh, you name it. And they could click on any individual person. They could click on me or my, uh, my assistant director. They could click on the registrar office. And, uh, and instantly sign up for a 15 minute appointment. And the beauty of this is when they sign up is it sends uh, a meeting invite directly onto my calendar for that time slot and I just simply have to accept it. And the student has the same thing. And then uh, when that day and time come, we just you know click the link and we can start chatting. Um, so I think it is from a IT standpoint, I think it's worked well. Where I feel like we faltered is in the adoption. Uh, meaning our students have not really been taking advantage of this. And so I don't know if it's the fact that we haven't uh, reminded them enough. You know, it's, it's a fine line between reminding them to death and, uh, and, and mm -hmm. not wanting to, you know, beat them over the head. Uh, but again, I, a lot of students are also relying, of course, on email. And that tends to be, I think, what a lot of our quick questions come through right now. But, you know, hopefully if, if you are, are a school wanting to try to create something like we did, or maybe you've already done that, uh, hopefully you have better uh, adoption and success than we did. Thanks, John, and thank you for those questions. And we will um, need to stop the questions there. But as many of you know, when, when you attend our conferences, we hope that all of this dialogue and conversation continues far beyond. So please feel free to reach out to each other, to reach out to our panelists, who provided just an incredibly fantastic discussion. We really appreciate you sharing all of your thoughts and ideas and the things that you did on your campus, those that worked, those that didn't work so well. And um, I want everyone to join me in thanking Issa and Emily and John for being on our panel to close our conference sessions. And I will turn it back over now to Lisa and Jen. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Teresa. That was a wonderful wrap up session for today and really appreciate everyone being with us. Would you all please take a moment and join me in thanking every single one of today's amazing presenters and our moderators? And would you also please take a moment to help me thank all of our behind the scenes magic makers who have helped to make today possible. From registration to all of the tiny details that come into play to make a day like today run smoothly, including those fabulous boxes that made their way to your doorstep at home, they make us look great, and we couldn't do this without them. Thank you all so much. We really, really appreciate you. And we also wouldn't have 
amazing events if it wasn't for you. I mentioned this at the top of the program, but thank you so much for your participation today at home. You've helped us to support this year's charity partners who will collectively receive nearly $7,500. Thank you so much. And while the day may be nearly over, there's always something happening at Access Lex. So here are a few things to check out. Um, we recently relaunched an updated version of Explore JD, so please check that out if you haven't already. We also launched a mobile app for Max by Access Lex, now available for both Android and Apple devices. The Access Lex Institute website is in the process of being redesigned, so look for a new look and feel in early 2021. And we also invite you to learn more about the Helix Bar Review. You can join in one of our upcoming Helix preview sessions by registering, and Liz is gonna drop those links into the Q&A panel now. But what you've all been waiting for, and now we've re reached our last drawing of the day. It's been so much fun to see all of your posts out on social media. And we are super excited to crown LexCon at Home social media ruler. So please put your hands together. Alicia Miles from University of Montana. It was a fantastic, all of the posts that you made. It was just wonderful to see all of that activity. Um, but we, uh, we are, we're actually going to give away two runners up prizes as well because there are a couple of others that were really, really active in the social space. And so our two runners up who will win Felix Hoodies is Cassandra Jeter Bailey from University of Cincinnati and Heather Veronini from Golden Gate University. So congratulations to all three of you. But wait, there's more. Some of you have noticed and have dropped notes in the chat panel that uh, you have seen Jen and I having a little bit of outfit action going on between our sessions today. And um, it is a LexCon tradition that we have daily outfits. And since we couldn't be with you, uh, we thought we'd bring a little bit of that fun still to today's session. So I will take three more hoodie winners for those of you who put the correct answer in the Q&A panel for the number of different outfits that Jen and I had today. So we'll get to those at the end, but I also have another secret prize for you. This platform has a sneaky way of measuring all the interactions that you've had with the platform today. And so we are going to give away one brand new set of AirPods to the person who was most engaged on today's platform. The only downside to my surprise is that we can't tell you that today. We have to close out the session in order to get those guests. So we'll be emailing out everyone. You can look for that email tomorrow and we will crown that other uh, winner for the AirPods. And Jen, Let's get to our very last slide, shall we? Yes. Friends, it is time to say a final thank you. And I'm going to invite my colleague, Jen, to raise a glass to all of you. From all of us here at Access Lex, thank you for being a part of this incredibly memorable 2020 event. As always, this isn't a final goodbye. It's just, see you next year. Cheers, friends. Cheers. <laughs>